Defending Cain, Gemini Series, Book 2 by Ty Patterson Chapter 1 The blade slipped between Cain's third and fourth rib. Effortlessly, like a knife cutting through butter. It punctured his heart and slid out again. The piercing took just a few seconds. So smooth so fast that Cain didn't know he had been knifed. By the time his body told him, the assailant was gone. All Cain saw was a departing back that got swallowed in the crowd. He knew calling out was futile. He knew he was dying. Cain looked down at himself. Blood was turning his black shirt wet and sticky. They got me, finally. His breath was coming short. His knees were starting to buckle. His pulse was racing. No. I can't die like this. I have to meet her. She was standing at the other end of the crosswalk, waiting for the signal to change. She was blissfully oblivious of Cain dying. She didn't even know he was there. No one knew. No one yet had spotted the blood on his clothing, his faltering steps. He took a step forward. His knees collapsed. Blood emerged from his mouth. Noise started to fade. Just as his vision started to blur, the signal changed and she started forward. Towards him. He reached out with his arms. He had set out from his hideout early in the morning. He knew they would be looking for him. Everyone would be, not just them. He was lucky he had one of those unrecognizable faces. You saw it, you didn't remember it. Dark eyes. Dark hair. Healthy tan. No conspicuous hair styling. Ordinary body. He dressed in black. His usual uniform when he was at his job. The job that he loved. He emerged from the depths of Building 26. Made his way through the ruins, skirted discarded furniture and pigeon droppings, and blinked in the sudden sunlight. He turned back and looked at the building when he was away from it. Maybe it would be his last glance. Building 26 was part of an abandoned asylum in Queens Village, New York City. It had once, almost a hundred years back, treated the mentally ill. The asylum had been deeded to the city by a descendant of one of the country's robber barons. In its heyday, it had witnessed hundreds of patients being treated. Changes occurred during the 20th century. Medicines improved. Attitudes toward asylums changed. Budgets were slashed. The descendants of the descendant mounted a legal challenge to claim back the land. A legal battle that moved very slowly. The result was ruins. In the busiest city in the world, amidst the bustle of the fastest-moving metropolis, stood the abandoned asylum. No human lived in it. No person ventured in it. Pigeons nested in it. Rats ruled it. Cain discovered it when he was searching for a home for his hobby. He had stumbled on the building quite accidentally. One moment he was in the Queen's village, exploring the next, it was as if he was in a war zone. Building 26 became his abode. It was there that he practiced his hobby. No one saw him. No one heard him. The pigeons swallowed any sounds from the building. It was perfect. It was during one of his experiments that he came to know of the conspiracy. She babbled initially, like the others. Cain paid no attention. It was when he saw the desperation in her eyes that he paid attention and listened. What he heard turned him cold. Cain didn't know fear. It wasn't an emotion he had ever experienced. However, what he felt on hearing her came close to it. He questioned her. She was incoherent. Dying did that to a person. He leaned over her and shouted. With her last breath, she answered him. Cain left the asylum early the next day, when dark hadn't yet turned to dawn. He went to Manhattan and lounged in doorways till the city stirred. He kept his face lowered always, knowing he was hunted. He went to an internet cafe, paid in cash, and researched briefly. He left when he got a name and an address. He went to Columbus Avenue, and there he waited at the crosswalk. For her. 
The revolving door on the glass-fronted building turned at 11 m, and she emerged. Kane hesitated for a moment. He knew there were two of them. Yes, it was her. He stepped forward, joined the crossing throng. It was then that the knife slid into him. Megan Peterson saw the man falling on the other side of the crosswalk. She heard screaming. She hurried over, pushed through the crowd and knelt beside the man. She had paramedical training. She could help. His shirt was wet with blood. His breath was labored. Blood pooled in the corners of his mouth. She took in everything in a swift glance. Carefully eased open his shirt. He's dying. Too late to be saved. I've called 911, someone shouted. The man's eyes seemed to recognize her. A scrabbling hand caught her wrist. I didn't, the man squeezed out the words. Megan's breath caught when she saw his hand held a photograph. The planet stopped rotating when she recognized the face on it. It was Percy Minter's sister. Chapter 2 Megan reeled in shock, her hand trembled as she took the photograph from the dying man's hand. It was Calliope Minter. Callie. That was what everyone called her. There was no mistaking the features. The man reached out to her and tried to say something. She leaned forward, dimly aware of shouts and screams and the sounds of traffic around her. In the distance sirens rose and fell and grew louder. The man's breathing grew shallower. His eyes stared straight into Megan's. A hand clawed at her hair. It fell down and grabbed her hand in a tight grip. What's it? Do you know her? Where is she? She asked him urgently. His lips moved but no words came as his eyes glazed. The crowd was shoved apart and paramedics came rushing to the scene. Megan rose and stepped back, making room for them. Her hand still trembled. Control, babe. Get your stuff together. She breathed deeply as she looked around. The onlookers were still gathered around. Still chattering excitedly. Many of them were snapping pictures on their phones, proof that they saw a killing, or at the least a dying man. She stepped back a few more paces, going almost to the edge of the pavement and observed people more carefully. I saw him from the other end of the crosswalk. He was part of the crowd waiting to cross. She looked carefully at the bystanders. Most of them were still looking at the fallen man, at the paramedics around him. Some of them were on their phones. A few of them were talking to one another. A few met her eyes. No one looked away. No one drifted away casually. No one looks like he could have knifed him. Appearances can be deceptive though. A killer wouldn't wear a billboard around his neck. She searched further, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. She brushed her hair back absent-mindedly and felt wetness on her hand. Blood. How did it get there? Was I knifed? She shook her head impatiently, remembering. The man held my hand. It's his blood. You're still not thinking properly. The spectators moved as if by an invisible force. Cops. Several cruisers squealed to a halt and officers leapt out. Some went over to the scene, others began questioning the onlookers. Megan moved towards them when she felt the hand on her shoulder. You witnessed it. She turned to meet a pair of sleepy eyes which concealed a sharp mind. Detective Chong smiled and waved a hand in the direction of the scene. We were driving past when we heard. It was so close to your office, Zack suggested we swing by. He looked past her at a tall man who looked like he had stepped out from a magazine cover. Pazaka and Chong, first-grade detectives who headed a major case squad in the NYPD, were an unlikely pairing. Pazaka was always immaculately turned out and had a very visible public profile. He had written several best-selling books and actively courted the media. Chong, on the other hand, with his rumpled suit and perennially sleepy look, gave the air of an absent-minded professor. Megan and her twin Beth had known the two cops for years. The sisters worked in a deep black U.S. agency that closed down threats to national security. Terrorists. 
Stolen Weapons of Mass Destruction International Drug and People Running Gangs The covert unit took on all of them. The agency, as it was known by the handful who were aware of its existence, was headed by a gray-eyed, ice-cool woman, Claire, in Washington, D.C., who reported only to the president. The president gave her the freedom to shape the agency the way she wanted. He had only one demand, he wanted results. She had never let him down. The agency's lead agent was Zeb Carter, an ex-Special Forces operative who was responsible for its unique structure. The agency's eight agents, including Zeb and the twins, were based in New York and worked in a security consulting firm on Columbus Avenue. The firm advised corporations on personnel and premise security, undertook hostage negotiations and investigated corporate spying. The firm was their cover. They did undertake the corporate work as advertised, but only when they weren't on agency missions. This structure gave the agency a near-zero admin footprint and had helped it stay clandestine. All the agency's operatives but for the twins were ex-army, most of them ex-special forces. Several of them had freelanced as private military contractors before Zeb had brought them together to form the agency. Zeb had rescued the twins in a previous mission, in turn they had pestered him to join the agency. They had initially handled the logistics for the missions, but after working closely with Broker, the agency's intelligence analyst, had taken over running the intel too. The eight of them were a close-knit team. They were family. Zeb and the twins had first come across Pazaka and Chong when bringing down serial killers and terrorists in the city. The cops who were leads on the cases got the credit and their careers took off. Pazaka and Chong didn't know of the agency's existence. They knew that Zeb, the twins, and the other agents worked in some firm that for some reason exerted tremendous clout. They are smart enough to not ask many questions, Megan thought, and waited for Pazaka to join them. Yeah, she answered Chong and gave the two a quick rundown of what she had seen. Chong waved at a couple of cops when she had finished and summoned them. He's dead, one of them answered his question. Nope, no identification. Nothing on his body. Chong thanked him and turned back to Megan. You know him? She shook her head. First time I saw him. She showed them the photograph. He was carrying this. Pazaka examined it at length and shrugged when he didn't recognize the woman. Recognize her? He asked his partner. Megan cut Chong off before he could answer. That's Calliope Minter. Callie. She's been missing for nearly three years, a voice said breathlessly from behind. Beth came from behind the cops and flashed a questioning are you okay look at her sister. Her sister Percy Minter came to us about ten months back, Beth continued when Megan nodded at her. She wanted us to find her sister. Three hours later, Megan and Beth Peterson were at 1 PP, where Chong and Pazaka had their offices. The on-the-scene cops had taken Megan's statement and Callie's photograph. It would be dusted for prints, DNA traces, and anything else detectable on it. The process of identifying the dead body would begin. Witness statements had been taken from the onlookers, but no one had seen or heard anything relevant. Dude was walking one moment. The next he was falling and there was blood all over, seemed to be the common refrain. Security camera footages would be checked for any identity of the killer. The NYPD's investigative machinery would kick in. This case is yours? Megan asked Chong when all formalities had been completed. Nope, Bennett and Johnson's. Good detectives. Maybe we should take over, Pazaka suggested while polishing his shades. It was evening. They were indoors. None of that mattered to Pazaka. The shades went on his face and he glanced back at the twins and his partner. What? Pazaka likes headlines, and this one already has the makings of a good story. Unidentified dead man carrying photograph of a woman missing for three years. This case would further his career. Megan looked at her sister and got a wink in return. She's thinking the same thing. Chong considered his partner for a few moments more and thought aloud. Zach's right. 
It's not as if we have anything pressing on our plate. Bennett and Johnson have Kane as well. They're stretched thin. Kane. Megan couldn't suppress a shiver. Kane was a serial killer, unlike any other the city had known. He had been active for five years, and despite the massive manhunt, the cops still had no clues to his identity. He preyed on women. He grabbed solitary women from the street and disappeared without a trace. Several days later, a body would turn up in a garbage bin. Or in a parking lot. One had been found in a patrol car's trunk. The body would be horribly mutilated. Cuts and slashes and gouges. Sometimes parts would be missing. An ear. A nipple. A finger. The missing parts were never found. No rape was involved. He had initially preyed on vulnerable women in the early years. Prostitutes. Bar girls. Those who worked late at night. His success seemed to have given him confidence, and he had moved to killing professional women. Lawyers. Accountants. Doctors. No woman was safe. In each case, the victim had been grabbed on the street when she was alone at night. The killer never called the cops to take credit. He never made contact with the media. He was a ghost. His mental state was analyzed by talk show heads, by amateur psychiatrists. The NYPD released an e-profile for him. He still remained undetected. A newspaper gave him a name. Kane. It stuck. Only one woman had escaped from him. 32-year-old Carol Bybee was a cleaner in a theater on Broadway. She had finished her shift after the last show, had shared a smoke with her co-workers and was walking toward her car when Kane had attacked. He had come from behind, a rough hand going over her mouth, another across her waist. A harsh whisper had sounded in her ear. I'm Kane. She had twisted sharply, had elbowed him in the ribs and had lashed out with her feet. His grip had loosened and then she was free, running faster than she ever had in her life, yelling loudly. Despite her escape, she couldn't describe Kane. Average height, white, dark clothing, could fit a few million men in the city. Let's do it. Let's take on this one. Chang's words broke Megan's reverie, and she turned to see him pull out his phone and speak into it softly. She played idly with her cell phone while they waited for the cop to finish his call. Her finger clicked on a button and an image came up. Callie Minters. The picture that the dead man had been carrying. Megan had photographed it before handing the picture over to the cops. Why was he carrying it? Done, Chong called out from across the room in satisfaction. The commissioner says it's ours. I mentioned the Petersons' involvement. That helped. He came to the conference desk they were seated around and looked at Megan. You never saw him before, he asked yet again. Megan didn't reply. Not directly. She was remembering the dead man's eyes. The way he clutched my hair. My hand. His lips moving. I think he was coming to meet me. Chapter 3 Chang's eyebrows lifted quizzically. I thought you didn't know him. I don't. Beth clicked her fingers and spoke over her sister. Of course. The announcements. Megan suppressed a laugh when she saw the expressions on the cops' faces. What Beth is saying, when Percy approached us all those months back we were caught up in other stuff. We couldn't spend much time on finding her sister. If you recollect, I was interviewed a few times by some TV channels. Megan mentioned Callie's disappearance and displayed her picture in those interviews Beth completed for her. Pazaka paused a beat for the twins to continue their tango, and when they didn't he spoke. So you're saying the dead man remembered you from way back and was heading to you? Only explanation I can think of, Megan replied. The skeptical look on Pazaka's face didn't disappear. He glanced at Chong who shrugged. Don't look at me. I'm at a loss. We got this case 15 minutes ago. I'm good but not that good. The twins spent another hour thrashing out possible explanations with the cops, 
but Megan knew they were speculating and with a glance at her watch she rose. Same rules, she told Chong when they were leaving. We share. He nodded. It was how they worked when the twins and the cops worked on the same case. Parallel investigations. Sharing of intel. Beth flagged a cab when they reached street level and glanced at her sister. Where to? Our office. Let's get our own wheels. Their office was on Columbus Avenue, a tall glass-fronted 44-story building that the eight of them owned outright. One floor in the building was devoted to their office. Beth and Megan lived in apartments on adjacent floors above the office. There were more apartments for the rest of the agents to use, though they had their own homes in the city. The other floors were rented out. The building's purchase was funded by a royal in a Middle Eastern country, to whom Zeb had done a favor. A grateful royal had written a check with eight zeros in it and had handed it to Claire. She had refused, he had been insistent. She had given the check to Zeb, who then had formed an investment vehicle for the eight of them. The building was their first purchase. The basement of the building had an extensive garage in which several SUVs were maintained in a ready-to-go condition. All the SUVs were outfitted with gear Broker had insisted on, gear not available at any dealer. Shatter and assault rifle-proof glass, run-flat tires, Kevlar and titanium-reinforced bodies, Wi-Fi, secure comms links, Megan had stopped listening when Broker had enthusiastically read out his list. Megan headed to the nearest black SUV that looked silently ominous, keyed it open, and brought it to life with a satisfying growl. Now where? Beth asked when she had belted herself in. The Minters. The twins hadn't looked into Callie's disappearance in any detail. An agency mission had come up soon after Percy's meeting with them. Karachi had reared its head when the first mission was wrapped up. Karachi had been hot, brutal, and had required the twins to be on site to support Zeb and the others. Beth had called the Minters before the first mission and had given them a spiel about corporate work taking precedence. The Minters had accepted the explanation. Callie had been gone for two years by then. They could wait for a few more months. Besides, the cops were still on the case. Megan punched in the coordinates to the Minter's townhome, in Midtown East, not far from the UN headquarters on East 42nd Street, and joined the stream of horns and fumes that was New York traffic. She looked right when they were waiting at a light, and spotted the pensive expression on her sister's face. They were identical twins, Megan, the older one by a few seconds. They both had brown hair that fell to their shoulders, bright green eyes, and attractive features they had inherited from their mom. Both were tall, five feet seven in their socks, and had an innate confidence that Zeb's training had polished. She's feeling guilty. That we didn't put more effort in finding Callie. How's Mark, she asked to distract Beth. Beth's face tinged with a rosy hue, proof that Megan's ploy worked. Mark Feinberg, a cop, a detective with the NYPD, was Beth's boyfriend. The two had been together for years and ribbed Megan continually on her lack of relationships. He's back from L.A. returned two nights ago. Mark was with a special unit that went after international criminal gangs and had to often travel and liaise with other police forces. I'll be seeing less of you then, Megan teased. You'd see less of me if you got off your butt and found someone, Beth retorted. They fell into an easy silence, words weren't necessary to fill the empty space. They were twins. They were also friends. Megan slowed when she reached East 51st Street and searched for a parking space. Beth pointed to one next to the pavement, and she eased behind a bright yellow traverse. Beth hopped out, stretched, and stared at the yellow-colored vehicle and grimaced. Yellow. There was no accounting for taste, but hey, this was New York. Megan grinned silently, reading her thoughts, and crossed the street when Beth joined her, their smiles disappearing as they approached the entrance and rode the elevator to the Minter's apartment. Percy Minter greeted them and led them to the lounge where her dad and mom, Jack and Grace Minter, were awaiting. Jack Minter was a war crimes investigator in the United Nations, Grace was a homemaker. The Minters had lived for two decades in Europe, it was in Greece that their elder daughter was born. Their fascination for the country 
had made them name her after the goddess of poetry and eloquence. Percy arrived fifteen years later, squalling and kicking, and on seeing her antics, Grace promptly named her after the Greek queen of the underworld. The Minters with their two daughters moved from country to country on the European continent, wherever Jack's job took them. It was an education in culture and people for their daughters. They were based in Austria when Callie moved back to the States for her grad studies at Columbia University. 4,000 miles of separation from her eldest daughter weighed on Grace. When Percy turned 10, the Minters relocated to the U.S., Jack got an administration job in the U.N., and life was moving smoothly for the Minters. Till Callie disappeared. She worked for a couple of years in a particle physics research firm in New York after her graduation, but that job didn't last long. Wanting to pursue another degree, she went back to her alma mater and got her dream research project. It was a DOD-funded research project in physics. She was in a group of six students who worked under the tutelage of a Nobel laureate. The first year went as she expected. Research. Presentations. Late nights. Hard work. Frustration. Occasional moments of blinding discovery. The second year was similar to the first. It was a late night in August in the second year, when Callie set out from her lab, alone, and walked to her off-campus apartment on West 133rd Street. She never reached it. Her roommate, a fellow research student on the same program, didn't pay much attention to her non-arrival. Callie often spent nights with her boyfriend, another fellow student, at his apartment on West 96th Street. The roommate and the boyfriend raised the alarm the next day. The police were called in, and an investigation commenced. Three years later the investigation was still open, but lack of clues and no forward movement meant that the NYPD kept it open. Just about. Megan took a deep breath when she saw the air of expectation on Jack and Grace. The slow draining of hope had taken its toll on the couple. Jack, tall, silver-haired and bespectacled, now moved with the slightest bow in his shoulders. Grace's blonde hair had turned gray. Her green eyes had lost their sparkle. Still, the arrival of the twins meant some development. Megan could sense their desperate keenness, could feel the spark of hope light again. She didn't want to kill it. She didn't want to disappoint them. She had no choice. We have something. We don't know what it means. Chapter 4 she briefed them rapidly on her coming across the dead man. Grace nodded once, she had heard of the incident in a news bulletin. The man was carrying a photo. Callie's. The living room went quiet. No one spoke. No one moved. An ambulance wailed in the far distance and faded. How, Jack began. What? Grace interrupted him. Who? Percy exclaimed. Jack silenced his family with a look and gestured at Megan. Proceed. Beth took over. We don't know who he is, sir. Nor do we know why he was carrying Callie's picture. He was trying to say something when Megan reached him, but he couldn't speak. It was too late. Fingerprints. Percy rushed in. Surely they can find who he is? Beth nodded. The cops are working on that. They'll look into all angles. Jack lurched to his feet. I'll call them. I'll light a fire. Sir, Beth stopped him. We know the detectives who have taken over the case. Chong and Pazaka. They lead a major case squad. They are good. They're on top of it. Jack stood uncertainly for a moment the need for action for doing something warring with Beth's urging. They're good? Yes, sir. We know them personally. He exhaled and sat down heavily. What will happen now? The cops will do their thing and so will we. We hadn't looked into Callie's disappearance before, Beth said apologetically, we'll pull out all stops now. You've experience with this? Dark eyes peered keenly at them through glasses. Dad, I told you about, Percy cut in impatiently. Jack waved her to silence and motioned Beth to reply. Yes, sir. 
We are experienced investigators. Our firm works with corporations, advising them on security, investigating fraud. Silence fell in the room as Jack leaned back, apparently satisfied. In all the time, Grace didn't speak. Her gaze was fixed on a family portrait hanging from the wall. Proud parents flanked by their daughters. Callie and Percy were laughing. A moment of happiness caught in time. Beth saw the haunted look in the mother's eyes and did something she rarely did. Ma'am, she called out softly. Grace turned her head slowly as if seeing her for the first time. We will find her. You have our promise. Grace stared at her for a long time, ignoring the single tear that rolled down her face. Thank you, she finally whispered. Percy rose to hug her when a phone rang in the depths of the house. She went to answer it, and then went to the door. They heard voices, footsteps, and she returned, ushering in Pazaka and Chong. Why am I not surprised? Chong smiled briefly at the twins, before turning to the dad and mom. He introduced himself and his partner, and went through all that had happened. They broke up after another hour, the twins leading the way out, the cops following. You shouldn't make promises you may not be able to keep, Pazaka said, stony-faced, referring to the promise Beth had made. Beth ignored Megan's warning hand on her shoulder and smiled. Let's have a wager, Pazaka. We'll find Callie or what happened to her before you do. The cop didn't reply. He straightened his jacket, turned his back, and went to his ride. Chong regarded the twins for a moment and then smiled wryly. I keep waiting for the day when you'll punch him. Won't happen, Chong, Beth chuckled. We wouldn't want to ruin his profile. Megan pulled out of their parking space and drove silently through the thinning traffic. She followed Chang's car for a moment and parted ways with it when it swung left on Madison Avenue and she turned right. That's the long way to our office, Beth asked her surprised. Let's have a look at Callie's apartment block. We'll come back in the daylight and make inquiries. She drove down Madison Avenue, hung a left on West 133rd Street, and pulled in front of the apartment building. It was a 15-story building with a gated entrance, and despite the late hour, had a steady stream of foot traffic in and out of it. Students, Beth snorted. Says you, Megan quipped. I remember a certain someone used to have wild, riotous parties till dawn. She pulled into one of several empty parking spaces and walked to the entrance of the apartment block. She noted the security cameras mounted high up on a pole and looked back at Beth. Nope, no footage of Callie entering the building that evening, Beth answered her look. The security guys didn't see her either. Megan circled back and walked down the length of the street, her eyes scanning lamp poles, neighboring apartment buildings and offices for security devices. She didn't spot any. If it had been that easy, the cops would have cracked this case a while ago. She returned to Beth, who was waiting by their SUV, and was digging into her pocket for the keys when she heard it. A car roared down the street, speeding recklessly, its angry beams cutting the night. She watched it for a moment, found her key fob, and unlocked the vehicle. She was walking around the passenger side when she heard the shift in the vehicle's angry whine. Watch out. She looked over her shoulder. The car was heading right at her. Chapter 5 Megan stood rooted for a split second, not believing her eyes. The fifteen feet separating her from the oncoming vehicle became ten. Move. To her right was empty space. To her left were more parking spaces. Behind her was the SUV. She lunged to the right, stumbled, the lamps blinding her, the roar filling her ears, and then she felt something slam into her. Beth. She went flying, landed several feet behind the SUV, just as the car rammed into their ride. Metal tore and ground, the SUV's alarm went off, the car's engine stuttered and then died. Megan rolled over and rose to her feet. A quick look at Beth, she was rising too, apparently unhurt. People came rushing out of the apartment complex, voices raised in urgency. A door slammed. The car door. She took a mental inventory of herself, as she watched a lean man stumble out of the car. 
He fell once Rose looked to his left and then to his right. His eyes met Megan's and for a second he seemed to freeze, the next instant he bolted. Megan moved without conscious thought. She gave chase, ignoring the yells of the approaching students. The man shouldered through students, shoving them away roughly, leaping over a hunched girl. Megan followed. The man was fast. Very fast. Uncaring about who he pushed away. Megan was fueled by anger. She ignored the throbbing in her shoulder. She put behind the thoughts of Beth. She willed her legs to pump faster and started running in the smooth fluid way Zeb had taught them. Glide in the air. Don't cut through it. The man glanced back once and under the dim light of a street lamp, she saw he was Chinese. Scared. Or angry. The runner swerved suddenly, crossed the street and headed to a wrought iron fence. Beyond it was a yard with several exits. If he leaps over, he'll gain time and can disappear. Megan's stride lengthened. She was pleased her breathing was smooth. She and Beth ran ten miles every day, Zeb joining them occasionally. A sprint such as this was no sweat. She gauged the distance between the two of them. Just over seven feet. A similar distance separated the man from the fence. She landed on her left foot, shot out her right, powered it down and levered off it. She dove at the man's legs, slapped his left one with a hand, grabbed his right thigh and brought him down. The man wriggled and twisted like an eel. A hand shot out towards Megan's throat. She ducked just in time and caught it and twisted it behind his back. He didn't allow her to apply the hold. He heaved off the concrete and reared his head back. She met his head with a pointed elbow. Hard bone against hard bone. A rear thrust against a downward one. The man groaned and tried to turn sideways. His legs flailed in an attempt to kick her. She evaded them, twisted his hand further, applied a knee and secured him. Don't kill him, Beth panted as she came running. We need him alive. Wasn't planning to, Megan replied dryly and winked at her sister when the man went rigid at Beth's words. Beth would have twisted his scrawny neck. She plays hardball. She cuffed his hands with plastic ties they always carried and hauled him upright. Beth and she studied him without uttering a word. Beth went around him inspecting him from top to bottom as if she were in the market for buying an animal. Who are you, buddy? Megan asked him. The man didn't reply. He didn't meet her eyes. He had Chinese features, was clean-shaven, short-haired, and dark-eyed. No tats marked his skin. His eyes were nervous, scared, as he looked from Megan and turned sideways to look at Beth. She shoved him forward. Face front, eyes forward, she snarled. That was a poor job, if killing us was his intention. She directed her words at Megan. I've changed my mind. Let's break his neck, just for being such an amateur. What about the cops? Megan frowned, catching on to Beth's tactics. Self-defense. There aren't any witnesses. The dude's scrawny. Betcher I can snap his neck like a twig. Remember that gangbanger I killed? He was heavier than this lightweight, and I finished him in a minute. Megan looked around. There wasn't anyone about. A bunch of students were grouped in front of the entrance to the apartment building, but they were a distance away. Do it, Megan looked past him at her sister. The cops will be here soon. A cruiser's siren sounded a couple of blocks away, as if in response. I'll shield you from the student's eyes. Megan crowded the man, blocking him from the student's line of vision, as Beth went closer to him. Hey hold up, the man yelled out loudly. I lost control of my vehicle. American accent, Megan thought. Native New Yorker. So why did you run? Why didn't you honk in warning? Beth's voice sounded mean. It happened too fast, he protested. I tried to steer into a vacant space, but my car was going too fast. Headlights brightened the streets, and red and blue flashes filled the night sky as patrol cars poured in and pulled to a stop. We should have just gone and done it, Beth sighed regretfully. Now it's too late. Their captive moved suddenly, 
hopping towards the approaching officers. Take me, he shouted. They're planning to kill me. It was 1 a.m. when the twins reached their office in Columbus Avenue. The police hadn't got anything useful from the captive. He stuck to his story stubbornly, and a quick inspection of his vehicle revealed he had a flat. A breathalyzer showed he was over the limit. ID checks confirmed he had several priors for DUI. Looks like he lost control of his vehicle, an officer told them as he chewed gum and eyed them with interest. He says you threatened to snap his neck. Do we look like we're capable of that? Beth's voice dripped with honey and sweetness. The officer grinned, ma'am, we know all about you. Mark's a good friend of mine. I've seen you both several times in one PP with the commissioner. The guy was lucky. He got off light. Y'all look into him? Yes, ma'am. You think it was a coincidence? Beth asked Megan as they took the elevator to their apartments. Yeah, Megan replied slowly. Been thinking of that. I can't see how anyone could have arranged a hit, if that's what it was at such short notice. And why would they? That was no hit. In any case, we've got his ID. We'll run him through Werner. Their investigation into Callie's disappearance started the next day, 24 hours after the man died on the crosswalk. Megan was the first in the office, an enormous space done up in vibrant colors. It has couches and sofas strewn all over, a basketball hoop, baseball bats and mittens, and a thin golfing strip. The twins had decorated the office and had been determined to do away with a typical corporate look. Megan went into the kitchen, brewed herself a coffee, and went to the floor-to-ceiling window. Columbus Avenue was bathed in the sun's golden light as it filtered through high-rises and trees and lightened the day. She closed her eyes when the first sip of Jamaican Blue Mountain went down her throat. Megan was utterly convinced the planet too was fueled by coffee. How else could it keep spinning and revolving? A sound caught her attention, and she turned to see her twin go to the kitchen and brew herself a drink. Beth stood by the window, her mug in her hand, vapor enveloping her like a light halo. A ray of light caught her hair and turned it to gold, and turned her green eyes to liquid emeralds. No wonder Mark's fallen for her, hard. What do we do today, sis? Beth acknowledged her look with a quirked eyebrow. We work on Werner. You go through Callie's movements as far back as you can. Dig out everything about her, on social media. Her friends, co-workers, bosses, everyone. Run them through the machine. I'll look up our hitman from yesterday, and also check out the Minters. Werner was a proprietary artificial intelligence software program that resided in a supercomputer in their office. Werner had been developed by a couple of Stanford graduates, and its superior capabilities had attracted the NSA and the DIA's attention. Zeb and Broker had outbid the agencies and had acquired the software. Broker and the twins kept enhancing its capabilities to such an extent that the NSA had a standing offer on it and upped their price every year. The program talked to numerous national and international databases and the NYPD frequently used its capabilities when they came up against bureaucratic brick walls. They worked as the sun moved across the blue sky and turned day into noon and then early evening. Werner didn't flag anyone in Callie's social or professional network. Jack Minner's network took more time. His contacts were international, and his work had brought him in contact with some horrific war criminals. Werner had to verify Jack Minter's contacts, look up available records for their movements, and come up with probable threat vectors. The sun went down, shadows in their office lengthened, when Werner came back conclusively. There wasn't anything in Jack Minter's backstory that was connected to Callie's disappearance. The Chinese hitman turned out to be a low-level drug dealer who was known to the cops. He had no record of violent crime. Coincidence, Megan said aloud, and stopped looking into him. Beth rose and stretched. It was just the two of them in the office. Zeb was in Washington, D.C. with Claire. Broker was in D.C. too, with FBI special agent in charge, Sarah Burke, his girlfriend. Bear and Chloe and Bawana and Roger were in Texas, 
vacationing in Roger's home. There were no ongoing agency missions. It was downtime. Looks like we'll have to investigate the hard way. Beth suggested. Let's go for a run. Megan nodded and shut down her terminal. She stifled a yawn and checked her phone. No messages from Chong or Pazaka. They started out when it rang. It was Chong. Where are you? The twins stopped when they heard something in his voice. In our office, Megan replied. Can you come down? What's up, Chong? We know who the man is. The man who died. He paused a beat. It's Kane. Chapter 6 Kane? Megan repeated, dumbfounded. Yeah. Get your butts over here. What? What's this about Kane? Beth asked her. The dead man is Kane. No one ever saw Kane. Pazaka paced the room as he explained when they had reached 1 pp, 45 minutes later. It was 8 pm, and they all had a long day however his tan suit had its knife-edged creases intact, and not a hair of his was out of place. We know that, Beth oozed sarcasm, wishing him to hurry. Pazaka wasn't to be hurried. It was as if he was auditioning for a Hollywood role. He frowned at something and stopped. He's thinking maybe there's another book in all this, Beth thought snidely, and put her game face on when Megan glared at her. No witnesses, Pazaka extended a well-manicured finger. No victims left alive. No DNA traces. Nothing underneath the nails of the victims. No semen. The dead bodies are the only proof there's a killer out there. Kane. He looked at his captive audience. They seemed spellbound. The audition was going well. There was one survivor, Carol Bybee. She didn't see Kane's face either. Her description was generic. Beth looked at Chong when Pazaka turned his back on them. Hurry him up for Christ's sakes, she mouthed. He's on a roll, came the reply. Bybee grappled with him for a brief moment, and in that scuffle, Kane left behind a vital piece of evidence. Pazaka went to the table and drew out a see-through baggie from a folder. He held it up reverently for a moment and passed it around. Beth got it first, and as she looked at the single black thread it came to her. That matches what the dead man was wearing, right? Pazaka smiled and leaned against a wall. Yes. That thread matches the shirt and trousers John Doe, henceforth known as Kane, was wearing. Kane is dead. Pazaka didn't go in for rubbing hands in glee, but he came close to it. Who killed him, though? Megan asked absently as she fingered the baggie, her mind a million miles away. Bennett and Johnson will figure that out. We informed them about the evidence. Megan nodded, still thinking of possibilities and probabilities, of angles and likelihoods. You know what this means, don't you? Chong spoke for the first time, addressing her. Megan brought her mind to the present and focused on him. Kane killed Callie. Chong nodded. I still don't think so, Megan countered. She held a hand up to still the chorus of protests. Hear me out. This is Kane. The most elusive killer the city has known. If he had killed Callie, why would he be carrying her photograph? He was trying to tell me something. His eyes, he was out to meet me. You are reaching, Pazaka waved a hand dismissively. Kane was a serial killer. Serial killers often collect trophies. That photograph could be from his collection. You're not convinced? Beth broke the short silence that followed. Nope, Megan replied. However, let's proceed with our investigation and see where it leads us. She rose and stopped mid-motion. We'll have to tell the Minters. They were back at the Minters the next morning, Chong and Pazaka along with them. The door swung open before Megan knocked, and a smiling Percy greeted them. Her smile faded when she saw the twins and the cops. Who is it, Percy? Jack Minter called from the depths of the home. He came to the hallway and went pale when he saw their visitors. Grace Minter joined them in the living room and seemed to visibly shrink. 
Have you? Is Callie? She whispered, unable to utter the words. We don't know, ma'am, Megan admitted softly. She looked at Jack, and then at the couch behind them. Jack Minter got the message and helped his wife to a couch, and when they were settled, Megan continued. We've identified that man. She swallowed and wondered how she could put it to them. Just tell them. That man was Cain. A stunned silence followed, and then Grace moaned and buried her face in her husband's chest. You're sure? Jack asked softly. As sure as we can be, sir, Chong replied and broke it down for them. A long hour later, Percy joined them at the sidewalk and waited with the twins while the cops departed. She turned to Megan, a stubborn look on her face, her lower lip jutting out. I don't believe it. Find her body, and only then I'll accept it. We aim to, Megan answered. The twins' first stop was Columbia University's Department of Physics. They asked for Mark Letwoski, and while waiting for him in his office, Megan reviewed what they knew of him. Professor Mark Letwoski had been awarded the Nobel Prize for his research in theoretical physics, ten years back. He now taught and tutored research students. Callie had been part of his research team, along with five other students, when she had disappeared. The NYPD had interviewed Letwoski and the other students, and hadn't uncovered anything of note. The NYPD isn't us. She and Beth rose when the professor entered his office and stood gaping. Mouth shut, Megan. She brought a smile to her lips, got her senses back, and shook hands with the professor and introduced her sister. I would take up research in an instant if he tutored me. Mark Letwoski was Hollywood handsome. He had blonde curls, a clean-shaven face, and didn't look his 58 years. His blue eyes twinkled as if he knew what Megan was thinking. Sorry to disappoint you. The unruly hair beard sports jacket look never appealed to me, he chuckled and gestured at a couple of chairs. He noticed Megan's eyes lingering on the award certificate hanging on a wall. It's not that big a deal, he smiled. Research is just like any other job. We come into work every day, make incremental progress, write our papers, submit them, and sometimes we get lucky. Yeah, sheer dumb luck got you the Nobel. You're here about Callie? Yes, Professor. Mark? I know us profs are supposed to be old and I am, but let's not remind me of my age. He listened in silence when Megan outlined the purpose of their investigation, and when she had finished, posed a question. It's been a long time now. You expect to be more successful than the NYPD? We're better than them, Beth deadpanned and drew a chuckle from Letwoski. What exactly were Callie and your group working on, sir? Megan asked him. Sir is better. Calling a Nobel winner by his first name doesn't feel right. Our research was in subatomic particle behavior and human-machine interaction. Chapter 7 You mean like Ant-Man? Beth queried. Letwoski's eyebrows rose. You're the first to draw that analogy. I'm impressed. Almost everyone goes blank when I mention the research areas. We aren't just pretty faces. Megan bit her tongue to contain her words and let Beth take the lead. Ant-Man is fiction, Letwoski continued, however there are some parallels. If we can predict the behavior of subatomic particles, the future is limitless. Quantum computing, underground radar, new positioning systems that replace the traditional GPS. The second part of our research was in human-machine interaction. We're talking about a different kind of robotics here. This isn't just about voice command machines, it's about machine-assisted decision-making. He trailed off. This is where listeners' eyes glaze over, he laughed. You ladies seem to be paying attention. We've a co-worker, sir, who's a science nut. She makes sure we stay on top of stuff, Beth admitted with a smile. You said was, sir. Is the research program over? Yeah. Early this year. You know this was a DOD-funded program, right? The twins nodded. The way that works, Universities have to submit their outlines to the DOD, and a lengthy qualification program kicks in. 
there's a short list, and more qualification criteria are applied. I won't bore you with the details, but we came out on top. I put together the research team, and since this is an area of particular interest to the military, we had to obtain security clearances. Our research program was for four years, but Callie's loss impacted us and we were delayed. He spoke at length about the program, how they worked, how they vetted their findings, and the various presentations to the military. He leaned back and crossed his arms behind his head. In February, we had our final submissions, several discussions with the DOD, and closed the program. He pointed out to several bound volumes, high up in a cabinet the size of telephone directories. That's the finished product, the declassified one. Weren't there six on your team, sir? Beth asked him. Initially, and when Callie disappeared, we continued with five. Finding a replacement, getting him or her security cleared would have been a hassle. He frowned. Nope, that's wrong. Darn it, I keep forgetting about Lien. Lien Cheng Vaughn. She went to California, before Callie's disappearance. We continued with four. That tallies with what we know. They completed the research with a team of four, and the professor Megan mused, glanced at Beth, and got a blink in return. She's on the same page. You can read each other's minds? Letwaski asked after observing the silent interchange. That's Hollywood stuff, sir. We usually know what the other is thinking, but reading the other's mind. Her brown hair flew silkily as she shook her head. Where are they now? Your team? Hum, let's see. The professor leaned forward and steepled his fingers. Lien, as I said, is in California. In Palo Alto, working for some semiconductor firm. He turned to his laptop and opened a file. Gary is right here in New York. He's with some research outfit. Melinda is in Texas. Kurt, he's still in the university. He's on another research program. Dirk's with Microsoft in Seattle. He gave them the addresses and contact details for the researchers and walked them out. His face was troubled as he stood at the door of his office. I hope you find her or what happened to her. She was the smartest of the lot. Lien and she. The sisters regrouped in a deli near the university and when Beth returned with two coffee mugs, compared notes. All those addresses and phone numbers match the ones we have. Also match the ones in the NYPD file, Beth mumbled around a mouthful of brownie as she tapped keys on her tablet. Which address is the closest to us? Kurt Tiemann's over on West 96th Street. He's the boyfriend, isn't he? Yeah. Beth looked up and narrowed her eyes at her sister. You aren't paying attention. What's on your mind? The professor seemed to remember everything, despite the program having ended. He didn't remember the addresses or the phone numbers. He did know everything else. So? So I don't know. Megan sighed in frustration. We have never come across a case like this. A woman gone missing for years. No clues. Nothing. We're coming in cold. But why do you suspect Letwaski? I don't. Megan snapped in irritation. She paused, rolled her shoulders and held a hand up in apology. I'm not suspecting anyone. I was just wondering how it was that he remembered every detail. The cops dug into him and the researchers. They found nothing, Beth reminded her. I know. But they didn't ask the military. Beth's eyes widened. You mean? I mean it's time to talk to General Klaus. General Daniel Klaus was the national security advisor and was one of the few people in the country who knew of the agency's existence. He not only knew of its work, he regarded it as vital to the nation's security. He was a close friend to Claire and had a fond regard for Zeb. The general in his late sixties had never married, his work was his life. He was staunchly apolitical, and his blunt talk had won him the respect of politicians from both parties. He had met Zeb's crew several times and on meeting the twins had taken them under his wing. They were the daughters he never had. 
He flew down to New York every year and did his best to persuade them to move to Washington, D.C. and work with him. He returned each time happy but with a polite rejection. Megan glanced at her watch, it was just past noon. The general would likely be busy in meetings. He always has time for us. She rose, left a tip on the table, and went to their SUV, Beth following her. She punched in the general's cell number and waited for the call to go through. It'll vibrate thrice. Time for the general to glance at it and decide whether to take the call. Y'all change your minds? Want to join me? The general growled when he answered. No, sir, Megan couldn't keep the smile from her voice. You'll just have to keep trying. I'll never stop. Zeb doesn't value you. His voice softened. How can I help? Megan briefed him swiftly and waited while the general processed it. You want me to make some calls and find out the Dodd's opinion on Letwaski? And the others too, sir? Will do. Stay tuned. We aren't far from Tiemann's apartment. Why don't we check it out? Beth asked when the call had disconnected. He'll be at the university. All the more reason to look at it. Megan hung a left and then a right and shot forward on Columbus Avenue, lit her flasher and took a right and headed down West 96th Street. Tiemann's apartment block was similar to Callie's, except that it was smaller. It had ten stories and didn't have a gated entrance, nor did it have a concierge. The elevator doors required a key code, however another student punched in the code and reddened when Beth gave him the full wattage smile. Tiemann's apartment was on the sixth floor, at one end of a narrow hallway. There were three other apartments on the floor. Two facing the elevator, another at the opposite end of the hallway. The hallway had gray carpeting, faded and worn out. It had a single light and smelled of cigarettes and reefers. Megan went to Tiemann's door, pressed her ear against it, and shook her head silently at Beth. It seemed to be empty. There wasn't anything else to observe in the hallway, and after a few more minutes, Beth buzzed the elevator. It arrived with an almost silent whoosh. The doors opened. Beth stepped inside. Megan had one foot inside when a door opened behind her. She felt the rush of air on her neck and instinctively crouched and started dropping. Her move was too late. An arm cut across her face and applied a chokehold. Chapter 8 In the fleeting second before the hold tightened, Megan saw Beth's panicked face, her fingers jabbing at buttons as the doors shut and the elevator moved down. She felt hot breath on her hair as the arm crushed her neck and another arm captured her free hand. Doors. She lunged off the floor, letting her assailant take her weight. He stumbled. She ignored it. She planted her feet on the metal sliding doors and shoved back. Hard. The attacker let out a surprised yell and lost his balance and fell. His hold loosened. Megan landed on top of him, whirled, and jabbed a sharp elbow in his sternum. She followed up with a blow to his chin and then grabbed his head and smashed it on the carpet. The attacker groaned and went limp. She rose off him and turned swiftly as footsteps rushed on the stairwell. A Glock poked around first and then Beth's eyes appeared at floor level. I'm okay, Megan gestured and motioned her to the open apartment door. Tiemann's. Beth nodded and moved swiftly, keeping the fallen man between her and Megan. She peered cautiously around the open door. It seemed empty. She heard rustling behind her and risked a quick glance. Megan was securing the prone man with plastic ties. She waited for her sister to finish and join her. Beth darted inside the apartment, Megan at her rear, both of them armed, alert, prepared. Untidy living room. Narrow hallway. Beth snapped her head round an open door. Empty room. Filled with cartons and files. Another room. Kitchen. A closed door. No movement from inside. No sign of life. She fell to the floor, her elbows planted on the floor, the Glock steady. Megan slammed the door open with her left hand. Beth peered around quickly. A bedroom. 
Unmade bed. Open window. Empty. She rose, headed down the hallway, and came to the last room. It had its door open. A light breeze wafted through. She lunged inside the door, Megan covered her. Empty. A desk. A chair. A lamp. Shelving. Files. Computer. It was a study. She relaxed and looked fully at her sister. You're okay. Yeah, Megan replied and rubbed absently at her throat. He caught me by surprise, but he didn't do any damage? Is he Teeman? Let's ask him. The attacker was groaning softly when they returned to the hallway. It was still empty except for the three of them. No apartment doors had opened, no person had poked a head out. No alarm had been raised. Megan stood in front of the man and studied him. Dark long hair. Stubble. Gray eyes. Strong features. Big build, most of it muscle. He was as tall as them, dressed in faded jeans and a white t-shirt. His eyes took in the sisters and he cursed them softly. Megan ignored him, holstered her gun and drew out her phone. She scrolled through several images before she came to one. She compared it to the attacker and showed it to Beth. Their attacker was Kurt Tiemann. Callie's boyfriend. She crouched and slapped him lightly. Why did you attack us? Tiemann groaned in reply. Beth sighed and the sisters hall dragged him to his apartment and flung him on a couch. He sprawled in a daze, his hands secured in front of his body, and grimaced as he twisted his head left and right. He raised his t-shirt with his bound hands and peered at his abdomen. The skin had reddened and looked angry where Megan's elbow had landed. He looked up and bit back an angry outburst when he felt two pairs of green eyes looking at him coolly. We're waiting, Megan reminded him. Maybe we should rough him up a little more. Like softening him up, you know. I'll go this time. Beth drawled. Nope, Megan admonished her. We can call the cops, however. Did he call the cops? No, Mr. Football Player took it on himself to attack us. Who knows what else he was planning? You think he was planning more? Like rape? Of course. Look at him. Tiemann found his voice. I wasn't planning to. That's what they all say, Beth cut him off witheringly. They studied him while Megan toyed with her phone. Tiemann seemed to gather his nerve and made another attempt. Can I speak? He wants to speak, Megan relayed to her sister. Did we stop him? I thought you were them, Tiemann croaked through a dry throat. Beth went to the kitchen, filled a glass with water and handed it to him. He held it awkwardly, emptied it, and handed it back. Who's them? Megan asked him. Tiemann hesitated a moment and caved when Beth returned to the living room and drilled him with her eyes. A street gang. Drugs. I buy from them occasionally. I'm behind in my payments. You think we look like gangbangers? Megan gave him an incredulous look. I didn't know how you looked. All I could see were your backs. I heard you at the door. They've used that tactic before to draw me out. He fell silent and watched Beth go to his bedroom. They heard her rummaging, and she returned shortly with a handful of baggies. I guess he's telling the truth. Why would you attack them, though? Megan didn't relent. Because they threatened me. Said if I didn't pay, the next time they came, they would hurt me. I haven't put together the payment yet. Megan considered him for a moment, her face giving nothing away. We know he doesn't have a criminal record. Maybe he's telling the truth. She drew out a buck knife from a sheath on her hip, ignored his widening eyes and slashed his ties. Spill, she ordered. Tiemann spilled. He talked about how his powder consumption gave him the bright idea, becoming a supplier to a small group in the university. His suppliers were a street gang. He met them outside study hours, stocked up, and resold to his clientele. There weren't many of his customers, about 25, however they were regular users and paid promptly. 
The gang had roughed him up, lightly, the first time he was behind in his payments. He was behind now, and knew they would be more violent. How long have you been doing this? Megan asked him, no emotion in her voice or face. Several years now. Was Callie a user? He shook his head vigorously and groaned when it hurt. No. She didn't touch the stuff. We shared a reefer once in a while, but that was it. She came with you on your deals? Timon frowned as he tried to remember. Maybe a time or two. She didn't meet the gang, and they didn't see her. She waited a couple of streets away. Where do you meet them? Timon mentioned a street corner, a block away. Megan knew the neighborhood. It had offices and would be sparsely populated in the evenings. This gang's part of a bigger one? I wouldn't know. All I know or care about is they have good powder. He eyed the baggies in Beth's hands. Can I have those back? Beth tossed them at him, one at a time, and when he'd finished stuffing them in his pockets, Megan resumed. Did you supply to any others in your research team? Timon stopped and looked at them carefully, confidence returning to his voice and in his posture. What's this about? Who are you? I'm Megan. That's Beth. We're looking into Callie's disappearance. Timon ran a hand through his dark hair and frowned. The cops did that. Didn't get anywhere. Why do you think you'll do better? Megan ignored his question. Did you supply to anyone in Letwaski's research group? Gary Mel. They weren't regular. They would use once in three or four months. What happened that night? Babe, he rose from the couch and advanced towards Megan. I've told this a million times now. Go ask the cops. Megan didn't move back. Babe. Only Beth has the right to call me that. Her expression didn't change. Something in her eyes made Timon pause. He swore softly, sank into the couch, and repeated his story. It was practiced, the words coming easily. It was something he had narrated several times. There wasn't much for him to tell. Callie had called him before she set out from the lab, said she was coming over. She never came over. Timon had taken a snort while waiting and had drifted off to sleep. He remembered when he woke in the morning and called Callie's roommate and the alarm was raised. Doesn't look like you cared for her a lot, Beth called out from the rear of the room. Timon flushed a dull red. We were friends. We slept together a few times. It's not as if we were in love. Heck, she was closer to Lien than she was to me. They were good friends? Megan seized on his comment. That didn't come up in any police file. Very, Timon snorted. She and Lien even went a few times to California and stayed in Lien's home. Where is it? You have the address? Timon shook his head. Callie was close to her. Not I. They asked him more questions, however it was clear he didn't have anything more to share. He looked at them hopefully as they were leaving, and dangled a baggie from his fingers. You want a few? Megan slammed the door in his face. Chapter 9 Beth called Chong on their way back to their office, using the phone in the SUV. Did you find her? He chuckled when he picked up. Cop humor. Chong humor. In the background, they could hear several voices speaking, glasses clinking. You got a party going on there, Chong? Something thunked and the noise faded. Yeah. Bennett and Johnson have thrown together some drinks since we got Kane. Why don't you folks come down? You found him, you should join. Thanks, Chong, I think we'll pass. Any more of your jokes and I might end up punching you, Beth replied dryly. Reason you called? Reason we called is this, Callie was close to Lian Chengban, one of the researchers. Did you check into their backgrounds? The thunking sound came on again, and they heard Chong speak to another voice. Don't know. Zack says he'll go through the case files, talk to the then lead detectives, and get back to you. Thanks, Chong. Get back to your drinks before they disappear. 
they hit Werner the next day. Beth commanded it to look into street dealers, peddling around the university, and have a closer look at Kurt Tiemann. Megan went through Lian Chengvon's file. There wasn't much in the file. Lian was second-generation Chinese. Her dad had come to California from Hong Kong in the 60s, had worked in restaurants, and had ended up running a Chinese one. He had found his wife in the Chinese community of San Francisco, and Lian Cheng was born five years later. She's the same age as Callie. Somewhere down the line she added Vaughn to her name. Megan read through the file again, searching for Vaughn references, and didn't find any. Lian had left San Francisco to major in physics at New York University, and had then joined Columbia University's research program. That's where she and Callie met. She started using Vaughn when she came to New York. New city, new name? Maybe. She typed in more commands, and Werner responded rapidly. Lian Cheng visited Hong Kong every few years, where the Chengs had extended family. Last visit was just before the start of the research program. When did Callie and Lian visit California? Three times, Werner responded, confirming what t had told them. Once was in the first year of their research program, for a week's vacation. The two other times were in the second year. The last visit had been four months before Callie's disappearance. Letwaski said Lien left the program before Callie's disappearance. Megan reached out for her cell, lost in thought, and dialed Letwaski. She got him as he was hurrying to a lecture, and the call was brief. Two months, she mused aloud when the call ended. Ha! Beth turned around at her. Lien left the research program two months before Callie's disappearance, Megan briefed her sister. Her mom had passed away by then. Her dad wasn't doing well and needed looking after. Her father died a month after Callie's disappearance. She never rejoined the research program. Beth tapped her teeth with a pen while she thought. She shrugged finally. So? Megan shrugged back. So nothing. I can't see any connection to the disappearance. Feels like they were friends. What have you got? Nothing. Beth kicked the trash can underneath her desk. Street gangs peddling drugs aren't uncommon in our great city. They're fairly low level. Tiemann is clean, but we knew that. No criminal record. Good references. She rose and paced and outlined what they had, which wasn't much. She rested her hands on her hips and turned to Megan when she had finished. I still think Kane killed her. Megan didn't say anything for a long while and then rose. Maybe. Let's keep looking till we find something conclusive. They went for a run, to drive out the irritation at the slow pace of their investigation. Five miles in Central Park, a combination of easy running and fast sprints, followed by a complex martial arts routine that Zeb had taught them. A few men whistled at them, a couple of schoolgirls stopped to watch them. The twins paid no attention to anyone. They burned through their frustration till all that remained was the endorphin high. That high found them at 1 pp in the evening, for their regular catch-up with Pazaka and Chong. They could have spoken over a conference phone, but the twins wanted to get out of the office and the meeting offered a reason. Nothing much, Chong said regretfully when Megan asked him for an update. Maybe if you stopped partying. Beth muttered under her breath. I heard that, Chong brushed down a stubborn lick of hair. It resisted his efforts. I spoke to the then lead detectives. They had interviewed Lien and the other researchers. Nothing came out of the interviews. Bennett and Johnson are still hunting for Kane's hideout. He hesitated and looked at Beth. She shook her head in warning. Don't. Don't say Kane killed Callie. She doesn't believe it. He nodded in acknowledgement and turned to the silent twin. Megan had her face turned, she was watching the street far down below. She sensed Chang's gaze and spoke without looking up. I heard you, Chong. I also sensed that byplay. Relax. I know chances are high Callie was killed. Megan took the long route back to their office. 
down FDR Drive, around the edge of the island city, through Battery Park, and it was when she was on West Street, off the 9-11 memorial that Beth slapped her forehead. What? Megan snapped a glance at her sister. We didn't ask Timon if Lien had anyone special. We can call him. We aren't far from his apartment. We can call on him. They were at his apartment building, half an hour later, and waited for another student to unlock the elevator for them. They ignored the student's appraising look, stepped out on the now familiar hallway and its accompanying odor. Megan bunched her fist to knock on Timon's door when her hand stilled. A grunt came from the apartment. They waited and heard another familiar sound. The sound of a slap and another groan. Someone was in Timon's apartment. Assaulting him. Chapter 10 Megan motioned Beth to stay quiet and crept to the three other apartment doors in the hallway. She heard no sounds from inside. Students weren't known for early nights. She thought furiously for a moment, two of them against unknown assailants who were aggressively interrogating Timon. The sounds from inside were clearer, louder. There could be more. We need to know how many we're up against. Walking away wasn't an option. It wasn't who they were. They could call the cops, but that could take time. Don't have time. She opened her jacket, fingered the inside, and pulled out a thin cable that was fastened to two clasps sewn to the lining. The cable was telescopic and extended to three feet and gleamed in the dim light. One end of the cable had an HD nano camera. The other end of it could be connected to a cell phone. Once connected, the cable drew power from the phone and turned into a flexible surveillance device. She went to Timon's door crouched and sent a silent prayer heavenwards, there was a thin gap between the door and the flooring. Enough for the cable to slip through. She attached one end of the cable to her phone and in a moment, its screen light and images appeared. She heard Beth moving back, she didn't have to turn to see what her sister was doing. Beth would have her Glock drawn and would provide cover. They were a team. Words didn't need to be uttered. Moves came with practiced efficiency. Megan inserted the cable through the gap and edged it forward till the camera sheltered underneath the door's frame. Only someone who was looking for it, beneath the door from the inside, would spot it. She was counting on no one looking for it. Most people see at eye level. The first image came, that of the far wall. There wasn't anyone there. She rotated the camera slowly. The rest of the room came into view, a couch, a wall, the hallway, and Timon finally came into view. He was bound and sat awkwardly in the couch, the same one the twins had thrown him in. In front of him was an interrogator, lean and bending over Timon. He slapped the bound man hard, even as Megan watched. Behind the interrogator stood another man, lounging casually. He said something in a low voice, the interrogator laughed and punched Timon again. Timon grunted and shouted something that felt like I don't have it. Just two men? Megan wondered. Nope three. The third man emerged from the bedroom, came through the hallway, shook his head and said something to his companions. No visible weapons. Their shirts are loose however. Maybe they're tucked in waistbands. She watched for some more time and when she was sure there were only three interrogators, she started to rise. Footsteps sounded on the stairwell behind them. She froze and snapped a look at Beth. Her sister holstered her weapon and gestured swiftly with her hands. If they come to this floor, we'll pretend we're heading down. The footsteps came on, paused, and an irritated voice called out. Mike, where are you? Mike? The voice swore and the footsteps resumed. Going down. Megan turned to the camera when they faded. The scene was unchanged inside the room. She watched for some more time as a plan unfolded in her mind. It's risky, but which mission hasn't been? She motioned for Beth. Beth bent over her, careful to keep away from the peephole's sight line. She outlined her plan and waited for any questions. There were none. Beth holstered her weapon again, combed her hair back, 
loosened the top button on her shirt, and at a nod from Megan banged Tiemann's door with a fist. Honey, she yelled in a slurred voice. The four men in the living room looked at the door. Honey, Beth slammed her fist again. I know you're in there. The chief interrogator whispered to Tiemann. He shook his head vigorously. The interrogator nodded at one of his men who approached the door, peered through the peephole and whispered something back. Honey Beth stomped her foot and whined. I said I'm sorry. Her voice dropped an octave lower. Let me make it up for you. Megan cocked her head at her sister. Don't overdo it. He's not Mark. She looked back at her screen as Beth pounded the door again. Open up. Open up. Who are you? Tiemann yelled from inside when the interrogator jerked his head at the door. It's me? Beth. You forgot about me, already? Who else are you seeing? Beth shrieked and slammed her palm against the door. It sounded like a bullet shot and echoed in the narrow hallway. One of the hostels jumped, startled, and a hurried conference ensued when Beth repeatedly banged the door. The interrogator swiftly cut Tiemann's binding and shoved him to the door. The hostel spread out, the chief questioner to the left, the two others to the right. I'm coming. Don't wake the neighborhood, Tiemann shouted in irritation. He slowed when nearing the door, but a shove from behind brought him close. He reached a hand out. Megan freed her right hand and held out three fingers. He scrabbled against the door and unlocked it. Two. He put an eye to the peephole. One. He swung it open. Beth slammed it open, grabbed him by his shirt and yanked him out. A squawk of surprise from him and then he was outside, urged down the hallway into the stairs, Beth behind him. Megan rose smoothly to her feet, moved to her right away from the peephole, grabbed the doorknob and pulled the door tight. There was a stunned moment of silence from inside before a shout emerged. Footsteps rushed and a hand pulled at the door from inside. Megan resisted. The shouts became louder. The force on the door from inside became stronger. Megan exploded into movement. She let go of the knob suddenly and kicked the door hard. It flew open and caught one man on the chin. He staggered back and cannoned into another man. Megan flew inside, her eyes scoping the entire room, taking in everything. Two men. One holding his chin. Groaning. Another, straightening. A third a few feet away, standing slack-jawed. Light dawning in his eyes. Thought became action as Megan moved across the door and towards the two men. She kicked the first man in the groin, flung him at the wall and out of her way. A step forward her right palm came up and crushed the second man's nose. It burst blood poured down his face. He howled. A second gone. Third man'll start getting his wits back. We'll start making his move. She continued her forward motion and shoved broken nose at the third man who was finally moving. Third man's hand was darting beneath his shirt. Megan stepped wider and brought broken nose between them. She heard running footsteps. She ignored them. Beth would take care of whoever it was. Or they could be Beth's. Third man's hand started emerging from under his shirt, holding something dark and black. He took a step back, losing a second as he avoided second man. Megan's left hand grabbed her jacket, held it wide open. Her right hand blurred inside. Her palm curled around the solid grip of her Glock. Her fingers tightened, her hand withdrew, her knees bent, her body turned, presenting as small a target as possible. Third man's gun came out. Large and ugly looking. His eyes were wide. He was breathing rapidly. His barrel started rising. Megan's eyes narrowed, her vision became a tunnel, saw the hairs on his eyebrows, saw his mouth wide open. Her sight shifted an inch to her left and took in the bunching muscles of his shoulder. A fraction of a second for her eyes, her barrel and his shoulder to form a straight line. The world compressed to the weight on her trigger finger. She waited an extra fraction and depressed. The glock sounded loud in the small room and a red flower blossomed on third man's shoulder. 
Megan moved before the report had ended. She slapped third man's gun hand, sent his weapon skittering, ignored his scream, and punched him in the belly. Third man went down, his scream becoming desperate. Two steps to the right, her glock coming up, her eyes taking in the other two men. Lowering, when she saw Beth was covering them. She kicked third man's gun away, holstered her glock, and the world started spinning again. She secured the shot man, gagged him, and while Beth was binding the two others, Timon stumbled in. His face slackened in shock when he saw his attackers on the floor. He swallowed and turned wide eyes at one twin, and then at the other. Megan spared him a quick glance and pulled out her phone. He's filled with adrenaline. The questioning can wait till he normalizes. She dialed Chong and cut his greeting short. You need to come here. She didn't give the address, she didn't have to. Each operative in the agency had GPS tags in their clothing and shoes. Werner monitored their movements continually and flagged any anomalies to all of them. The two cops had access to Werner's feed for the twins. Chong recognized the tone in her voice. Bodies? Megan looked at the three men groaning on the floor. None. Chapter 11 They questioned Timon while waiting for Chong and Pazaka. A torrent of words burst from him at first. It slowed down to a trickle when Beth crossed her arms and faced him impassively. Start again, she commanded him. Who are these dudes? Why are they roughing you up? The chief interrogator shouted something unintelligible behind the tape on his mouth and kicked the air furiously. Timon licked his lips and looked away from him hastily. They're from the street gang I mentioned. They're enforcers. Just how much do you owe them? Beth asked him curiously. 40k, came the shamefaced reply. Geez, all along we thought you're into petty recreational use. It is just that. My clients fell behind in their payments and stuff escalated, Timon insisted. Thanks, he said awkwardly. If you hadn't come in time. Save it. You're still in a world of trouble. Don't I know it, Timon muttered and looked at the doorway as Chong walked in. His jaw dropped at the sight of Pazaka, resplendent in a dinner jacket and a bow tie. They're cops. NYPD. Beth suppressed a smile at his expression. I never saw a cop like that. Chong stopped, surveyed the scene and shook his head accusingly at Megan. No bodies, you said. They're alive, aren't they? Pazaka took Timon's story while the twins gave formal statements to Chong. He recorded them silently and posed just one question. You could have called us. Timon would have been dead by then, Beth fired back. The two cops consulted each other and made notes, while more officers streamed in and took away the gangbangers. Beth stopped the cop who was leading Timon away. Reason we came back, she addressed the student, was Lien seeing anyone? Any boyfriend or girlfriend in her life? No. His expression turned sheepish. I made the moves on her once, she turned me down. Say, the hopeful expression returned on his face as he turned to Beth. I like that trick. How about a drink when all this is over? We've heard of this gang, Chong told the twins when the police officers departed along with the captives. The university cops had liaised with ours and were keeping tabs on them. This is the first arrest we've made though. Good for you Chong. Doesn't get us closer to Cali though. Megan smiled to take the sting out of her words. Chong shrugged. Cops had to take their breaks wherever they found them. A small group of students had gathered at the entrance when the two cops and the twins made their way to their vehicles. A few mobile phones flashed and caught Pazaka in his glory. There would be breathless coverage of the night's events in the university's newspaper the next day. Pazaka will keep a clipping of the article. It'll go into his media coverage collection. Megan smiled inwardly as she keyed open their SUV. Neither the cops nor the twins spotted the solitary figure lurking at the edge of the crowd. The news filtered up the gang through several layers. The solitary figure at the apartment building made a note of the SUV's plates and relayed the number and the images of the twins he had photographed. 
His message was received by his boss, a gang leader who controlled three blocks. The enforcers belonged to the gang boss, and he had suffered the most. He conveyed the message to his boss, a fearsome hood with an eagle tattoo that covered the right side of his face. The eagle twitched as the underling relayed his news and waited for whatever fate would befall him. The underling was relieved when the eagle twitched again and the hood dismissed him. The eagle tat hood pondered for several moments and then took a deep breath and passed the message upstairs. As fearsome as he was on the streets, he reported to someone else. The loss of $40,000 reached Joe the next day, after passing through two more layers. Along with it came the text message of a license plate number and a photograph of two women. Joe was in the meatpacking district, in a small stuffy office on the first floor of a block of offices. The offices housed graphic artists, accountants, marketing services providers, almost all of them were single-owner businesses. The board on top of Joe's office read Oriental Import and Export. It was a common enough name. Thousands of businesses all over the world had exactly the same name. Inside the office were Buddha figurines and various pieces of art housed in glass cases. There were ceramic plates, vases on top of shelves, and horses pranced on a sideboard. The office was just a single box-like room, and while it was stuffy, it was tidy. Joe's desk was polished wood. Plain, but burnished to a mirror finish. A few files lay in front of him, and a computer blinked silently, awaiting his command. A cell phone was on the desk. Joe listened silently as a broad-shouldered man gave him the details. Joe fired off a few questions in Mandarin when the man had finished. The man answered back. The conversation was brief. Other than the unrecovered payment and the women, there wasn't any more detail. Joe nodded at the man who left silently and shut the door behind him. Joe didn't tap his fingers on the desk. He didn't furrow his brow. He didn't sigh. His face was expressionless while his mind sped and examined the news. 40k was a big sum to lose. However, it was down to the street-level gang boss to make good on the loss. It wasn't Joe's problem. The capture of the enforcers was a bit more troubling, but again, the street gang would be the one directly affected. That too didn't bother Joe. The women were a different matter, however. He had made the connection to one of them immediately. She was the same one who was with Kane as he died. Now she had popped up again, along with her sister. The two had taken out the enforcers easily. More importantly, they had made contact with Timon. Joe closed his eyes and thought back to the day he had knifed Kane. His people had been in the crowd, and one of them had been within touching distance of the woman. His men had sworn the killer had died without uttering a word. The photograph had passed hands, but that couldn't be helped. Joe could think in Mandarin, Cantonese, or English. He spoke English with an American accent, Mandarin and Cantonese with a Chinese one. He thought in the three languages now, as he weighed the new information, but didn't get anywhere. Joe rose and shut the office and went for a walk. The meatpacking district had housed slaughterhouses and refrigeration plants, and had once produced a significant portion of the country's dressed meat. The district was now home to fashion designers, artists, and corporate houses. There were still a few meatpackers left in the Gansport Market near the southern side of the High Line. Joe walked up West 14th Street, making his way through elegantly dressed women, suited men, bicycle messengers, and artists. He didn't cut through the crowd. He drifted, men and women parting for him. The heavens opened suddenly, and people dashed for cover. Joe didn't break his stride. He didn't even cover his head. Rain beat down on the black hair on his head and ran down his cheeks in rivulets. Joe stared ahead, his dark eyes seeing nothing and yet seeing everything. He didn't look forward to the call he had to make, but his expression didn't give anything away. Matters had to be escalated. Chapter 12 Joe and all the layers, down to the street-level gang, belonged to 41S. 41S was a New York criminal gang that had its origins in the powerful 14K and Sun Yi on triad gangs in the city. The 14K and Sun Yi on 
were two of the largest triad gangs that had their origins in mainland China and Hong Kong in the 18th century. The gangs had survived through the centuries and had grown despite the best efforts of various law enforcement authorities. The triads had branches all over the world and were involved in prostitution, drugs, weapons, and people smuggling, counterfeiting, and assassination. The 41S had been formed in New York a decade back by one Alex Peng Huang, who had once been in the 14K. Peng Huang had risen up the ranks in the triad gang and ran several gang members in midtown Manhattan. He had found his ambitions thwarted in the 14K. He had found the ways of the triad stifling. Peng Huang studied criminal gangs in the city and learned how the most successful ones adapted to changing times. His gang didn't change. It stuck to tradition and rigid hierarchies. Its recruitment was failing. Peng Huang, whose folks were from Hong Kong, wanted to grow faster than his gang would allow him to. He wished to capture territory from rival gangs, he wanted to be feared. In a bold, audacious move, Peng Huang reached out to like-minded members not just in the 14K, but also in its rivals, the Sun Yian. In a secretive meeting in a business hotel, he outlined his plans. It wouldn't break away from tradition entirely, it would adopt the same hierarchy the triads operated, but there would be fewer layers. There would be more autonomy. Street-level gangs would run their business the way they felt best. There would be top-level directions, but those would be limited to policy. Peng Huang liked policy. It was a corporate term. His gang would be more corporate-like. There were 10 attendees at that meeting that night. Most of them were gang bosses in the two triads. Three of the gang bosses signed up to Peng Huang's 41S that same night. Three others were killed on their way home. Two others found their wives dead when they reached their homes. The last two got the message. The meeting was never to be spoken of. They didn't. They had reason to fear Peng Huang. Everyone in the 14K and Sun Yi On had reason to. For Peng Huang had Zhou. Zhou had been a red pole, an enforcer in the 14K, the chief enforcer in the New York chapter. He also was enforcer in Peng Huang's gang. That wasn't the only connection that linked the two men. Peng Huang's folks had found Zhou shivering and crying in the ship they arrived in. The ship carried illegal immigrants stowed away in containers in its holds. Each container held masses of humanity who looked forward to reaching land, America, where they would make their dreams come true. Peng Huang and his parents were in one container, along with tens of other people. Zhou, a young boy, a couple of years older than Peng Huang, was in the same container along with his folks. In the crossing, Zhou's parents died, as did several other immigrants, the lack of sanitation, fresh air and habitable space taking its toll on the frail and elderly. Peng Huang's parents adopted Zhou and he became family. Peng Huang and Zhou. The former had ambition, cunning and street smarts. The latter was a cold-blooded killer, the likes of whom the 14K had never seen before. The 14K and the Sun Yian soon found out about the breakaway gang, which Peng Huang mockingly named the 41S. The two gangs made outrage noises, talked of honor and brotherhood. At one point, the hostile discussions nearly resulted in bloodshed. No one wanted to go against Zhou, however, and the 41S was left alone. It was a small gang after all. How much territory could it capture? The 41S didn't stay small for long. Peng Huang was a charismatic gang boss, and he attracted youth who were disenchanted with the triads. The membership grew to 30, then 50, and reached 100 in no time. That was still tiny compared to the larger, established gangs in the city. Size wasn't what Peng Huang was interested in, however. He wanted power. He visited Hong Kong and mainland China frequently and established contacts with powerful men. He created alliances and partnerships, another corporate word that he liked. In New York he formed his network, corrupt police officers and politicians. City officials and builders those who existed at street level. Chinese cab drivers, cleaners, doormen and store owners. In the 10 years of forming 41S, 
Hong Huang's gang in New York became known as the go-to gang for those back in China. Killing Kane was a contract that had come from China. There were other contracts related to Kane. Joe returned to his office, his mind back to its equilibrium state. He lit a joss stick, seated himself and made the call. He wasn't worried about taps on his phone or bugs in his office. Peng Huang had a Chinese firm that took care of security. They said they were better than the NSA and claimed they had hacked into the NSA's servers and pirated classified intel. Joe had no reason to doubt them. He would have dealt with them a long time back if they hadn't lived up to their claims. He spoke in Mandarin and briefed Peng Huang on the developments. He waited when he had finished and in the stillness at the other end, heard the murmuring of a woman and Peng Huang shushing her. This time of the day, Peng Huang would be with his mistress. One of them. Joe didn't have any. He had no romantic liaisons. The work was his gang. Peng Huang was his brother. There was no room in his life for women. You're sure he didn't speak to her? Peng Huang asked finally, referring to Kane and the woman they knew as Megan Peterson. Yes. Where's the other woman? Dead. Where he left her. Someone will find her at some point. You're keeping watch? Yes. Will the watcher take care not to be made? Yes. Peng Huang snapped his phone shut and slapped the rump of the woman beside him. She wriggled it invitingly. He ignored it and lay back on the bed. The developments weren't bad, but they weren't welcome. Still, some complications were to be expected. Peng Huang knew only part of the plan, but he knew it was big and bold and had several moving parts. Some disruption had been factored in. Peng Huang rose from his bed, padded to the bathroom and freshened up. He went to the balcony of his 14th floor apartment and looked down at Midtown Manhattan as he made a call. Peng Huang too had a boss. Chapter 13 the boss was in Hong Kong. He wasn't really a boss. He was a connector of people, a mover and a shaker. He was an influencer for sure, however he didn't hold any real power. Nor did he make any decisions. He was the one who had put the 41S in touch with his masters. Peng Huang's report needed to be relayed to those masters. He looked out of his mirrored high-rise in central Hong Kong, at the city skyline. A jet streaked in the blue sky in the far distance and for a moment he wished he was on it. He shook his head in irritation and made his call. The call bounced from server to server all over the world before ending up in another office. In Beijing. The recipient listened and barked an order. It translated to haul your ass over here in English. The connector of people sighed in Hong Kong. He was expecting precisely that reaction. He made another call to the driver of his Mercedes and then dialed the number of his favorite mistress. She would accompany him to Beijing. He might not return alive, but at the least, he would have good company. The man in Beijing and the connector of people met in a massage parlor in Beijing the next day. It wasn't any random massage parlor. This one catered to the powerful and the rich. Its security was unrivaled, and it offered something of enormous importance to its patrons. Discretion and privacy. The two men lay side by side as their bodies were worked on by two masseuses. They were confident the women wouldn't tattle. They couldn't. The masseuses' tongues had been cut off. The connector of people told the other man about Peng Huang's call. The man grunted and rolled over on his back at a tap on his shoulder. He winced in pain as the masseuse's fingers dug deep into his shoulders. He welcomed the pain. Pain was good. How close are we? Very close, sir, the connector replied. The plan had been devised by the man in Beijing. It had taken several years to get all the parts in place, since everything had to be done clandestinely, and in the early years the end game wasn't clear. The papers were vital to the plan. They were being manufactured in three plants in Ohio, California, and Washington. Once they were ready, they would be shipped out. 
Then the other event would occur, and the world would discover the enormity of the plan. It wasn't as dramatic as exploding a nuclear weapon in America. It was something far more dangerous. You noticed those gang members were Chinese? Beth huffed as the twins ran in Central Park two days later. Two days in which there had been no progress. The captured hoods hadn't revealed anything and backed up Tiemann's story that he owed them money. A large sum. Jack Minder had called once to check up on their progress. Megan's hand had whitened on the phone as she replied there wasn't any. Yeah, Megan replied. Lien is of Chinese origin. You think there's a connection? Worth looking into. It's not as if we have a lot to go on. They ran another mile in silence before Beth spoke. You remember that comment t men made? About Callie when she returned from California. That she acted scared. Yeah. We should look into that. They visited the mentors that evening, who confirmed that Callie had mentioned Lien several times to them. No, Lien had never visited them with Callie. They had seen her pictures, but had never met her. They went to California a few times, Percy piped up hope in her eyes. Megan didn't meet her eyes. It was increasingly looking like Kane had killed Callie, even though I don't want to believe that. They would pursue the Lien connection, but it felt like it would go nowhere. Did Callie tell you anything of Lien? Beth asked Percy when the younger girl accompanied them to street level. Percy pursed her lips and thought back. No, not that I can remember. She was excited about going to California the first time. The twins flew to Palo Alto the next day. Palo Alto in the Bay Area of San Francisco was small, 67 square kilometers with a population of less than 70,000. Initially founded as a temperance town by the founder of Stanford University, Palo Alto was now home to some of the most famous high-tech companies in the world. Beth dug out Lian Chang Bon's office address as their Gulfstream cut through blue sky and scoffed at gravity as it flew across the country. Hadixon Research, she murmured aloud and placed a call to its switchboard. An assistant came online and made an appointment for them to meet Lien the next day. Beth leaned back in the plush leather seat and admired the interior of the aircraft. It was a gift from the same Middle Eastern Royal Zeb had helped. It was piloted by two ex-servicemen who were on the security consulting firm's payroll. She wriggled her toes, stifled a yawn and looked at her sister who was peering through the window. We've got an appointment for tomorrow. I heard, Megan replied without looking back. We'll find her, Beth tried again. Megan didn't reply. Beth looked at the back of her head and sighed. Megan was the cool, analytical one of the two of them, whereas Beth was impulsive, she went with her heart. She's taking it harder than me on this case. You really need a boyfriend. He'd cheer you up. She got a middle finger in reply. Bright sunshine greeted them when they landed at the small but busy Palo Alto airport. Megan led the way outside, donned her shades and scanned the people outside the airport. Many of them waited with name boards, some were family. A man hung at the edge of the crowd, his eyes on them. She caught his look, exchanged a nod and walked towards him. Laverne Marshall, ma'am. He shook their hands and walked with them to a line of vehicles. He pointed to a black Yukon and handed her the keys. Call me when you don't need it anymore. They had SUVs stashed all over the country and in several international cities at their disposal, stored in friendly auto garages. Each garage owner was an ex-serviceman and in many instances had been funded by their consulting firm. Every vehicle was outfitted to the same specs as their rides in New York, and after every mission, the garage collected the vehicle, serviced it, and kept it ready. Megan thanked Marshall, and when he had disappeared in the crowd of people, fired up the Yukon. They went to Leon's townhome on Ramona Street in the evening, when the heat had lessened and drove past. Megan hung a right at a light, returned, and parked behind a Mazda. Beth and she walked back to the townhome, maps in hand, smiled at a few joggers and cyclists. Just like tourists in a new town. Lian Chengban's townhome felt empty. 
She's probably at work, Beth read her thoughts. Lives alone. They walked the length of the street and on their return pass, Megan looked at the townhome's gate closely. I could leap over that. No surveillance cameras visible. Could be easier to talk to her tomorrow, she admonished herself. It's a mix-up, the neatly dressed woman Jenny the nameplate on her chest read, looked up at them. We have two Lian Chengs. The one you want is in Hong Kong. Megan stared at the diminutive woman in disbelief. Lian Cheng Von, not Lian Cheng. She's the one we want to speak to. Yes, ma'am. We have two Lian Cheng Vons. Our booking system got them mixed up. I'm sorry. We came 3,000 miles for this? Megan raised her voice. People turned around in the vast lobby of the air-conditioned, mirrored glass building that housed Hadixon Research. She didn't care. We made an appointment yesterday. Your system could have alerted you, you could have called us and saved us the trip. I'm sorry ma'am. Jenny looked contrite. Is there anyone else who can help you? Perhaps someone from our marketing team? No, Beth intervened before Megan exploded. When did Lian Cheng Von move to Hong Kong? Jenny looked at them in surprise. A long time back. She's been in Hong Kong for nearly two years. She works out of our office there. Megan climbed into the Yukon without a word, belted up and gripped the wheel tightly. Relax, Beth urged. I am relaxed, she growled. How did this happen? She didn't wait for a response. She punched a number and after a few rings, Chang's voice came on. How can the NYPD help you? She ignored his attempt at humor and broke it down for him. She was in California when Bennett and Johnson video interviewed her. I'm sure about that. Hang on. He put them on hold and returned several minutes later. Yeah, I spoke to them and checked their files. She was in Palo Alto then. In Hadixon Research. Megan ended the call and powered off without a further word. She floored it when they hit the open road, overtook a solitary pickup truck and slowed when she entered Ramona Street. She slowed further and parked three homes away. She was out of the vehicle before Beth had unfastened her belt and strode to the townhome. A quick look up and down the street. No one was visible. No curtains were twitching in neighboring homes. The wrought iron gate was her height. She vaulted nimbly over it, ignoring Beth's cautionary warning, and landed inside Leon's front yard. Neatly kept garden. A small path leading to the house. Probably a gardener on retainer, who has access to the gate. No alarms rang. No dogs barked. She went to the front door and rang the buzzer. It stayed shut. There were no stacks of flyers or newspapers at the front. She went to the side of the house and peered through the first window. Living room. Empty. Clean. No trace of dust. She went down the side of the house and looked through another window. Kitchen. Further down an extension wall ran across the breadth, led to the neighboring home and blocked her way forward. She returned to the front and went down the other side. She had no better luck since the house widened and blocked any access. She vaulted back and joined her sister who looked up from her phone. Taxes and utilities are paid promptly. The house is in her name? Yeah. Megan ran a finger through her hair, thinking of their next steps, when the first SUV appeared out of nowhere. It rolled to a stop a few feet away from them, scattering gravel over them. Two men leapt out. What the? Megan shoved Beth away and dove to one side. Her right hand flickered, her Glock appeared just as two more SUVs appeared. More doors slammed. More dark-suited men appeared, wearing shades. They spread out, drew their handguns and surrounded the twins. Megan snapped a glance at Beth. Her weapon was out. Outnumbered. FBI, a voice shouted. Chapter 14 that voice. It's familiar. Megan's gun arm lowered, not by much. She still remained crouched, alert, her eyes searching for the voice amongst the suited men. 
A car roared past and its brakes squealed as its driver turned incredulous eyes to the scene. He sped up and disappeared when two grim-faced men looked in his direction. Megan gaped in amazement when a woman stepped in front of the men and commanded them to stand down. Special Agent in Charge Sarah Burke. What's she doing here? You, she blurted. Way to go, Megan, such a clever question. Burke was dressed in a navy blue suit, her blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail and wrapped in a band. Her blue eyes were intelligent, and a trace of humor was in them as she surveyed the twins. We don't need those, do we? She pointed at their glocks. Megan holstered hers, Beth followed, a minute later muttering something under her breath that sounded like, depends. He's not here. This is an FBI gig, Burke said when Megan looked beyond her and guessed she was searching for broker. He said you'd be glad to see me. A ghost of a smile flickered over the FBI agent's lips and disappeared. The twins liked Sarah Burke. She was smart as kick-asses themselves and gelled with all of them. She had surprised them both by revealing a wicked sense of humor, and that sealed it. She became agency family. Burke knew little of the agency, deliberately so. She knew broker Zeb, the twins and the rest, worked in some shadowy government outfit. She had met Claire once and knew that she ran the agency. She also knew they undertook missions she hadn't heard of. It's best you don't know much of us. Don't ask questions, Broker had told her one night and she had agreed. She was FBI. She had to go by the rules. The agency didn't have rules. What the heck's going on, Sarah? Why are the heavies with you? Beth burst out, casually insulting the FBI agents with Burke. Burke turned to the stony-faced men. It's all right. I know them. She waited till they melted back into their vehicles, and turned back to the sisters. Her blue eyes lost their warmth, turned serious. Calliope Minter was an undercover FBI agent. Callie was recruited by us when she was at Princeton, the first time during her grad studies. Burke continued, when they gathered in Megan's hotel room, after most of the FBI agents disappeared in roars of engines and clouds of dust. Two men remained, they leaned against walls in the room, their shades catching the light as they moved their heads occasionally. You recruited her? Why? Beth sat up straight and glared at the FBI agent. Not me, personally. I'll get to the why in a moment, Burke replied, unperturbed by the interruption. You've heard of Chinese espionage in this country, haven't you? Both sisters nodded. It was well covered in the media. Corporate spying, hacking into government servers, we know of all those activities and in most instances, were able to close down those rings. About six years back, we became aware of a new kind of espionage. Stealing university research? Megan got there before Burke finished and got an approving nod. Yeah. Especially those programs that are funded by the DOD. We became aware of leakage of classified research it was only when we arrested the first student, a Chinese spy in California, we realized what was happening. We decided to be proactive, have our own agent embedded in university research programs. Callie fit the profile perfectly. She was multilingual, smart, and she had an inclination for further studies. You knew her research group had a spy? No, Burke replied and smiled briefly when Beth snapped her fingers. You've got several such agents in place all over? Yeah, but none of them discovered any espionage activity. Megan's brow furrowed as she thought of another angle. This must have taken time, however. Callie fit your profile but she still had to be trained, her voice trailed off. We had time, Burke replied simply. It wasn't as if we were up against a timeline. The odds would swing in our favor eventually with the undercover network we were building. Callie traveled frequently to Virginia. We spotted that, Beth interrupted her again, looking at Megan, it was way before her disappearance so we ignored it. Burke's eyes took a faraway look. Nothing happened during her grad studies program. The second time, she had Lien in her research group. Lien had Hong Kong connections. You suspected her? Burke nodded. 
The research was of vital importance to the DOD. Lian's presence rang a few alarm bells at our end. Her Chinese connections, frequent travel to that country. We thought we had something here. One of the agents swung his head and his shades rested on Burke for a moment, she resumed when he didn't speak. Callie got close to all the researchers in her group. We knew about Tiemann and tipped the cops. They didn't act on it. A fleeting smile made an appearance on her face and transformed it. Made it youthful. She became friends with Lien, visited her home in California a few times. We know all that too, Megan urged her on with a hand motion. Callie called me one night, after her return from the last visit. She said she might have something for us. On Lien. What was it? Burke ran a hand through her hair in frustration. We never found out. Callie was going to verify a few more details before we mounted surveillance on Lien. She was due to meet me in three days. Then she disappeared. Something doesn't add up. She knows a lot of Callie's life. Callie didn't strike me as one who shared personal details. Megan thought as she watched Burke. You had Callie followed, didn't you? She guessed. Burke jerked her head at the two agents. Clem and Peters. They had eyes on Callie once she flagged Lien. To keep her safe. Just in case. You followed her the night she disappeared? Megan asked the two men. Yeah, the one who was Clem answered. A phone buzzed. Burks. She held a finger up wanting silence, glanced at it, grimaced and left the room to take the call. Clem straightened and drifted closer to the sisters. We shadowed her, one behind, one ahead, or both of us on either side of the street. Frequently alternating. Standard tradecraft. How did they lose her? Clem seemed to read Megan's thoughts. That night, I was behind her. Peters was ahead. We followed her from her lab. No traffic. No pedestrians. It was easy to keep her in sight. She knew about you? Beth asked. Nope. We were insurance. He didn't glance in her direction, as if sensing her anger. An ambulance roared past, lights flashing, siren sounding. The full works. I lost sight of her for a few seconds. When the street cleared, she was gone. Chapter 15 Clem's cell rang before Megan or Beth could question him further. He turned his head and listened quietly, and slid his phone back into an inside pocket when the call ended. Burke wants us downstairs. Nope, she didn't say why, he answered Beth's questioning look. The sisters filed behind the two agents, who went down the small hallway to an elevator door. Peters jabbed the button to summon it, and stood staring at the stainless steel doors. You didn't see the grab? Beth addressed his profile. I wasn't looking behind. I figured Clem had her in his sights. A muscle beneath his ear twitched, as if irritated by Beth's piercing gaze. How difficult is it to shadow a woman, a fellow agent? Beth muttered. A dull flush flooded Peters's face as he swung around angrily, jabbing a finger at her. The hallway was narrow, crowding the four of them. Peters's finger poked Beth's chest. He withdrew his hand quickly, though not fast enough as Beth slapped it away with a cold, don't touch me. The red on Peters's face darkened. His left hand half flickered toward the inside of his jacket, to where a taser was holstered. He didn't get to complete his action. Beth lunged forward so fast that he couldn't react, couldn't even blink. She came inside his open stance, shoved him back with her left palm against his chest, and grabbed the taser with her right. She released it smoothly even as his hand was grasping at empty air, and pointed it at the FBI agent. She heard the whisper of steel on fabric behind her, and flicked her eyes at the steel doors. Its polished surface showed Megan in her familiar crouch, her glock aimed squarely at Clem who had one hand inside his jacket, the other raised above his head. Peter stood frozen in disbelief. Anger and fear hadn't reached his eyes. Not yet. Clem didn't move. The elevator came to a sliding stop and its doors whooshed open. It was empty. 
The mirror at its back looked on in mute silence at the tableau in front of it. Beth waited a beat and then relaxed and whirled the taser in her palm and handed it to Peters. Grip first. We won't talk of this. Peters's shades looked at her and then down at the device. His face was white, his hand had the faintest tremble as he took the taser and holstered it. He gave a short nod and entered the elevator. He had his game face on by the time he turned around and faced the doors. If it was normal practice for him to be easily disarmed by a woman, it didn't show. They went down the floors in silence and when the doors opened again, Beth stepped out first and then Peters. Clem gestured courteously to Megan who thanked him with a regal nod and walked out. Clem's lips twitched. It could have been a smile. Burke was waiting for them in the lobby, on a couch in the corner of the vast room, her presence and body language creating an island of privacy. It was the director, she addressed her agents. She looked past them at the twins. Another case. The sisters seated themselves opposite her, waited for her to collect her thoughts and resume. There isn't much more to tell, Burke began, after a swift glance at the twins and her agents. We suspected the ambulance to be the heist vehicle, but Peters and Clem were too far from their ride to give chase. They called it in. Informed the cops. But the ambulance got away. What of Callie? Megan broke the short silence that followed Burke's narration. She's still missing. No ransom notes, no contact from her kidnappers, but you know all of that. What you don't know, what the wider public doesn't, is that the FBI wasn't contacted either. None of our undercover agents were compromised. No case was sabotaged, and Callie had knowledge of a few. They would have been, if Callie had been grabbed by another intelligence agency. They would have sweated her. Or worse, Megan surmised. So the Chinese weren't involved? Doesn't look like it, Burke agreed in resignation. Not in Callie's research program. What of Lien, though? Beth asked curiously. You had cause to suspect her. Of being a plant. Burke's professional mask dropped. She turned her back on her agents and let an expression of weariness cross her face. Yeah. And we monitored her ever since she pinged her radar. But she isn't involved. Not in Callie's disappearance. You know that for sure? How? Beth pressed her. Not involved in Callie's disappearance. Megan picked on that and answered before Burke could. You've hacked her emails, all her communication, haven't you? You bugged her home. Probably placed optics too. That's how you knew we were here. That's how you're sure she had nothing to do with Callie. You two want to join the FBI? Burke sidestepped Megan's reply with a smile. It'd be a cold day in hell, Beth snorted. We've turned down the director. Several times. Leon's involved in something, though. Has to be. There's a reason high flying Sarah Burke is tracking her. Megan looked searchingly at the special agent in charge, not wishing to let her off the hook till they had answers. Burke bit her lip for a moment and looked from one twin to the other. What the heck, she said finally. You're both security cleared. Way higher than the clearances I have, the way Broker tells it. Broker was right. All the agency operatives had access to the most sensitive intel and classified information. They had to, to be effective. Leon's dad was connected to the triads. You know. We know of the triads, Megan cut short Burke's elaboration. Right. The father's connection went right to the top of one of the largest triad gangs. The 14K. We discovered the connection only after we'd hacked her emails. Megan whistled softly and considered the implications. The 14K was big in Asia. It was growing in Europe and North America. It was one of the most secretive gangs in the gang universe. No wonder Burks buzzed about this. She deals with special cases. She's got a possible in on the 14K. This is as special as it gets. Is Hadigzan a front for the gang? Nope. It's a legit firm. Leon's work with them is all above board. 
she's not involved with the gang either. In fact, she was persuading her dad to give up all gang activity. Her father was involved in people smuggling. Megan cut her off again, this time with a hand wave. Not wishing to be rude, Sarah, Lien and the 14K are no longer of interest to us, not if Lien or the Triad Gang had no role to play in Callie's disappearance. What of Callie? she persisted with her questioning. Burke's professional mask came on again. You know the status on that. Still missing. Thought to be killed by Kane. That's a NYPD investigation. Beth kicked at the SUV's tire once, twice, and with the last forceful kick got inside and looked straight ahead while Megan wheeled out of the hotel. Back to the airport to hand over the wheels. Then to board the Gulfstream and head home. With nothing to show for traveling 3,000 miles and pursuing the only thin lead they had. Burke had left them earlier, with her agents in tow, after a promise to keep them abreast of any development. Frickin' waste, Beth stared moodily as a bare-chested skateboarder whizzed past her window, sucking from a drink in his hand. He waved at the twins. They ignored him. Look at the bright side, Megan tried to cheer her up. We'll be leaving this blue sky and sunshine behind, before you deck the next surfer dude who approaches you. The twins loved visiting California. It was cheerful. It was upbeat. It was different from New York. However, it wasn't home. Joe followed the sisters to the airport and watched them disappear inside its deep recesses. His phone rang after 45 minutes, confirmation that the twins had boarded a private jet, and on cue, a silvery airplane rose above the airport's buildings and reached for the sky. Joe had eyes on the twins in New York. He had come close enough to overhearing them discuss their plans to fly to Palo Alto. It had been a simple matter to follow them on a different flight. The 41S wasn't the biggest gang in the country. It wasn't the smallest either, and it had resources. One of those resources was a private jet. He had followed the sisters in Palo Alto, had seen them case Lien Cheng Von's home, and had watched the FBI agents surround them. He had snapped pictures of the agents, particularly of the female one. He followed them to the twins' hotel, and it was there that his luck ran out. Hanging around in the hotel would have been too conspicuous. He hadn't gotten close enough to use any surveillance device. He didn't know what was being discussed indoors, however he could make a guess. He called Peng Huang from the airport parking lot, his eyes on the jet till it merged with a cloud. Peng Huang cursed for a while and then made his call to Hong Kong, to the connector, who made the third call. The man in Beijing fired off questions rapidly. What was the impact of this development? Was the FBI woman a threat? Was everything on track? Don't know. Don't know. Yes, were the answers. The Beijing man barked an order. Find out about any possible impact and about the FBI agent. It eventually reached Joe. Amongst many other things, Joe was good at finding out answers. Chapter 16 Megan stopped abruptly when she entered the office, at the sight of the man stretched out on the couch. He was lean, brown-haired, and had his eyes closed as he lay casually on one of their multi-hued couches. What oh? Beth approached the man and stood arms akimbo over him. He's sleeping, she mock whispered loudly. Megan grinned and went to the small kitchen to brew coffee for the three of them. They both knew the man wasn't sleeping. Even if he was, he could spring to alertness in the blink of an eye, ready to face any threat. Over coffee, the twins took turns breaking down the entire case to Zeb, the brown-haired man. He listened without interrupting, and when they had finished, had a single question. Is Burke going to tell the parents? Yeah, Beth replied. We went nuclear when she broke it to us, but she had her reasons. She's asked us to be there when she briefs Callie's folks. I have a feeling they won't be as understanding. She looked at her wrist and rose abruptly. We need to go. Right now. She'll be at the Minters in 45 minutes. Shall I come along? Zeb called out at the departing backs. Nope. You keep out of this. 
Percy hired us, not you, Megan tossed over her shoulder. Zeb raised his hands in surrender. Just asking. And you've been told, Beth's voice floated back at him as the sisters entered the elevator. Grace and Jack Minter went through a gamut of emotions as they heard Burke reveal Callie's identity. Jack stood red-faced in anger and paced the living room when she walked them through the FBI's investigation and actions. You never thought to tell us? Her parents? All these years and not one of you had it in you to inform us, he yelled and brushed off Percy's attempts to calm him down. He glanced once at his wife and her tears spurred him on. You have any idea how this feels? No, he roared when Burke opened her mouth. Don't speak. Don't talk. You've said enough. Get out of my house and don't come back till you've found my daughter. Why are you two still here? He turned his fire on the twins when Burke left. We hired you to find my daughter, all you've got is jack shit. He pointed a stubby finger at the door, ignoring Percy and Grace's protestations, and slammed the door behind the sisters. Can't fault him. His world just got rocked. Can't fault Burke either. Undercover work has its constraints. Megan looked at her reflection in the polished panel of the elevator as it took them down to street level. She had her game face on. Next to her stood her sister, clutching her jacket tightly around her even though it was a warm day. Beth didn't have her game face on. She was pale, her green eyes large in her face. You okay? Megan asked her reflection. Beth moistened her lips and attempted a smile. There's an upside to this. The smile became a laugh at Megan's disbelieving expression. We could have still been in Boston, living the corporate life. The sisters once had a digital agency business in Boston and had blue-chip clients on their roles. The work was steady, the money was good, it was also mind-numbingly boring. Then Zeb had happened. Selling their agency and joining Zeb had been an easy decision to make. Convincing Zeb had been harder, but he'd come round to it. You're not going to stop pestering me, are you? He had smiled ruefully when they had pitched to him for the millionth time. Nope, Beth had replied saucily and that had been the last straw. Megan followed Beth out of the elevator, out of the small lobby to the street where Burke was waiting for them. Burke was pale too but her eyes were steady as was her voice. I called Pazaka and Chong and updated them. They had a few choice words for me, she shrugged. It comes with the territory. I told them to expect fireworks the next time they spoke to the Minters. A cruiser raced past, its light bar flashing, its siren scattering traffic like leaves in a storm. We had long discussions with Callie, about telling her folks. About not telling them. We thought it was best to keep them in the dark. What you don't know, this wasn't the first undercover assignment for Callie. She was a seasoned agent. Experienced. She wants us to understand. She's presenting the case she wanted to make to the Minters. Burke? Sarah? Megan interrupted her. We understand, she said softly when Burke halted the rush of words and looked at her. The FBI agent licked her lips, blinked her eyes and glanced away. Megan thought she saw a trace of moistness in them and reached out a comforting hand. It didn't get to Burke's shoulder. Megan's cell phone in her jeans vibrated. A text message. She was pulling it out when a sudden squeal of tires caught her attention. A Ford Explorer came to a screeching stop, inches away from their ride. A Chevy jammed close behind it. Doors opened and several men spilled from their interiors. 6. Megan counted swiftly as she moved back instinctively, spreading out, opening space between herself and Beth, between herself and Burke. Not FBI. These are trouble. The six men fanned out and approached them, walking slowly, confidently. The pavement behind the women had emptied, as if sensing trouble. There wasn't anyone in sight behind the men. They owned the pavement, and had the look of men who would soon own the women too. Two at either end have clubs. Two in the middle have chains. Or something like that. The two others are reaching for guns. Megan assessed without conscious thought, her mind readying her body for combat. She flicked her eyes sideways at her sister and Burke. 
They were ready. Beth's eyes told her what she needed to know. FBI. Stop right there, Bert called out in a strong voice. Gone was the paleness. Gone was the moisture in her eyes. The approaching men didn't stop. One of them said something to the others. They laughed. A club thwacked in a palm. It sounded like a gunshot. Four of them peeled away from the gunman and came forward. The gunman stopped, their arms to their sides, their handguns dangling casually, pointing downward. Three. Megan felt her sister shift imperceptibly. Beth had read Megan's body language. Correctly. Two. To their left was their ride. Behind them was Burke's vehicle, and behind it was a line of parked cars. To their right was a short stretch of pavement after which lawns and gardens started. A waist-high, neatly trimmed hedge was closest to them on that side. One. Megan took a running step forward and sailed in the air and over their ride. Beth leapt in the opposite direction and went over the hedge. Burke fell flat on the pavement, rolled twice and went under her ride. Megan landed lightly, crouched beneath the window line and sprinted forward, slowing only when she came to the explorer. She bent swiftly and took stock. Six pairs of feet were visible. Yelling and shouting was audible. There was enough clearance between the explorer and concrete. One of those vehicles with oversized wheels. She zipped her jacket tight, her Glock sliding into her palm, and crawled beneath the vehicle. Two pairs of feet remained close to her. Four others went in pursuit of her sister and Burke. Two will search beneath and behind the vehicles. Two will go after Beth. Two will remain on the pavement. She rolled from beneath the explorer, left hand on concrete, right leg powering her body up, the Glock steady in her right arm. So far so good. One of the men moved suddenly, and all hell broke loose. He shoved his companion away, whirled to face her, his gun arm coming up. He triggered. Too early, as the shot went wide over Megan's head. She dropped to the pavement. His gun started to follow her. The second man was turning around. His gun was coming up. First one. Most immediate threat. She lined him up. Her sight moving on him, focusing on his face. She ignored the second man. Squeezed gently, and the first gunman fell back as if punched in the face. Her barrel turned an inch. The second man's face came into view. Sweat pouring down his face. Eyes narrow and intent. No time to aim. She squeezed again, and her shot missed the shooter's shoulder by a whisker. It was enough to deflect his aim as his shot thudded into concrete and threw fragments into her face. She didn't blink. Didn't flinch when a piece embedded into her left eyebrow. She squeezed again and found the hood's right shoulder. Another squeeze and his thigh burst into red. He fell, his gun clattering beside him. She rose cautiously. A glance back. No one behind her. She approached the shooter, angling away from him, made sure he was out of the fight, and kicked his gun away. She stretched to her full height, and her tunnel vision disappeared. The street was still empty of life but for the two hoods on the ground. There was no sign of Beth. Nor of Sarah Burke. Chapter 17 Beth rolled behind the direction of her leap, figuring the hoods would split up acting in a pincer move, one going to the front of her, one behind her. The hedge was thick and lush green, cutting off any visibility of the street. The lawn she had landed on had an inch and a half of soft grass, deadening her fall. The houses behind were still, no doors or windows slammed open. No heads popped out in alarm. Her Glock was in her holster, no it wasn't. She searched around frantically and spotted it several feet away where it had fallen when she had landed on the lawn. She scrambled around desperately for any other weapon, anything to create surprise, to increase the odds in her favor. Her eyes lighted on an object just beyond her outstretched arms even as a foot scraped on concrete. She looked up. No shadows on the lawn, either behind or ahead of her. They want us alive, otherwise they would have opened up by now. I hope Megan will respond when I call out, otherwise I'm a goner. 
the foot scraped again two maybe three feet ahead of her. The other hood wasn't making any noise. She crawled slowly and grasped the object. It was rubbery and bent in her hand. She extended a finger and placed it on a lever. She ran her eyes down its length and followed it to the walls of the house. It was ready to go. Her foot kicked out reflexively as she prepared to leap. Something rolled a couple of inches under the hedge and came to a stop. The footsteps came closer. She peered down under the hedge and spotted the baseball. Her left hand grasped it, her right hand rested on the lever. Her ears strained, her senses went into overdrive. The smell of grass assailed her nostrils, the excited chirp of a bird from some roof registered on her dimly. She thought she saw a shadow move beyond the gnarl of the hedge. A shot sounded. Megan. I can use that distraction. She lunged upright, towering over the hedge, screaming as loudly as she could, Meg, cover me. A fraction of a second to locate the first hood. He was three feet away, turning away from the shot, swinging in her direction, startled by her yell, a hand reaching under his jacket. She thumbed the lever on the rubbery tube in her hand, a hose, and a burst of high-pressure water shot out and struck him right in the face, blinding him, sending him stumbling backwards. Movement. To my left. The other hood. He was raising his gun. No time to think. No time to aim. She let fly with her left hand, instinct, muscle memory, and the years of playing with her dad and in her college team taking over. For a second she was back to being Beth Peterson, ace pitcher of the Wolverines, her university team, the right-handed player who pitched with her left. The ball flew straight and true and forced the gunman to duck quickly and sidestep. He lost a second. Another second to center himself again and raise his gun. In Beth and Megan's world, a second was a light year. His chest blossomed into red just as a shot sounded, Megan coming to her rescue. He fell. She raced down the hedge, peered over it, and located the hosed hood. He was struggling to his feet. She pivoted over the hedge and landed on his chest and stunned him with a wicked right. He lay still. I've got them, came Megan's voice from a distance. Beth let out a breath and let the world speed up and took stock of the scene. The hood her sister had shot lay groaning, his hands wide, covered by Megan. There were two gunmen behind Megan, both prone on the ground, their wrists cuffed. You okay? she asked through lips that had turned dry. Megan didn't answer immediately. She was bent over the last assailant, cuffing him, and when she straightened tossed spare ties to Beth in an arc along with a yeah. Where's Burke? Beth looked around after she had secured the hosed man and recovered her weapon. She looked at the line of vehicles ahead of and behind them. The street was subdued, the shots didn't seem to have registered any interest. She turned to the Minter's building. No sign of Percy, who normally would have come out to see them off. Perhaps her dad stopped her. I'm here. I called the cavalry. They should turn up soon. Burke called out from behind them and stepped out from her ride a few vehicles away. My shooters are down, she grinned. They wanted to argue a mite, but I convinced them that wasn't a good idea. They didn't offer much resistance. My badge and my gun calmed them. Her grin widened when she took in the disarmed and secured men, several of whom spat in her direction. Broker did say life was never dull when you two were around. You notice anything about them? Yeah, they're all Chinese, Megan bent over one of the hoods and searched his body for a wallet, phone, any form of identification. She grimaced when she came up empty and went to the next hood, who kicked out savagely. She slapped his legs away casually, rolled him to his belly, and patted him down and came up with his cell phone. That reminds me. She fished out her cell phone and turned the screen to show Beth and Burke, who had joined her, the message she had received just before the goons showed up. The Chinese gang are after you. Something about honor. Watch your backs. They're out in full strength. Got this from Chong just before the welcome party arrived. She stuffed the phone back in her jeans and looked at the men. Six men. Would that be full strength? Running steps from behind them answered her question. 
She whirled to face four more hoods twenty feet away, racing towards them spread out armed, angry. We're bunched too close. Half turned. Hands nowhere near our guns. Megan screamed, they've got guns. They're going to kill U.S. Help. The hoods were expecting violence, returning fire, they weren't expecting a helpless scream. The first two faltered. The other two slowed a step, taking their cue from the lead runners. The slowing was enough time for Zeb to emerge like a ghost from the shadow of a dark SUV. Zeb had been following the twins ever since they had left the office, staying behind them several car lengths, their GPS trackers glowing green on his screen. He had called Chong after their departure, who had given him the NYPD version of the investigation. That Chinese gang is vindictive. They believe in that face stuff. Women besting them will rile them. Chong had warned him. The warning hadn't been necessary, Zeb had already decided to shadow the twins. Nothing else on my plate, he thought as he gunned his SUV, turned on its GPS screen, and fell behind the sisters. He had waited in his vehicle, six car lengths away from the twins' ride, while they went inside the Minter's building. He had spotted the six hoods arrive at the same time as the women emerged. He slid out, ready to take a hand, and stopped when he saw he was superfluous. He hung back behind a pickup truck using its wheel well as cover, and felt a surge of pride as he watched the twins take down their attackers. The equation changed when the reinforcements four of them rushed past him, not spotting the crouching man behind the truck. Go. Zeb became motion. The beast came to life, flooded him, and turned him into a weapon. He was three steps behind the last two stragglers. He cut that down to one step and kicked out at the hood closest to him, his foot catching the running man's ankle, sending him off balance. The hood stumbled and went flying into the body mass of his three companions, helped by Zeb's shove. The four men staggered, one of them swore and turned to yell at his clumsy friend. His eye found Zeb. It widened. His mouth opened to shout a warning. It got drowned in Zeb's shot. One down. His glock came down viciously on the temple of another gunman and sent him crashing into the melee. A gunman at the edge of the mass of bodies found his feet finally. He brought his gun up, his face snarling as he turned on Zeb. Too close to shoot. Zeb rammed his barrel in the attacker's throat and choked his yell away. He followed up with a headbutt and broke the man's nose. A spray of blood flew and bathed Zeb's face. He ignored it, sensing danger to his right. A snapped glance. A third shooter leaning against a vehicle, Zeb in his sights, the gunman's finger tightening. Move. Thought became impulse, impulse became action. Zeb shoved the head-butted man in the shooter's direction, dropped and rolled away, his glock coming up to cover the shooter. The shooter's first shot went into his fellow gangbanger's body. His second shot chipped the pavement as he corrected swiftly, too swiftly. He didn't get a third shot. Zeb's one-two blew him back against the vehicle, his body rocking the vehicle, sliding off it and falling limply. Zeb's eyes turned, his gun followed. Three down. The fourth didn't offer any resistance. Don't shoot, he shouted, sweat and desperation dripping off him as four guns covered him. Zeb looked beyond the gunmen, at the women and behind them. No threat. He craned his head behind him. No more gunmen. He rose to his feet as the beast subsided and became blood pumping through his body, holstered his gun, and secured the fourth shooter. He straightened when he had finished and looked down the line of vehicles, feeling the tug of something, a pull. He waited for the feeling to strengthen. It didn't. You called him? Megan asked Burke, her gun still trained on the gangbanger, her eyes on Zeb. Nope. He's your cavalry. Joe's breath left him in a silent hiss as he watched the brown-haired man take down the four gangsters. Joe had followed the twins, knowing that the gang was planning a retaliatory attack. Joe knew the gang's move was a rash one, it was driven by emotion and not the cold logic he liked. Moreover it was bad for business, it would bring unnecessary focus on the gang. He could have stopped the gang with a single word, however, he was keen to see how the twins would respond. Maybe they would be deterred and give up the investigation, though he also knew that was wishful thinking. 
He had parked his vehicle, a gray and dusty Toyota far behind the twins' ride, had rolled down his window and had slid out a small telescope. It looked like a pipe and projected a magnified view of the street's activities on a screen. He had hardly settled back when he surged forward at the sight of the FBI woman. This was bad. He glanced at his phone once, tempted to call the gang boss and call it off. He shrugged and ignored the thought. The street gang had to make their own mistakes and learn from them. Joe watched the women return and split up to deal with their attackers. He pursed his lips and nodded his head in silent appreciation of their tactics. The gang had already started on a losing note. The fight was short, brutal, and at the end of it the women were unharmed, not even scratched. He was reaching out to turn on his engine and pull away when the four hoods rushed in. And then the brown-haired man showed up and Joe forgot about pulling away. His eyes were fixed on the man, observing his deceptively languid movements. Unhurried even when a gun was pointing his way. Flowing through air, rather than the cutting motions of most people. Joe rubbed a hand on his forearm silently and looked down in mild surprise. He had goosebumps on his arms. The brown-haired man dispatched his attackers with ease, his moves striking a chord in Joe's fighting mind. The brown-haired man looked behind him for a long moment when he had finished, a searching look down the line of vehicles as if sensing Joe's presence. Joe didn't move, didn't breathe. He knew he couldn't be spotted, but that didn't matter. He knew the brown-haired man was different from anyone else he had encountered. He could sense danger just as Joe could. He would follow the man and find out more about him. He had to, it was the first time that he had come across a worthy opponent. Chapter 18 Zeb drove the twins' SUV once the cleanup had finished. Burke's cavalry in the form of Chong and Pazaka and several NYPD cruisers had turned up once Zeb had subdued the hoods. Chong had rolled his eyes at the sight of the bodies and had looked heavenward. At this rate, the city'll run out of gangs. What are Zack and I to do then? Statements had been taken, the gangsters had been questioned. It looked straightforward. The hoods were from the same Chinese gang the twins had come across in Tiemann's apartment. They were out for revenge, not liking that they had lost enforcers and that they had been overpowered by women. That could not go unpunished. Face, Chong repeated once again. You just lost more of it, didn't you? The hoods glared at him as they were led away. Chong and Pazaka hung around longer, Pazaka's face darkening in anger at Burke's revelations. Just when were you planning to tell us? Burke stiffened. I just told you. Megan cut in before matters escalated. It's behind us. Nothing has changed materially. We still have to find a missing woman. Any progress on locating Kane's hideout? Pazaka shook his head reluctantly, his body still radiating heat. Nope. Megan brought Zeb up to speed as he drove, told him about Callie being a FBI agent and about the FBI's suspicions of Chinese spying. Burke's convinced there's no Chinese involvement in her disappearance? Yeah, Beth replied from behind. We believe her. Zeb fell silent, not disputing the assertion. Burke was good, the best FBI investigator he knew. He dialed a number on the dash, and a warm baritone filled the vehicle after a single ring. I was wondering when you'd call, Broker chuckled. I was following the news, then my honey gave me a download. Honey. Sarah lets you get away with that? Beth hooted in laughter. Nope, but she isn't here, is she? Looks like y'all are at a dead end now. Yeah. Got any bright ideas? Hey, you two are the investigators, Broker said defensively. I'm still in D.C. working on other stuff. You should be the ones. Broker? Zeb interrupted him. Yeah? Jack Minter was a UN war crimes investigator. He was all over Europe. Syria, Iraq, all the hotspots. You think? Broker spoke slowly over the sound of a bottle being opened and liquid splashing into a glass. Worth looking into. What the heck are you two talking about? Megan burst out impatiently. 
What the wise one next to you is getting at, broker drawled, is that you might want to look at the dad. Zeb dragged his attention away and focused on the traffic as broker spoke to the twins. That nagging feeling had returned, faint but unmistakable. He scanned the vehicles ahead of him. Office workers rushing to their workplace. Delivery trucks. Bicycle couriers. Nothing out of the ordinary. The pinging wasn't from any of them. He looked in the mirrors, knowing it was fruitless. If they were being followed, it was by someone so good that only Zeb could have sensed him. He can sense me too. He came to a sudden decision. The twins are very good, but this dude, whoever he is, is on a different scale. Take the wheel, he rapped out at Megan as he leaned forward and cut off Broker's call. She didn't argue, reading his tone and body language immediately. She leaned sideways and grabbed the steering with both hands while he unbuckled and slid back the sunroof. He rose in his seat, stepped over Megan to let her cross, and balanced himself on her seat. He waited for a moment to get a feel for the vehicle's motion, and then grasped the sides of the opening and swung himself up and to the top of the roof. He crouched, holding to the roof rails, feeling the wind buffet him, hearing but not listening to the horns blaring, someone whooping and whistling. He got to his feet and stretched to his full height, his knees bent slightly like an experienced sailor to absorb the SUV's rocking. The vehicle was moving slowly, the slow-moving lines of cars and trucks impeding its progress, and it had been the low speed that had encouraged him. He looked back at the snarly lines of vehicles following them, knowing he was visible to drivers far behind. Look at me. I'm the one to come after. Joe stared for minutes, not believing his eyes, his composure momentarily deserting him as he watched in disbelief at the man rise from the roof of the SUV. Rush hour brought out the worst in New Yorkers. Something about the sluggish flow of metal and plastic, ever-changing stoplights and swirls of gas in the air made them curse and swear and drive as if they were in a drag race. The brown-haired man seemed to pay no attention to all that. He stood calmly, poised on the roof of his SUV as if he was in his backyard. Joe was several car lengths behind him and knew that the man couldn't see him, yet he instinctively cowered in his seat. A grunt of annoyance escaped him as he pulled himself upright, his eyes still on the man who seemed to have his gaze locked on Joe. Joe looked back, recognizing what the man was trying to convey. It was a challenge, one that he gladly accepted as his blood raced and thrummed in his veins. Zeb climbed inside at a red light, to an icy silence that Beth finally broke. Anyone tell you Batman wears a cape? Megan snickered, not glancing in his direction. Someone would if he talked to them. Care to tell us what you were doing? There's an invention called mirrors. We've several of them in our SUV. They let us see who's behind us, Beth continued in her frigid voice when Zeb didn't rise to the bait. I wanted some air, Zeb replied. You could have rolled down the windows. Zeb looked out of the window, remembering the vehicles behind them. There had been three SUVs, two pickup trucks, several cabs, and then the vehicles had blurred and merged. Suited man in one, bearded guy in another, yet another dude, a woman on a phone, he shook his head unconsciously. Mystery man was far behind, close enough for his kai to alert Zeb, too far to be seen. What did broker say? He asked Megan and kept looking at her profile till she answered. That we should ask Jack Minter about his investigations. She maneuvered their ride past a slow-moving cab, cut to the left lane and wheeled into the basement parking at their office. We aren't at the Minter's place. Of course we aren't, Sherlock. Jack Minter is still fuming, still angry. Let him sleep on it, we'll visit him tomorrow. The sisters had thawed a little by dinner, enough to invite him out, to join them at a neighborhood restaurant. Mark would be joining them, Beth said, her eyes glowing her cheeks pink in excitement. Zeb declined, and when they departed he pulled up a chair and got working on Werner. The first command was to search all the Chinese gangs in the city. Werner printed the details on the screen before he'd finished typing. Zeb identified the gang that the twins had faced down at Tiemann's apartment. A low-level gang into peddling and extortion. Chong said there are no deeper connections there. Megan said the same. 
He wheeled his seat back and strode to the window and watched the city down below. The mad office to home rush had died. Now vehicles moved faster as folks went for dinner and drove to watch a show or to catch a movie. A low-level gang won't have that kind of gangster in it. That man's a ghost, maybe an enforcer. He went back to Werner and asked it to search gang affiliations on a probability basis. Werner came back quickly. Such searches didn't tax it at all. It could execute such commands in its sleep, though of course it never slept. Zeb ran down the list of affiliations, skimming past non-Chinese gangs and paused when he came to the last three names. 14K. Sun Yi O. 41S. The low-level gang had triad affiliations. Chapter 19. The twins' cheerful dispositions had returned the next day as Zeb drove them back to the Minter's apartment. He didn't mention the triad link to them, it was something that needed more investigation. Dad still fuming, Percy whispered as she showed them into the living room. Most of it is an act. It's the FBI he's angry with. Megan thanked her with a smile and seated herself on a couch next to Beth while Zeb leaned against a wall and became furniture. Jack Minter stomped into the living room, a scowl on his face, his arms crossed. What? he growled, no apology in his voice, his mouth still set in a tight line. Sir, you were a war crimes investigator, weren't you? Yeah, what of it? Your investigations put away several criminals, didn't they? That's what we do, impatience laced his words. Grace Minter entered the room and waved at the twins to remain seated when they rose. He's all bark, no bite, she smiled wanly, apologizing for her husband's attitude. Did any of those war criminals get back to you? Threaten you? Several of them. Not just me, most of us received death threats warnings. It was part of the job. Did any of them continue with the intimidation after you returned to the U.S.? Jack Minter uncrossed his arms, his face losing its hostile expression. What's that got to do with Callie? Oh my God, Grace whispered before Jack could answer, a hand going to her mouth, her face turning pale. She turned to her husband, it can't be him, can it? Tell them, Jack. Tell them everything. It's not relevant. Jack Minter looked shaken. The UN gave him a clean chit. Tell them or I will. Grace raised her voice in a quiet warning. We've lived a nightmare for long enough. Jack Minter ran a hand through his silvery hair with a sigh, sat heavily in a chair and removed his spectacles and polished them. His face reflected his age and weariness when he addressed the twins. For several years, when we were in Europe, and even when we returned to the U.S., we had a man dogging us. He was a devil. He was our nightmare. His name was Yusri Azzi. From the corner of her eye, Megan noticed Zeb's body tightening for a second. What was that? Jack Minter's eyes were on her and not wanting to interrupt him, she filed the reaction away. Who was he, sir? Is, Jack Minter corrected her. He's still alive. He was a warlord with the Free Syrian Army, one of the opposition groups to the Assad government. He was too radical for that organization, and they disowned him. That didn't deter him. He had a core group of supporters, and along with them, he carried on fighting the government. Minter took a breath, his eyes distant, remembering the heat and hardships of distant lands. As he wasn't fighting for freedom. He was a murderous, power-hungry warlord who was fighting a land-grab battle of his own, separate from all the rebel groups. He came to my attention when his men burnt Syrian policemen on a rooftop in Aleppo. They had captured the policemen and instead of following the Geneva Convention, they tortured them and burnt them. As if that wasn't enough, he and his men filmed the atrocity and put it on the internet. The rebel groups couldn't stomach this, they would lose international support and aid. They criticized Azzi, an unusual step for them. He claimed his actions were an inevitable outcome of war. I didn't buy that and started my investigations and uncovered horrors, rape, cold-blooded killings of people of different faiths, mass graves. No one spoke when he stopped to drink a glass of water. No one moved. 
he resumed, his low voice taking them back to Syria. I interviewed hundreds of people, witnesses, families of victims in Aleppo, and some in Baghdad, and compiled an extensive dossier. That dossier resulted in six of his closest men being arrested. Four of them were arrested by the Syrian police, two of them faced war crimes charges, and were convicted. As he was finished by the time the trials were completed, a lot of his men deserted and joined the FSA or other groups. A lot, not all. He still had a core group of thugs. Surprisingly, he had sympathizers in various parts of Europe, and even here in the US. The notion of a lone ranger is very romantic in some circles. I think these sympathizers funded him. It didn't matter, my dossier finished his group as an effective fighting force. My investigation had a cascading effect. More people came forward with charges against Aziz's men, and there were several who were still being tried when we returned to the U.S. Those convicted are still serving time. Unfortunately, I couldn't get any evidence against him. People were too scared of him to speak up. Jack destroyed him, Grace spoke up. As he never forgave him for that and hounded us. He sent threatening letters, called us in the middle of the night, he even kidnapped us one day. I didn't know that, exclaimed Percy who had joined them and was listening quietly. We kept it from you honey, both Callie and you. We didn't wish to alarm you, Jack Minter said uncomfortably, clearly wanting to move away from the subject. His daughter was having none of it. A mutinous look crossed her face and with her hands on her hips, she challenged him. You can tell me now. It happened just before Callie moved to the U.S., he began uncertainly. It wasn't as eventful as I made it out to be. You were at school, Callie was at her college, I was just leaving for the office when these two vans cornered me. This was in Austria? Yeah, in Vienna. He went on to explain how six bearded men had rushed out of two vans as he was entering his car to drive to his office. Four of them had surrounded him and had hustled him into one van, the two others had brought Grace kicking and struggling. It had happened so swiftly, so suddenly, that he hadn't been able to raise any alarm. Neither had Grace. The men had bound, gagged and blindfolded them. They had been driven to an empty farmhouse outside Vienna, where they had been kept the whole day. He had been made to call in sick while Grace had cancelled her engagements for the day. You did as they said? You didn't protest? Did they threaten you? Percy's face turned red, her voice rising shrilly. They didn't have to, Jack Minter replied quietly. They had two more men, one was outside your school, the other was outside Callie's college. Those two men relayed live video feeds to a laptop in the farmhouse. One feed showed you entering the school, the other one showed Callie with her friends. They said they were Aziz's men. They could reach us anywhere. They told your dad to back off, Grace added, and rose and hugged her daughter who had whitened and was trembling in reaction. Megan went to the kitchen in the silence that followed, and brought three glasses of water for the family. They were emptied rapidly, and when some semblance of normalcy had returned, she questioned the father. Sir, I take it you didn't back off? No, though there were times I wished I had, Jack Minter smiled briefly, ruefully. This happened before my final dossier was to be submitted as evidence. I reported the incident to my team leader, and they arranged protection for all of us. Discreetly, which is why our daughters never spotted them. We investigators have experienced this before. Grace returned to her seat, Percy following her, perching herself on the armrest. Those were tough days, that was an awful job. I was so glad when Jack got this posting. I baked him his favorite pecan pie the day he broke the news. Ma'am, earlier you seemed to refer to Azzy as if he were still a threat. Grace Minter rose without a word, left the room and returned with a plastic folder. She opened it, donned a pair of reading glasses and went through several papers before extracting an envelope. She handed it wordlessly to Megan and gestured at her to open it. Megan opened it and removed five slips of paper. She sucked in her breath sharply when she read the first one, and laid all the slips on a table for all to see. There was a single line on each of the slips, neatly typed. They read, You will suffer. 
Usri Azi. Chapter 20. Five slips, one cent each year for the past five years. We didn't receive anything this year. Grace's fingers trembled as they held up the scraps of paper one by one, maybe we'll still receive one. Megan took one of the scraps and examined it closely. The paper was of the kind that could be found in thousands of stationery or big box stores in the country. All of them were a quarter of a letter-sized sheet, the cut was clean. There wasn't anything special about the printing. There were no marks, nothing to indicate the slips had traveled thousands of miles. Beth fingered one and smelled it. No odor, she indicated to her sister. You reported this to the police? No, Jack Minter answered. We were used to these threats, we didn't see anything special. Azzy had demonstrated that he could reach out to us in any country, but other than that incident in Vienna, he trailed off. You are wrong, he told Grace softly and when she looked at him in confusion he explained. We got a letter this year, I hid it from you. He went to an inner room and returned with a similar scrap of paper. On it was a single line. Are you suffering? Usri Azzy. Grace's face collapsed when she read the line, her head rose and she looked at her husband accusingly. How could you hide this from me, she started softly and ended screaming. Why? He might have our daughter all along. She crossed over to him in a single stride and hammered his chest. You pound risk pound our pound daughter pound. He caught her flailing arms and held her close and buried her head in his shoulder when the fierce rage gave way to sobbing. He doesn't have Callie. I've checked with our investigators. They've made inquiries. I trust them. Our investigators are good. He spoke above the sound of her weeping, his face distraught. I hid this slip because I wanted to spare both of you. I know how his evil mind works. He probably heard of Callie's disappearance and wanted to rub it in. He turned to his daughter, a look of pleading in his eyes for forgiveness, for understanding. Percy's face was a storm of emotion, anger and shock warring with each other. She didn't meet his eyes. She scowled in the direction of her mom's tear-sodden face and challenged her dad. You could be wrong, dad. All these years she's missing, the clues could be right in our home. No. I trust my investigators better than the cops. Don't you think I care for Callie? Don't you think I would have moved heaven and earth to find her? Zeb, who had been silent all along, who hadn't been noticed by the minters, shifted his weight to another foot. We can ask him, he said, breaking the verbal impasse. All heads turned to him. I know Yusri Azzi. They were still at the Minters when Chong and Pazaka arrived along with their forensic team, all of who had been summoned by Beth. Sarah Burke arrived along with a fellow agent, Kowalski, one that the twins and Zeb knew. The living room became crowded but no one minded. Percy offered refreshments, no one took her up. The air in the room was charged, finally there was something to do, somewhere to go, some person to ask about Callie. The law enforcement agencies commenced their routine of taking fresh statements from the family, wisely refraining from making any accusations of hiding or tampering with evidence. The forensic team confirmed what Beth had suspected. Standard paper. Standard typing. Computer typing, not typewriter. More importantly, a white-coated technician confirmed that the slips didn't look like they had traveled across national borders. More tests were needed, he said, in a standard disclaimer. Grace Minter wrung her hands nervously at those statements. What does that mean? Ma'am, if Azzy's behind these, he's got a network in this country that's helping him. There could be prints, we have some clever people who look into paper and prints. There could be clues where these slips came from. You said something about knowing Azzy? Kowalski finished whispering instructions into his phone and aimed his words at Zeb. Yeah? We'll talk to him, Beth half rose and sat down again when Jack Minter took a step forward. You can set that up, he asked Zeb, hope lighting his face and sharpening his eyes. Yes, sir. The usual sidewalk conference followed their exit from the townhome, the twins in deep discussion with Burke and Kowalski, Chong and Pazaka, Percy Minter hanging on to their every word, Zeb impassive. 
His location in Baghdad is well known to our intelligence agencies, Kowalski was saying. We'll need clearances from State Department, from our own people. I'll organize those. It was a given that the two FBI agents would head out to Baghdad to interview Azzi. Kali had been their agent after all. Kowalski was Burke's trusted agent. He was smart, sharp, and crackled with energy. His black hair ruffled in the breeze, his coattails fluttered around him, and his tie went flying around his neck. He brushed back his unruly hair, it defied him. He gave up. It might take a few days, security has to be arranged, state will have to be looped in, a case has to be presented, but we'll get there. Traveling to Baghdad, a city besieged by terrorist violence wasn't easy to set up. The State Department had warned against all travel to the country however, Beth had put forward an idea for their travel, one that Burke had liked and had latched onto. Jack and Grace Minder had wanted to accompany the feds to Baghdad to question Azzi. Burke had shot that down immediately. Baghdad wasn't safe, the Minter's presence would pose a security risk. The NYPD cops had wanted to come along. Burke had turned them down too, they'd have to settle for the interview transcripts. A video interview had been discussed at length and had finally been rejected. Baghdad wasn't known for high-speed internet. Explosions had a habit of going off in many neighborhoods. The twins would accompany the two FBI agents. Burke had tried dissuading them and hadn't gotten far. It was Zeb's idea, and in any case you can't keep us away. We're the family's representatives, Megan had grinned wickedly. We can take care of our own security, and we won't cost you. Who's that man? Jack Minter had whispered loudly inadvertently at Percy, as everyone was filing out of their living room. He's their driver, Percy had replied. Pazaka didn't let up. Once they were outside the Minter's residence, he turned on Burke and demanded that Chong and he accompany them to Baghdad. Burke blew a hair out of her face impatiently, we've been through that, Pazaka. Let's not start a turf war. You might not have noticed it, but that's a country torn apart by war. She's right, Chong blinked his sleepy eyes, calming his partner, we've the Chinese gang angle to cover. Kane is dead but his kill room is still unknown. We can get some real work done while these folks are away. Burke's eyes flashed a smile of thanks at him and then turned and peered Seb. You're quiet. Too quiet. That makes me nervous. Anything to add? I can arrange your clearances. You can go tomorrow, came the laconic reply. Burke was aware her mouth was hanging open in amazement. She snapped it shut with an audible click of her teeth and erased the incredulous expression on her face. Just like that, she asked, hoping her voice was as bored as his. Just like that, ma'am. How do you know, Azzy? You never explained that. Zeb turned his back on her and held the door open for Beth to climb in their vehicle. No, I didn't, ma'am. Burke watched him drive away, a reluctant smile tugging at her lips. Ever since she and Broker had become a couple, she had come to know all the operatives better and to her surprise had found she liked them all. They had become friends. Family. Even Zeb, though he still hadn't lost his ability to infuriate her. Kowalski stood next to her and polished his sunglasses. You like him, don't you, boss? Get to work, Kowalski. Chase Carter for those clearances. Let's see if he can really deliver. Aye, aye, ma'am. Broker wandered around aimlessly in Burke's apartment in D.C., his phone jammed between his ear and his neck, flicking through channels on the muted TV. He grunted in acknowledgement occasionally as Burke outlined her day to him. It had become a habit very early on in their relationship, and while many of the FBI agents' days weren't as exciting as his, he never tired of hearing her voice. You're going tomorrow? Yeah. Zeb came through with the papers in just a few hours. Claire's doing. No one else has got that much juice. He said there would be security for us. We'd be as safe as we were in New York were his words, she laughed. They chatted for a few more minutes and when she'd hung up, he paced the room thinking. He was busy with the NSA, working on a few prototype counter-surveillance devices that the agency would use too. 
Otherwise, I'd be in New York with all of them. He peered out of a window into the dark night and saw nothing but a tame D.C. neighborhood. He breathed deeply and wondered fleetingly if even the night air smelled of politics. Zeb said they'd be as safe as if in New York. He got out his phone and sent a text to his friend. Do they know about Azzy's condition? Zeb's reply came instantly. No. They'll find out. It won't be a showstopper. He can still answer their questions. You think Azzy knows about Callie? I don't know. Will he speak the truth? Yeah. He knows about me. You're going? Yeah. Do they know? Nope. Chapter 21 Mark Kowalski whistled when he surveyed the Gulfstream's sumptuous interior. He walked down the central aisle feeling the rich leather seats and poked his head in the fully equipped bathroom in the rear. Beats traveling on taxpayers' money for sure, he announced and plunked himself in a seat. He kicked off his shoes and wriggled his toes, sheer bliss spreading across his face. Hey boss, he caught Burke's attention. I'm resigning. From now on I'll be chief bag carrier for the Petersons, if that means I can travel in such style. Our bag carriers have bag carriers, Beth snorted. They travel coach. The flight was uneventful, if tiring. Twelve hours non-stop over the North Atlantic, slicing over Portugal and Spain, and finally landing at Baghdad International Airport, on a sweltering hot afternoon. They were traveling as aid workers, Beth's idea, affiliated with an international organization that did a lot of work in the region. Zeb had arranged for fake papers for all of them, with Middle Eastern-sounding names. The twins and Burke had dyed their hair the previous night, and with their naturally dark skin tones, the four of them looked as if they belonged in the region. The Petersons and Burke took turns changing in the bathroom and emerged wearing abayas, black garments that covered them from shoulder to toe. They wore dark scarves over their heads, shades to cover their eyes, and would pass from Middle Eastern women to casual onlookers. Kowalski changed into a dishdasha in the bathroom, the white robe Arab men wore and wore a gutra, a white scarf on his head. Their aircraft rolled to a VIP reception area, where three SUVs were waiting for them. One vehicle was from the State Department. A casually dressed man approached Burke and shook hands with her. He introduced himself as Smith and didn't give a first name. There might be eyes and ears on us, he said cryptically, showing no surprise at their appearance. You are aid workers, these vehicles are registered to aid agencies. Burke scanned the VIP area quickly, professionally. It was empty but for them. Won't people know who you are? I'm an oil company worker, Smith's white teeth flashed. My company works with your organization. Anyone tell you this is a bad idea? He inquired quizzically. Several did, Burke replied dryly. Well, let me tell you this, in all my years at State, this has never happened. I got orders to verify you folks were who you were, and then stand down. Security would be arranged, I was to ask no questions. He jerked his head at the two SUVs hanging back. That's your security. I don't know them. All I know is someone well above my pay grade appointed them. Don't ask me. I'm as clueless as you are. Smith checked their papers and when he was sure they were in order, stepped back and motioned at the other vehicles. They rolled forward and from it emerged six men, heavily armed and Arabic-looking. Two men, the drivers, remained in the vehicles, their eyes watchful, moving ceaselessly. The men didn't speak as they hurried the new arrivals to the lead vehicle and arranged themselves in the two rides and within minutes of landing they were off. You guys have any names? Burke met the driver's eyes in the mirror. He didn't reply. Another man in the front spoke in heavily accented English without turning around, call Carter. Megan dialed Zeb, who picked up immediately and activated the camera on his phone. We're with your friend Zeb, at least I hope they're friendly. Pass the phone to each one of the men. Megan handed the phone to the men behind, one of whom cracked a joke in Arabic and got a laugh from Zeb. The phone went from the back to the front, and when Zeb was satisfied, it came back to Megan. Who are these men? 
You can trust them. They'll take you to Azzy and drop you back to the airport when you're done, and with that he disconnected. You knew about these arrangements? Burke fingered her Glock under her robe, its heavy weight reassuring her. Nope, Megan replied. We're as much in the dark as you are. He said he'd take care of everything. We traveled around the world just on his word, Kowalski whistled in bemusement. That's enough for us, Megan settled back comfortably and closed her eyes. R&R was to be grabbed whenever and wherever they could, when on a mission. The vehicles moved swiftly, forcing their way through dense traffic of all kinds. Trucks carrying goats, Toyotas that were well past their use before dates, military vehicles, buses, cabs and police cruisers. There was noise, a cacophony of horns and tires rumbling on concrete, shouts from the few pedestrians who braved the heat. Armed policemen stood guard at regular intervals, hands on their guns, their eyes watching the traffic. Megan woke at a nudge from Beth to see three more black SUVs had joined them, all identical-looking, all changing places randomly. Reinforcements, decoys, she whispered to her sister. Burke and Kowalski were glued to their windows, rapt fascination on their faces. First time in the Middle East, Sarah? Doesn't it show? For me too, Kowalski added. Join the FBI, travel the world, the recruiting poster said. He shook his head in mock sorrow. Somehow it didn't turn out that way. Stick with us, Mark, you'll see places you dreamed of. Some you wouldn't want to visit, even in your dreams. Remember, I'm your bag carrier. I'll be sticking closer to you than a saddle burr. Holy smokes, he exclaimed suddenly when they drove on the Al Jadraya Bridge, is that the Tigris below? One of the two major rivers here, one of the men from the front answered him. Lot of trade because of it. Not much now. The vehicles exited the bridge and proceeded for several more minutes, and then hung a sudden right and entered a narrow residential street. It had earth-colored houses lined up on both sides, many of them two stories high, gated and with visible security. Two SUVs roared past them and blocked the far end of the street, two hung back and blocked the entrance. Their vehicle rumbled along and came to a stop in front of a modest-looking house. The driver lifted a hand in a universal gesture, stop. They waited for five armed men from the other vehicles to join them, one of whom tapped once on their ride. Their protection detail alighted first, and eight men surrounded them when they exited. Their ring of men hustled them to the gate where a short conversation occurred. It swung open to reveal a concrete yard leading to the house. Five men watched them from inside the compound, all armed, all alert. They didn't come forward, neither did they stop the visitors. A man was waiting at the door, he swung it wide to allow them inside and shut it behind them. He patted them down, didn't twitch a muscle at their handguns, and merely lifted an eyebrow at the contents of the briefcase Kowalski was carrying. That way, he pointed to a corridor that branched out from the central hall they were in. Megan had an impression of white walls, bare of any decoration, no furniture. Basic accommodation. A familiar odor assailed her nostrils as they were herded to a room in front of which two men stood guard. Smells like a hospital. One of the guards pointed his gun at the room, they entered it and stopped suddenly. Megan took in the machines against one wall, tubes coming out of them and disappearing beneath the bedspread under which a man lay. Yusri Azzi. She recognized him immediately from the photographs Jack Minter had shared. Azzi was a pale shadow of himself, he looked frail, emaciated, though his eyes were bright. His beard was gray, untrimmed, and the hair on his head was thin. His face was covered with wrinkles and scars. One eye drooped lower than the other. He half rose at their presence, and his lips twisted to reveal bad teeth. His voice was rough and accented when he spoke. Carter didn't tell you I was dying? Chapter 22 No he didn't, Megan replied shocked but not letting it show. As he had two men in the room, one who seemed to be a nurse and the other a guard. The guard was in the corner of the room, his hands on his assault rifle. The nurse hovered close to the foot of the bed. Neither of the men seemed to find anything strange in visitors garbed in traditional clothing and speaking in American accents. Megan went closer to the bed, 
close enough to smell perspiration and body fluids, and stopped herself from wrinkling her nose with an effort. What are you dying of? Does it matter now? As he laughed hoarsely, which triggered a coughing fit. The nurse rushed over and held a glass of colorless fluid to his mouth. He swallowed noisily and waved the attendant away when he started patting Azzy's lips. Liver cancer, the warlord answered finally. I have no more than three or four months. You know why we're here? Burke joined Megan at the bedside and took over the questioning. Carter said you wanted to ask some questions. Which of you are the FBI agents? If I had known I would have female visitors, I would have cleaned up. The hoarse laugh was more of a whisper this time. We all are from the FBI, Burke replied brusquely. Zeb had made the ground rules clear, they were all to pose as FBI agents. They were not to mention their names, nor dawdle for any reason. Question him and then get out, he had repeated firmly. Do you have Calliope Minter? she asked him bluntly, not waiting for him to reply. Who? Calliope Minter, Jack Minter's daughter, the UN investigator who you hounded. Surely you haven't forgotten him. Ah, Jack. I haven't forgotten him. How could I? As his eyes turned baleful, I am here because of him. He caused your cancer? Beth couldn't contain herself. Not the cancer, as his bed protested, as he raised himself higher to look past Burke at the twins. Minter is why I lost everything. Do you have Calliope Minter? Burke stopped his diatribe mid-sentence. That's all we want to know. No. I don't have her. I know she's missing, but I didn't kidnap her. I had no hand in anything that happened to her. Azzy was a terrorist, a warlord, a murderous thug, yet Burke couldn't help believing the ring of truth in his voice. My believing isn't important. She gestured at Kowalski, who opened his briefcase and set up the polygraph it contained. You know what this is? Burke asked the warlord. I've seen it on TV. You came all this way to ask me this question? The bad teeth came on display again, this time accompanied with a burst of sour breath. Burke nearly flinched before her training and discipline took over. She couldn't, however, resist goading him. Carter said he would come and ask you. I put a stop to that. You might not have survived his questioning. Kowalski attached probes to Azzy's fingers and with the help of the nurse, strapped his chest and abdomen. More sensors were attached to the terrorist's feet, legs back and forehead. Very little of Azzy's body was uncovered by probes by the time Kowalski finished. He unfolded a metal stand on which he mounted several miniature cameras, all pointed at Azzy in different angles. He sat on a chair, turned the screen towards himself, nodded at Burke, and the questioning began. A polygraph recorded an interviewee's breathing rate, pulse, blood pressure, and perspiration. And from those indicators, an experienced interrogator could identify if the candidate was deceiving. Polygraphs weren't foolproof, but the machine Kowalski had set up came as close to being unbeatable. It didn't just record the standard indicators. It analyzed voice and detected imperceptible changes to tone, pitch, pauses, stress, among many other vocal parameters. The cameras monitored a subject's body language, a twitch of an eyelid, a muscle tick, a turn of the head, and separated involuntary motions from normal behavior. A powerful algorithm took all these feeds and told the operator if the subject was lying or deceiving. Burke was a practiced interviewer. She started off slowly with questions about Azzy, his background, his activities, answers to which were well known. She went into his harassment of the minters, introducing subtle variations to her questions, questions that would catch out deception. Two hours later, Azzy's strength and concentration was flagging. His nurse was looking increasingly concerned, even though he kept silent. From the corner of her eye, Burke saw Kowalski make a discreet sign. Kowalski was done. Azzy, probably for the first time in his life, was speaking the truth. He wasn't connected to Callie's disappearance. They packed up swiftly, Beth and Burke helping Kowalski put away his equipment. Megan pitched in to help and was shooed away by her sister. She drifted to Azzy's bed, 
and adjusted a drip that the nurse was trying to reach. Why did you harass Jack Minter? I would have kept after him even in hell, he whispered vindictively. Maybe I still will. It was because of him, I lost everything. He exposed me, got my men arrested. Some of them were killed by rivals because of his investigation. I was powerful once. Feared. Hated. His clenched fist loosened. Now what have I got? It's called retribution, Megan nearly spat out. She bit her tongue and asked another question. How did you reach out to him in the U.S.? As he turned sly, you would like to know, wouldn't you? His ego got the better of him when Megan didn't rise to the bait. I've supporters in your country. It wasn't difficult to find where Minter lived. Every year, one of my admirers there prints out a letter and sends it to Minter. It's my love letter to Jack, he cackled. Megan leaned over him and held his eyes till they dropped. It stops now. Tell your friends. How will you make me? I'll send Carter. It was Beth who asked the question that was on everyone's minds. Their gear was packed, their protection detail was hovering impatiently, when she turned to Azzy one last time. How do you know Carter? All of them waited for Azzy to reply, who lay with his eyes closed for a long while. They were dark and haunted when he opened them. He came to kill me. Oh, that's some curveball. Carter? Beth exclaimed, how come you're still alive then? He found out I was dying. I wasn't worth the bullet. He raised himself on an elbow and addressed the three of them. Did I pass? Burke didn't bother to hide the contempt in her voice. Yeah, you passed the interrogation. Given that you're dying, it looks like you didn't pass God's examination. The rest of the day was uneventful for Azzy, though the men around him couldn't stop talking about the visitors. Their arrival, the security detail around them, their vehicles, all smacked of audacity and immense confidence in their own capabilities. Azzy lay resting and heard his men chatter excitedly. He didn't add to their conversation. He alone knew of the man behind that kind of organization. He had stared into the brown-haired man's eyes and had gone cold. He, Azzy, murderer, had lain in fear when he had come across Carter that day in Aleppo, as he had come out of his doctor's clinic. Carter had grabbed him in an alleyway and had held a knife to his throat. He was preparing to sink it in Azzy's neck when the captive had found his voice. I'm dying, he had shouted, knowing none of his men could hear him. If Carter had grabbed him, they were dead. Then he didn't know the man's name. He had found his attacker's identity only several years later. His attacker had paused, had dragged him back to the doctor, and only when he was satisfied had he released Azzy. He had then disappeared, but not before planting two bullets in each of Azzy's thighs. He had removed his magazine and had drawn out a third bullet and had given it to Azzy. I can return any time, wherever you are. That bullet will be for you, the brown-haired man had said in fluent Arabic with a Syrian accent. Years later, Carter's call had come, with a request to entertain visitors. As he knew it wasn't a request. It was a command. He had agreed, knowing he had no choice. As he didn't know what woke him in the night. His men were snoring. The nurse, that dog of a man who was supposed to be awake all the time, was dozing in his chair. No, not dozing, he was slumped in his chair. As he raised himself and peered through the gloom. Yes, the man was out cold. With a sudden certainty, he turned his head and felt cold shock race through his body. Carter. He was right there, standing motionless inside the room. Were you telling the truth? The man asked him in Arabic, conversationally, as if he had nothing to fear. He had nothing to fear, as he realized, when the man held something up in his hand from which the sound of snoring came. As he licked his lips but no words came from his mouth. He tried again. Yes. I swear. You still have the bullet? As he nodded vigorously. Yes. Remember my promise. Shadows moved in the darkness and swallowed the brown-haired man. 
One more thing to do, Zeb thought, on exiting the warlord's house. He ran down the street three houses down and tossed an earth-colored GPS transponder in the yard of the fourth house. It didn't matter if it was discovered. What mattered was that the location of the house would go into an encrypted database. He had arrived before the Gulfstream had and kept watch on Azzy's house and the street. None of the houses in the street were damaged, none bore marks of bombings. Curious, he had started observing all the houses when his patients had been rewarded. A bearded man, surrounded by bodyguards, had emerged from the fourth house. Zeb knew the bearded man. Intelligence agencies in the West knew that man. He was a senior lieutenant in ISIS. Zeb had taken photographs and had sent them to Broker. Someone, somewhere in one of the Western intelligence agencies would spot the photograph and the GPS signature. A meeting, a very brief one, would take place, and a satellite high up above would change its orbit and start surveillance. All done, Zeb texted Broker when he boarded the Air Jordan flight in Baghdad. Wasn't expecting anything different. Sarah and the twins think you're with me, came the reply. Zeb closed his eyes to catch up on his sleep. That's what they should think. I'll always have their backs. Chapter 23 Megan walked into their office 36 hours later from their Baghdad trip and poked the sleeping man on the couch. Where were you all the time, she asked suspiciously when Zeb opened his eyes. With Broker, he stifled a yawn and headed to the bathroom. You got what you wanted? Not quite, she replied in disgust, we're back to square one. He hasn't kidnapped Callie. Later in the day, Beth and she called Jack Minter and relayed the interview to him. They offered to share the polygraph results and said they could recommend experts who could analyze them. Jack Minter turned down the offer politely. I knew he hadn't kidnapped my daughter. I also know why you had to go and question him. He swallowed, I apologize for my behavior. I'll apologize to Burke too. That's not required, sir. We understand and I'm sure she does too. You really think he'll stop? Beth frowned in confusion for a moment till Megan mouthed, stop the harassment. Yes, sir. We're very sure of that, she reassured the father. The line went silent, and then Jack Minter spoke hesitantly. That man with you, he's not really your driver, is he? Megan couldn't help the deep-throated laugh that bubbled out of her. He is, sir. Among many other things. He's the most lethal man you'll ever meet. The man in Beijing was impatient and touchy. He was sitting in his study at home going through reports, checking to see everything was still according to plan. Everything depended on him, the idea was his, its success or failure was his. He puffed with pride for a moment, which deflated quickly when his wife called him for dinner. For the third time. He sighed in irritation and glanced at the door when a timid knock sounded on it. His six-year-old son poked his head inside and gestured at him. Coming, he waved and turned back to his desk morosely. He hadn't bedded his wife in several weeks because of the pressure. He hadn't been to his mistress for days. All because of the plan. However, now all seemed to be falling in place. There were three candidates left in the fray, including the Beijing man's. All three had requisite muscle and capabilities. The two competitors were tough, they would be hard to beat. He had planned for their emergence. He polished his glasses and smirked. He, the man from Beijing, had anticipated all eventualities, which is why he had been trusted to execute his own plan. He rose and shut the door to his study and called the man in Hong Kong. The man's nasal tone came on and started greeting him. How are things in the three cities? Beijing man was curt. He had to be. He was authority, power. Hong Kong man understood that. On schedule. First shipments on the way. Beijing man put the phone down and stretched and joined his family for dinner. Joe knew when the twins and the man flew abroad and when they returned. He had eyes on them continually, either his own or those of highly trusted men. The brown-haired man had a name. Zeb Carter. 
It hadn't been difficult to find out, after all, it was on the consulting firm's website. Carter had been in the Army, in the Special Forces, and had been on various tours to different countries, explained the website helpfully. His co-workers were also Special Forces or from elite outfits in the Armed Forces. The twins came from a cop family. Joe considered all these as he drank from a bowl of green tea and settled in his battered Ford which was parked within eyesight view of the Columbus Avenue building. He wasn't concerned that his vehicle would be spotted. It was registered to a worker in the city's Department of Sanitation, a man who looked very similar to Joe. The man existed and was blissfully unaware that he owned the Ford. Joe had several such identities, he could become a sanitation worker, a doctor, a cab driver, anyone. It depended on who he was shadowing and why. Joe hadn't been able to find where the sisters and FBI woman had disappeared to. He knew Carter had flown separately and before them, while the women had taken the Gulf Stream. He had tried to find its flight plan, but it had not been readily available from his usual sources. Joe swallowed and felt the warm liquid go down him. Green tea made everything right. Where they had been to wasn't important. He knew there was nothing in any other country that could impede their plan. Zeb was watching the street from his office, knowing the mirrored glass offered no visibility from the outside. He had gotten Werner to run through camera images of the front of their building for the last 10 days. He had gotten it to run through the plates of all vehicles in the front for the same period. He had a feeling his shadow was close. Werner checked out a Chevy Cruze, a five-year-old model, black in color. It had been seen thrice in the 10 days and was owned by a retail saleswoman in a downtown department store. Werner checked out the woman and did the electronic equivalent of tapping fingers on a desk. She earned an average wage for her profession and owned another car. Divorced one kid. No way could she afford a second car. Werner checked for camera images of the car and whistled when it found a blurred image of a face. Blurring wasn't a problem. Werner applied complex algorithms to the image and sharpened it. It was a Chinese face. Male. It ran a facial recognition program that would compare the face to millions in the databases it could access. If the man was in the database, Werner would identify him. European starlings were the most common birds in the city. They were introduced to the country by Eugene Schieffelin in 1890. Schieffelin was a member of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society and also of the New York Zoological Society. He wanted to bring all the British birds in Shakespeare's plays to the city. He released bullfinches, chaffinches, nightingales, skylarks, and starlings in Central Park. The European starlings didn't just survive, they thrived. There were about 200 million in North America and were so numerous in New York City that the MTA had resorted to drastic measures to control them. This particular starling was curious, and its inquisitiveness had taken it far from its usual feeding ground in Queens Village. It had its nest in an old church in the village, but the desire to taste juicy worms had made it fly several blocks away. Another starling had gossiped, whoever said humans alone gossiped was wrong, very wrong, about this particular site that had not just worms but also meat. Best of all, the other bird chirped, it had no humans. Well, there was one, but he hadn't been seen in a while. The curious starling decided to venture into the skies and explore. It took several darts and hops and short-haul flights before it came to something that resembled the other bird's description. It saw several buildings, abandoned, just as the gossipy one had described. No people about. At least not any it could see from its perch on a lamp pole. The starling cocked its head this way and that way, and when it was sure there didn't seem to be any danger, it flew down to the concrete surface. Concrete wasn't good. No place for digging and uncovering worms. Maybe the other bird had been wrong. Or lying. The other bird had a reputation in the flock for being a great teller of tales, few of which were true. The starling decided not to give up yet. The site was vast, and there were several buildings to explore. It hopped towards the furthest one. 
Columbus hadn't discovered the new world by playing safe. It flew a level up and found furniture, cobwebs, and other birds who looked challengingly at it. The starling abandoned that floor and flew down. Steps from the ground floor went down and disappeared into darkness. Dark. The starling didn't like dark. But nothing ventured, nothing gained. It hopped down and flew through a crack at the top of a door and struck gold. The piece of flesh it was carrying was too heavy, and a chunk of it fell as it flew back to its nest. That chunk was discovered by a drunk, who was lying in a doorway, and figured someone had dropped a bite of burger. He shuffled toward it, not hearing the cursing of passers-by as they detoured around him. He picked it up and squinted. That didn't look like any burger. That pink bit looked like nail polish. Nail polish. He gave a hoarse yell and dropped the finger and stumbled back. Megan and Beth were practicing throws with the basketball, so far Beth was winning. Azzy was a case closed. The Chinese connection was a red herring, according to Burke. They were scraping the bottom of the barrel for leads on the missing Calliope Minter. You want to join? Megan tossed the ball in Zeb's direction, who was studying a printout near Werner. He blocked it with one hand, bounced it once and threw it back at her. What's that with you? Nothing. He stuffed the sheet in his pocket and left the office. Mysterious. Beth stared after him. Megan shrugged. When isn't he? She dribbled to the hoop and was preparing to leap when her cell rang. She let the ball roll away and looked at the caller. Chong. Detective Chong, how can I serve you? All levity fled her face when she heard his reply. We found Kane's hideout. Chapter 24 a grim-faced Chong and Pazaka picked up the twins an hour later from their office. Chong called Megan when they drove up to the front of their building, and didn't answer their expectant looks when they seated themselves in the large vehicle. Where is it? Beth asked Pazaka and got only her reflection on his polished shades, in response. Chong turned on the lights and siren, and traffic melted away as he raced through gridlock and an ocean of honking. He was tight-lipped as he sped up Henry Hudson Parkway, and just as Megan thought he'd take the George Washington Bridge, he turned right. Onto the Cross Bronx Expressway, their radio whispering softly on the dash, riding the concrete and steel structure of Throg's Neck Bridge, and forty minutes later he pulled up beside other cruisers in Queen's Village. Chong and Pazaka spoke to other cops, who looked in the direction of the twins and made way for them. Megan ducked under yellow tape and followed her sister and the two cops as they went through a large gate and stopped at the sight of buildings, several of them arranged around a large yard. It was an asylum at one time, Chong waited for her to catch up. For those declared to be insane. It's now owned by the city, maybe not for long. The heir of the original owners is claiming it back. Legal battle, he explained. They hurried to join Pazaka and Beth who were making haste across the vast yard, toward a building in a corner. Building 26 declared a stark sign. Megan suppressed a shiver as they navigated crumbling pieces of concrete and stepped inside the building. It was dark damp and once lay silent. Now it was flooded with cops, floodlights and forensic technicians. Beside what might once have been a reception desk was a flight of stairs. Pazaka took them down to a basement along a hallway and through several doors and when he opened the last one, stepped aside for them to have their first view. The room was large and had a high ceiling for a basement. It looked like it had been a store with pieces of furniture and medical equipment scattered in it. There was a central table of stainless steel, above which was a naked light bulb. The stench of rat feces filled the room, but even through that Megan could detect the odor of human flesh and death. A white-coated technician opened a large closet and pointed to the dark stains on its walls. We found a body here, Chan came up behind Megan and showed how the body lay in the closet. We're still trying to identify it. Megan's breath stuttered as if she had been punched. She spun on her heels, her eyes widening, seeing the answer in his eyes even before she asked, Is it her? It's female, that's all we know for now, he answered heavily. A bird dropped a finger not far from here. Chong showed them around the room, 
while Pazaka stood at the entrance talking to other police officers. It took a while for that digit to get to us, but when we did, we searched every alley, every nook. We knew about the asylum, but it had escaped our previous searches for some reason. This was the killing table, he drew them back to the center of the room, to the steel table which gleamed dully under the lights. It was scratched and scarred, and on closer inspection Megan found it had restraining belts at its bottom. She fingered one belt, realized suddenly what it had been used for, and dropped it as if it had burned her. Restraints, Chong said unnecessarily. Lots of DNA on it, in fact all over the room. He stopped avoiding Megan and Beth's eyes finally. Lab still working. We got here at 4M, give them time. Maybe there'll be traces of Cali. Soft murmuring, Pazaka and the cops, was the only sound in the basement for long minutes, before Beth pushed her brown hair back inside. How do you know it's Kane? Pazaka came up to them, removing his shades and pocketing them. The grimness left his face, replaced by a lighter expression. Not a smile, but close enough. We found a journal. The journal, a notebook whose brown cover was faded, some of its pages falling out, had been found inside a sleeping bag. The sleeping bag had been found stuffed in a cardboard box, which also had a change of clothes, all black. Another cardboard box held a velvet case. A white-coated technician opened it and revealed knives, scalpels, a small hammer, a saw. Beth closed her eyes, trying to wash away the images the sight of the instruments brought. Are those what I think they are? Yeah, Chong replied. He didn't look sleepy anymore. The early morning rise, the long hours, didn't show. He was alert, his suit was crisply ironed for a change. Maybe he ironed it at forum knowing this discovery would close a big case, Beth thought inadvertently. A knife caught the light and winked evilly at her. The room is shabby, run down. Not the instruments. He took good care of them. What's in the journal? Megan asked when the technician had put away the killing tools. She breathed deeply as they left the grisly basement behind and entered the yard. Flashes caught her eye, and she turned to see a phalanx of photographers and reporters at the gate. The media had turned up and in force. She turned her back on them, and despite the surroundings and the discovery, couldn't suppress a smile at Pazaka's actions. His shades had gone back on his face, his hands were instinctively smoothing his jacket. He can smell interviews in the air. Not much. It's disappointing. No names. No records of victims. A lot of doodling and drawing that's meaningless. Just a few lines on a page. Here you can see for yourself. Chong opened the photo gallery app on his phone and selected several images and handed his phone over to the twins. The first page had a name scrawled on it, confirming the identity of the killer. Kane. The scrawl was strong and slanted upwards. Thick lines, neat spaces between the letters. Blue ink, probably a ballpoint pen. Yeah, we've got ink and handwriting experts on it too, Chong sensed Megan's question and answered it. Several pages of aimless lines and random circles followed. Today's was good. She resisted a long time. There was no date to the entry. No reference to the victim. Who they were probably didn't matter to him. How long they lasted under his knives, a sudden rage swept through her blinding her making her hands shake. It disappeared as quickly as it had come, and left her cold and empty. Beth took the phone from her trembling fingers and swiped through more images till she came to the last sentence. They feed me women. Chong raised his hand in surrender before either of them could utter a word. Don't ask me. I've no idea what that means. Beth handed the phone back to Chong and looked around when a thought struck her. I thought Kane was Bennett and Johnson's case. Where are they? Chong jerked a thumb at the crowd at the gate. Giving interviews. Zach's not liking that, he smirked. It was late evening when Megan got the call from Chong. They had left the two cops at the asylum after viewing all there was to see. The action had moved to the forensic labs, they would put names to the DNA wherever they could and would seek to identify the killer known only as Kane. No match, Chong sounded tired, 
and Megan could picture him pinching the bridge of his nose, his feet on his desk. That body we found is Jane Doe. Her DNA doesn't exist in the system. Other DNA findings, her voice was taut, fearful of the answer. Beth gripped her shoulder reassuringly, as they bent over the phone, waiting for Chong. Not Callie's. A deep sigh left Megan as she sagged back, the coiled tension in her unwinding slowly. She was aware of Beth asking more questions, Chong responding but she wasn't paying attention anymore. Not Callie's. Those were the only words ringing in her mind. Maybe you were right all along, Beth acknowledged as she heated bowls of soup for the two of them. Dinner in the office. Just them and Werner who eschewed human food. Zeb had disappeared somewhere on one of his errands. Doesn't mean much. Our investigation just got more complicated. Megan closed her eyes as the warm liquid filled her mouth and teased her taste buds. No idea where to, she froze as a synapse fired in her mind. A connection was made, and something at the edge of her memory became clearer. She slammed the spoon down with a clatter, grabbed her jacket, pocketed the SUV's keys and shouted over her shoulder, Come on! The drive didn't take long, but connecting to Chong on the way took more time. He sounded as if he'd woken from sleep when Megan posed her question. No. Just that one word from him before he crashed his phone shut. That one word was enough for Megan to floor it, and minutes later she came to a skidding stop in front of her destination. Why are we here again? Beth gasped as she recognized the building and hurried after her sister. Megan didn't reply. She jabbed a finger in the elevator button and crossed her arms and looked at the numbers as they sped up, as it carried them. Surely we should ask permission, Beth protested when Megan bent to pick the lock expertly. Megan swung open the door in reply and entered the apartment. She went immediately to the bedroom and rummaged through stacks of clothes, notebooks and binders. She dragged out the notebooks and riffled through them one by one, after seating herself on the bed. Can I help, or is this a one-woman show? Beth mocked her as she watched her sister discard one book and pick up another. Megan tossed her a handful of books and ordered, search for any reference to Callie and her group of researchers. Your wish is my command, Beth saluted her and started flicking through the first book. Can this humble servant ask why? She sighed and got to reading when no reply came. An hour went past. From the hallway outside the apartment they heard noises of people coming, a few raucous folks shouting. No one came to their apartment. The pile of notebooks grew, and when it had finished, Megan started on the folders. She controlled the sinking feeling growing in her and flipped through the first one, the pages moving in a blur. The folders didn't have any answer. She rose disheveled and surveyed the mess in the room. There was a desk in one corner which once had housed a computer. In its place was clean white space that dust hadn't covered yet. Next to it were more papers and a thick binder. There were work-related notes in it, and just as she was tossing it away, several entries caught her eye. She ran her finger down them and stopped at the third from the last. Beth started when Megan whooped loudly and fist-pumped. What? What is it? Her mouth turned into an O when she read the entry. You think? It's worth a try. Let me call Chong. Chong wasn't a happy cop when he picked up after the third ring. New York's finest aren't at their best at 1 am, he snapped. Take this down, Megan ordered peremptorily. Chong swore softly and called out to a female voice, It's all right, honey, just some pesky do gooders. This had better be worth it, he warned when he found a notepad. It was. The next morning, he confirmed the body they'd found was Lian Cheng Bonds. Chapter 25 How Did You Know? Megan took her time in getting back to her sister, as she threaded their SUV through the city, the next day. It was something Tiemann said to the cops. About keeping records, knowing everything about his clients. I thought there was an off chance that he might have DNA records for those he was closest to. Like Callie or Lien. In the notes Megan had found in Tiemann's apartment, was the address to a downtown locker. In that locker were cheek swabs for the researchers he worked with. 
The DNA from those swabs had led to the identification of Leon's body. Beth frowned at Megan's profile, knowing there was more to her twin's deduction. Why did you even think of him? What made you think of Lien? I didn't. Megan honked angrily at a cab which cut too close in overtaking her, and returned the driver's uplifted finger salute. It was just a random guess. You know how I have those light bulb moments. Megan sensed Beth wasn't convinced, but her sister didn't push it. Megan did have flashes of inspiration, as did Beth. They were like curveballs, unexpected, coming from nowhere, bearing no link to their suppositions. They had helped crack many a case. I'd been wondering about Lien for a while. Her going to Hong Kong didn't sound right to me. However, with her now turning up dead, all my assumptions have been hit out of the park. I'd better not lead us down any more rabbit holes. Chong was beaming when he met them, and even Pazaka was sporting a small smile. Got any more hunches for us? The taller cop asked them. Maybe you've an inkling where Callie is? I'm done with hunches, Megan declared. It's time you both did some real cop work. She described her hunch again to a larger group of cops, a couple of whom drifted off afterwards to question Tiemann again. Maybe he knew more than he let on about Lien and Kane. Megan knew the part-time drug peddler didn't, but she didn't dissuade the cops. You might want to ask him why he took the swabs in the first place, she told them. We did. He said he's an OCD type. He's got their blood groups as well. He said one never knew when they would become useful. How did he persuade them? It's not something that comes up in most conversation. Beth asked curiously. It was a question Megan and she had debated at length on the drive. Neither of them had come up with any convincing answers. The three of them were smoking weed one time in Tiemann's apartment. That was when. He joked about keeping their DNA samples, just in case. They obliged. Beth slid down from the sill when it became uncomfortable, and sat in a chair and wheeled it closer to the table. I thought he said Lien wasn't a user. The two cops didn't know all that. They were relaying what Tiemann had told them. They answered a few more questions and left the room along with the other cops. Chong thanked them, shut the door behind them, and was almost bouncing with energy as he walked back to the table. Hadigzan research. They lied to us all along. We have a conference call with them later today. Burke is flying out in the evening to interview them. You ladies want to sit in on the call? The ladies did. Jason Call Me Jace Ipanema had founded his first business, Computer Repair, in the bedroom of his parents' home when he was 16 years old. He made as good as new his dad's machine, an eight-year-old box that his father stubbornly refused to replace. Jason offered to help his neighbors, and when word spread of the kid who seemed to know what he was doing and was cheap, a neighborhood beat a path to the Ipanema home. While in Stanford, Jason got the idea of starting a semiconductor research company, one that wouldn't manufacture much but would design and would license its design to manufacturers. He and a few friends got together one evening, and over dinner, with the accompaniment of a steady flow of alcohol, named their fledgling company Hadexon. They woke the next day with massive hangovers, but decided they liked the name. Hadigzan landed its first customer six months after formally going into business in Palo Alto. The customer, a small defense manufacturer of missile guidance systems, liked the way the startup worked. It especially liked their price point, and recommended the startup at an industry conference which 800-pound gorillas attended. Hadigzan grew rapidly and established research facilities in Malaysia and Hong Kong. Their global workforce numbered well over a thousand spread across the three facilities. They recruited only PhDs, and when Lian Cheng Vaughn appeared for an interview, they snapped her up. Ipanema wore a light blue shirt over cream-colored trousers, an expensive brown leather belt snugly cinched around his narrow waist. He had a formally dressed, white-haired man to his left for the video conference that Chong had set up. To his right was a blonde woman in a bright red suit. A third woman in a white shirt and dark trousers sat further apart. The suited man was Hadigzan's lawyer, 
the blonde was his head of people, and the third woman was his personal counsel. How can I help you folks? Ipanema waved at the camera, smiling widely displaying strong white teeth, his voice warm and reassuring. Chong hadn't given the company a reason for the call. The NYPD wanted to talk to Ipanema, that was reason enough. Hadixon had protested, their CEO was a busy man. He didn't attend meetings, without a reason. Tough, Chong had responded. Maybe the meeting with Sarah Burke of the FBI would go easier if he first spoke to the NYPD. This is most unusual, protested Ipanema's EA. The NYPD don't do usual, Chong responded smugly. He held up a palm to high-five his partner. He had stored that line for months for just such a moment. Pazaka looked at his palm, sighed, and pulled out his shades and polished them. The EA finally relented and warned her CEO wouldn't be alone. He could bring the entire workforce along, Chong told her. You can start by telling us why your company lied to us, Pazaka leaned forward and pierced the CEO with his shades. Pazaka was dressed for the occasion, a finely tailored black suit, pinstriped mirror-polished black shoes, hair styled and in place, and the ubiquitous sunglasses. Oh Haas, hold up, Ipanema exclaimed. How did Hadixon lie to you? Lian Chengban. You said she was in your employ. In Palo Alto and then in Hong Kong. She wasn't. She was in New York all along. She was killed by Kane. Her body turned up just yesterday. Pazaka and Chong had decided to go hard at Hadixon. They knew Lian Chengban was Hadixon's employee. There was sufficient evidence to back that up. What they didn't know was whether she had still been an employee when she died, and how she'd come to be in New York. However, they didn't want to cut any slack for Hadixon. Ipanema flinched, the blonde reared back, and the white-shirted woman fidgeted. The lawyer didn't react. He was a bruiser and was used to aggressive tactics. Who's she? Ipanema struggled to contain himself. He turned to the blonde, who recovered, and tapped into a tablet. An inaudible murmur passed between the two as the blonde passed him the device. Ipanema scanned the screen swiftly and handed it back with a, I remember seeing her. Poor woman, Ipanema looked genuinely shaken, bewildered. Why do you say Hadixon lied to you? She was an employee. The blonde tapped more keys on her screen and leaned forward without waiting for Pazaka's answer. When was she killed? A month ago, going by the state of the body. She took a break, a couple of months back. Said she wanted to de-stress. We don't track our staff's whereabouts when they're on vacation. The blonde turned her screen triumphantly to the camera on which was an email from Lien Cheng Bon. It was her request for downtime to her manager, who had approved it. The video link continued for another hour, during which the company forwarded transcripts of the dead woman's emails and CCTV images of her regularly entering and leaving their premises in Palo Alto and Hong Kong. They provided an employee contract, shared a video Lien Cheng Bon had made on joining, and provided flight ticket receipts for her departure to Hong Kong. You know her family has links to the triads in Hong Kong? The lawyer blinked and stepped in. His client didn't know that. They had nothing to do with criminal organizations. The blonde woman had proved that the company hadn't lied. The firm didn't know about the dead woman's New York travel. Where she went when on vacation wasn't their business. Hadixon protested strongly at the NYPD's insinuations and would take legal action if baseless accusations were made. The call ended with threats and counter-threats from both parties. Chong had the last laugh. Enjoy your meeting with the FBI, he chortled. That wasn't very grown up, was it? Megan rolled her eyes at Chong, who hadn't stopped chuckling long after the call ended. It got the job done. We got the details we wanted in quick time. Except that we didn't. We still don't know why she came to New York and how Kane got her. And we still don't know where Callie is, Beth added. Chapter 26 the semi was in no doubt about the whys and wares of its schedule. It had picked up its load from a manufacturing firm in Northland Shalon County, Washington, 
and was on its way to deliver it to a warehouse in New York City. Quincy Steinke, owner-operator of Quincy Steinke Trucking, an original name he had coined all by himself, had pushed back his Wenatchee chief's hat and had scratched his balding head when he had received the call from Northland. Quincy had been driving a semi for well over three decades and had been an owner-operator for the last 18 years. Quincy stood 5'8 in his socks and his bald head, thick mustache and toothy grin were familiar sights in Chelan County. Well, he thought he was familiar, and was always puzzled when people failed to recognize him. He didn't believe Debbie, his wife of 30 years, who constantly chided him and said he wasn't as well-known as he thought he was. Quincy's home was just outside Wenatchee, the largest city in the county, but heck, he hardly spent any time home. An average trucker spent something like 100 days away from home. Quincy was on the highways for twice as much. Debbie often complained that he was practically a stranger. That's what kept the marriage going, Quincy used to quip. Quincy knew he was lucky, privileged. He had come out of the army after serving his minimum eight with the Transportation Corps and had come out with qualifications well suited to being a trucker. As a motor transport operator, he had moved personnel and heavy duty equipment in the deserts of the Middle East. He had then driven military trucks through the high altitudes of Afghanistan. On returning to the States, a then young Quincy married his sweetheart Debbie and signed up as a trucker with a carrier in the state. Working for someone else hadn't suited the entrepreneurial Quincy, and after years of careful living, Debbie and he had taken the plunge and bought his fire engine Red Peterbilt. Life was good for Quincy, especially in the last decade. He had gone to load boards when starting his business and had quickly realized that was a race to the bottom, a price war. Quincy had spent several years cultivating shippers, local supermarkets, meatpackers, manufacturers, and that effort paid off. Quincy now had a select clientele who paid well, who did quick pays, who shipped to convenient locations, and who valued service. Quincy had paid off his truck four years back and Debbie and he had a neat little nest egg tucked away. He was now approaching his 60th birthday, and Debbie had started making noises about his retiring. Thing was, Quincy still liked driving. Loved it. He loved the feel of the wheel in his hands, the growl of his Peterbilt, the sound of concrete slipping under his tires. He felt free when he looked out of the window of his truck and saw blue mountains in the far distance. In his 30 years of driving, he had crisscrossed the country several times and yet each time, he discovered something new on a route. A stream that bubbled just off the highway, a service stop that had the cleanest bathrooms. No sir, Quincy Steinke wasn't ready to hang up his hat yet. He had stomped off to his office after a minor argument on that topic with Debbie, when he had received the call from the shipper in Northland. Quincy wasn't surprised that he got a call from a shipper who wasn't a client. His clients referred him sometimes, and he did get calls from other shippers. He usually turned them down, since he had his hands full with his current clients. The Northland call was different, however. One of his shippers had just cancelled a regular load, something to do with poor quality product that couldn't go out. He had a hole in his schedule as a result, a gap that the Northland load would easily cover. The new shipper's requirement was different in another couple of respects. Northland to New York City was a long route, and when Quincy had wondered aloud why they didn't use larger national carriers, the freight manager at the client had laughed and asked whether Quincy wanted their business. He had been recommended by another firm, a client of Quincy's, and an administration mix-up meant that they had a load to ship and no carrier as yet. Would Quincy be interested? Yeah, Quincy replied, though more formally, and then the second point of interest came up. New York was a good 2,800 miles away, and with 500 miles of driving a day, Quincy reckoned he could deliver the load on the sixth day. Maybe the fifth, if he pushed it. The sixth was fine, the manager said, if he could pick up the load the next day. Come again, Quincy asked, thinking he hadn't heard properly. Shippers wanted quick delivery. The same day, if it was humanly possible. He hadn't come across many shippers who implied there was no great hurry. Northland just had. The sixth day from tomorrow is good for us, the Northland man repeated. The warehouse won't have space before then. 
What's in the load? Paper. Bales of colored paper that are made into posters for Hollywood. Quincy removed his cap and wiped the sweat from his forehead. His took a deep pull from a bottle of water and glared at a bird that had the temerity to peep through the door of the container that was his study. You've got a paper plant there? I've never heard of it. I thought those posters got made in China. Doesn't everything come from that country? The freight manager laughed ruefully, they're tough competitors, but so far we're holding our own. We've been in business for a few years now. Not many people know of us. No idea why. They agreed on pickup times, contracts, and after the manager had explained the approach to the loading bay, Quincy went whistling to the main home. He picked the load up at dawn the next day, watching keenly and shouting instructions as a crane placed the container on the bed of his truck. Didn't know paper could be that heavy, he thought, as his truck sank a couple of inches. He cross-checked a few more details with the freight manager, a text message to Debbie, and then he was off just as the first ray of sunlight streaked through the clouds and lit his cab. He got on the I-90 East the first day and settled down to serious driving. He cut through Idaho, passing through the Lolo National Forest, and halted for the day at a truck stop just after he had crossed into Montana. He passed through the top corner of Wyoming, spoke to Debbie when he was in South Dakota, and ended the second day just before the Minnesota border. He jumped out of the cab, washed in the bathroom of the rest stop, and enjoyed his evening meal slowly, leisurely, like a man who just completed over a thousand miles. He greeted a few fellow truckers, talked about the weather, routes, exchanged cell numbers with a couple of them, and then climbed into the sleeper of his Peterbilt. Just before starting the next day, he uploaded all the photographs he had taken of his trip so far to an online storage service. Most of them were scenic pictures, but a couple of them were of dangerous drivers he had passed. He memorized the plates of those drivers and made a mental note to steer clear of them if he came across them again. He patted the door of his truck affectionately and set off on day three, hugging the border of Minnesota and Iowa. Lunch was a beef sandwich that he'd gotten packed the previous night at another rest stop, under the overhang of a tree underneath with a few other travelers. He nodded politely at them, washed down the sandwich with a gulp of coffee, and set off again. He left Wisconsin behind, and it was in Illinois that disaster struck. A biker overtook him from the left, coming close to him. Quincy let him pass, correcting slightly, gripping the wheel with both hands. Another one appeared in his mirror, coming up fast on his right. Quincy sounded his horn loudly, warning him to be careful. He saw the biker give a careless wave, and then he disappeared out of sight. The next moment, he heard a couple of thumps on the container, and the biker shot ahead. Quincy swore, and when he was settling back, another biker came from the left, so close to the rear wheels that Quincy instinctively turned right. He corrected swiftly, then overcorrected, the angle of turn increasing suddenly when the biker thumped the container with a clenched fist. The sound startled Quincy and the truck veered out of control, its heavy load rocking its body and crashed into the side rails. The truck swayed for agonizing seconds and then Quincy his eyes glazed, his eyes squinted, saw to his horror the container tip and break free from its securing bolts. The restraints sheared as if made of putty, no match for the weight above them, and the container fell with a tearing groan of metal on concrete. Silence for a while and then Quincy stirred. He seemed to be unharmed, the cab's belts and safety features had kicked in. His cab was damaged he knew, judging by the way it had smashed into the railings. The load. He unbuckled as quickly as he could, opened the door gingerly and hopped down. He looked behind and stood aghast at the sight that beheld him. Trucks, cars, a couple of bikes were backed up behind the container that lay on its side. The container's doors had fallen open and paper bales lay strewn on the highway. That wasn't what transfixed Quincy. It was the pieces of paper fluttering in the air and lying on the concrete that gripped his attention and that of every traveler. They were hundred-dollar bills. Chapter 27 Joe was one of the watchers, sitting in his rented SUV, three trucks behind the accident on the I-90E, he saw the Peterbilt yaw to the right, 
and in the distance heard the blare of horns from several vehicles and drew to a hard stop. He left his vehicle and ran to the growing throng of onlookers, several of whom were approaching the crashed vehicle, aiming to help its driver. They leapt back when the container canted and its doors burst open. The first bale fell, another landed on top of it and papers flew in the air. The shock of surprise from the watchers was as loud as a crowd at a football game. One man took the first tentative step forward. He looked behind him, uncertainty, and didn't see anyone stopping him. Mustering his courage, he rushed forward and caught the first bill in mid-flight. He examined it and yelled in delight, it's genuine. Other people rushed forward, and the highway became a feeding frenzy as the watchers stuffed their jackets, their trousers, their jeans, all available pockets with the money. It was there to be taken. No one was around to prevent them. More people flooded in as word spread. Some clambered inside the container and dragged more bales out, while others ripped open the undamaged bales. Fisticuffs broke out as greed reigned. The driver vigorously protested with some people but he was rudely shoved back. The driver fell, got to his feet, pulled out his cell phone and spoke into it, and then took pictures of the mob. Joe walked to the edge of the crowd, keeping out of the way of the driver's camera, picked a lone bill and examined it. He stuffed it in his jacket and went back to his vehicle and waited for the cops to arrive. It had gone down exactly the way he had planned it. Steinke wasn't a random pick. They had their eyes on him for a long while, after sifting through several owner-operator drivers. He fit their requirements. Drove long haul as well as short haul, had driven that particular route several times and had a blemish-free record. The blameless record was important. The plan required that the driver not be found at fault. Finding the bikers was a little more challenging. In the end, Joe had to settle for shipping in a few stuntmen from Hollywood. They practiced till they got the scare tactics just right and then waited for the call from Joe. Joe had eyes on the truck ever since it left Northland. He himself had been holed up in Rockford, Illinois, and when he heard the truck had entered the state, he fell in behind. At the stretch of highway that had been identified previously, he had given the signal and the incident had turned out as rehearsed. The bales were designed to explode on impact, the bills were supposed to fly in the air and scatter. They did. The first cruiser raced through the melee of vehicles and people and came to a stop at an angle to block access to the currency. Officers stepped out and a loudspeaker came on and people were asked to step back. More police vehicles came in, and from above came the sound of blades whipping through the air. It was a chopper from a TV station. The media had beaten the cops to aerial coverage. Joe wasn't paying attention to the activities on the highway. His eyes were focused on the screen of his phone as he scanned social media. The first mention of the flood of currency on the I-90 East came half an hour after the accident. The cops were yet to arrive then. The next mention came 15 minutes later. Free money on the I-90 East, exclaimed a Twitter poster, followed by several emojis. That was retweeted several times. Don't go to the bank, go to the highway, was another. He went to a TV channel's website and was gratified to see live coverage of the accident on the I-90 East, and the reporter's breathless commentary made him grunt in satisfaction. The cameras focused on the cops interviewing the driver and then bundling him into a cruiser. The bikers had long since left, and Joe knew they couldn't be identified. All of them had been sporting false number plates, and since when was anyone identified after wearing biking gear and full-face helmets? He felt sorry for a moment at the thought of the driver. He had been suckered into the crashing, none of what happened had been in his fault. Sorry? Joe's thumbs paused on the buttons of his phone, and he examined this alien emotion. Since when did he feel sorry for anyone? Joe regarded Peng Huang as his younger brother, and he was the only human being in the world for whom Joe felt something. Everyone else was either ally or enemy, or of no relevance. Sorry. He wasn't totally surprised at what he felt. In the recent years, he had been wondering what life was about what the killing was for. Killing. That reminded him. 
There was more to be done. He boxed up the strange emotions and the peculiar train of thought, and tossed it away in a corner of his mind. Some day he would open the box again and re-examine its contents. Or maybe not. It took seven hours for the I-90 East to clear and for traffic to resume moving. In that time the cops had cleared up the currency and had sealed the bales. They were placed in the container which was locked and two cruisers stood guard. A crane lumbered along and lifted the container and placed it to the side of the highway, freeing up the lane. A tow truck would come later in the night and take away the Peterbilt, and another semi would take away the container to Rockford. Northland had been informed, insurance companies had been notified, and witnesses had come forward to support Quincy's statement of the bikers and their dangerous driving. Joe didn't follow any of that. He had sent a final message to his gang before setting off to Northland. That message was a single word. Begin. The Northland plant had close to a hundred employees, all carefully selected, with very few of them having big families. Many employees were single, some were single parents, and a few had two children or more. The 41S owned the plant through a maze of shell companies, an acquisition that had been arranged several years back by the Hong Kong fixer. Over time, the new management had changed the demographic profile of the workers. There were Chinese migrants, South American workers, staff from the Caribbean, the plant felt like it was some international association. Joe knew the staff changes were deliberate and were planned for a day just like this. Migrants were less likely to attract attention if they went missing. He reached Northland 30 hours later, driving across the country, stopping only for the occasional break. He had traced Quincy Steinke's route in reverse, but any irony was lost on him. Joe didn't deal in irony. He didn't check into any hotel since he preferred sleeping in his car. He parked in the lot of a large convenience store and rested for a few hours before freshening himself in its bathroom. He reached the plant when the morning shift was already underway. He called the head of the plant in for a meeting along with the various managers and shut the door to his office. They knew him. They feared him. He removed his knife and his gun and placed it on the table. Will anyone talk? He asked in Mandarin. He killed the freight manager that night and four other workers. He buried the bodies in a landfill site and visited the homes of 10 other workers. He placed his knife on the throats of the workers' women and looked at the men. They got the message. They wouldn't talk. In truth, Joe didn't care if they spilled their secrets to the police. All it mattered was that they didn't squeal in the window of time that the plan needed to succeed. He was confident they would keep silent during that window. They didn't fear death. They feared Joe. Chapter 28 The second part of the plan kicked into play when Joe texted, Begin. A researcher in Texas, who was really a Chinese spy, sent the first tweet a full day later. I-90 East bills may not be real. Hashtag fake hashtag counterfeit. Several other people, all part of the plan, put out similar messages within a few seconds of the first. The messages were reposted, and several dummy Twitter accounts kept retweeting them at regular intervals. By midday, the social media networks were frothing, and media channels were ecstatic that they had a headline screaming story that could run for days. The U.S. Treasury was forced to break its silence and acknowledge that the container had $4 million worth of currency. All of it was counterfeit. They confirmed that the Secret Service, which was initially formed for investigating counterfeit currency, a remit that it still had, was investigating and more updates would follow. That was the only news conference they gave. Megan and Beth watched the events unfold in fascination, their investigation temporarily forgotten. They had split the investigation into two strands. One was still focused on Callie, and this time they were looking into security camera footage in the months leading to her disappearance. If they found such footage, they could analyze who she met, whether she was being followed, who she spoke to. It was a challenging task even for Werner, the supercomputer was hooked into the relevant databases, but the problem was that very few organizations kept recordings that old. 
The second strand searched similar footage for Lien. The twins were trying to pin down her movements in New York, trying to trace which hotel she had stayed in. They were trying to find how Kane got hold of her. Idiots, Beth shook her head in disgust when a TV reporter interviewed some of the money grabbers on the highway, those who were brazen enough to come forward and register their deep disappointment and anger that the bills were fake. It was as if they had been cheated out of their newfound wealth. The twins' social media accounts were flooded with excited posts about the counterfeit currency. They had blocked several repetitive posters and had stopped checking their feeds. The froth would disappear in a day or two. The social media bubble didn't last long. Megan played with her keyboard and idly looked up the Northland plant. Owned by an investment company whose officers were missing or not reachable. Typical setup. Ownership trail will lead to some offshore tax haven and disappear. The managers at the plant had been arrested, but none of them had been forthcoming. She felt Beth kick her and saw her sister bob her head at the third occupant in their office. Zeb was peering at his laptop, flicking through several images of men who appeared to be Chinese. He hadn't glanced at the TV, hadn't commented on the highway incident, and hadn't even spoken to the twins. He had been at his machine when the twins arrived that morning and hadn't even thanked Beth when she had plunked a mug of coffee in front of him. No idea what he's up to, Megan indicated. Zeb? Hotshot, she called out. Yeah? What's that you're looking at? Who are those dudes? Not related to your investigation. He folded his machine, grabbed it, and walked out of the office with a wave. Megan turned to the sound of keys being pressed. It was Beth texting furiously. Mark? Nope. Broker. Megan leaned over her shoulder and read the burst of messages. You know what the wise one's working on? He's mighty secretive. Beth. Only his maker knows. Maybe not even him. Broker. Megan snickered and clapped her sister on her shoulder. Broker knows. He just ain't telling. Maybe it's some agency thing. Possible. Let's get our butts to work on Callie and Lien. Zeb was hunting for the man who had pinged his inner radar. He had been looking into the 41S and the triads initially, taking up where the sisters had left off in their investigation and had delved deeper. He had rejected the two triad gangs early on, after talking to a couple of moles in them, that Broker and he had cultivated a long while back. They had such moles in several gangs in the city and often shared intel with various law enforcement agencies. He focused on the 41S and looked up every known hood with the gang. He had followed several of them but not one had given off the same vibes. He had then looked deeper into Peng Huang and had asked Werner to go as far back as possible in the gangster's life. Werner had obligingly returned several gigabytes of photographs, videos, news articles, and police reports. He had read about Peng Huang's story, of how he had formed the breakaway gang, he had poured through newspaper reports of arrests and had scanned police reports. None of the men in Werner's exhaustive dump felt like the ghost. It has to be someone high up in the gang, maybe Peng Huang's right-hand man, Zeb thought as he crossed his hands behind his head and rocked in his chair. Someone so good, that he hasn't surfaced in any police report. A true ghost. He let his mind roam and free associate, Chinese gang, Chinese girl, Chinese spying, high technology research. The Chinese angle was so obvious that it was impossible to ignore. Yet that has proved to be a dead end. Lien wasn't a spy. So why is the ghost following the twins? Revenge? He crashed his feet to the floor and rose abruptly. It was early morning, rush hour yet to start. It was when he did his best thinking, when alone in the office with the subdued sounds of the city in the background. Free association wasn't working at the moment. Maybe a run would help. On cue, Beth appeared at the door, Megan behind her, hopping from one foot to another. You joining us? Or are you too old? The older sister smirked. The three went for a morning run whenever Zeb was in the city, and followed up with an exercise drill that he'd taught them. The drill was a mix of freestyle martial arts moves and core strength workouts that he'd customized for them. 
A light rain was falling by the time they got to Central Park and upped their speed. Zeb led initially, and then the twins. They usually went ahead, letting him run at his pace, knowing that he liked his solitude. There were a few cyclists, a few other runners, fellow fitness enthusiasts nodding at each other in greeting. Zeb moved to the side to let a bunch of people overtake him, it wasn't about speed for him. A hooded runner approached him and ran past him, and for a moment Zeb admired the way the runner's arms and legs flowed, and then he was passed and Zeb was in his own world. He went into his gray zone, conscious of all that was happening around him, distant from his surroundings at the same time. He ran his ten miles and slowed and searched for the twins. There they were, all by themselves, near a bench. Some men stopped to look at them, a couple whistled. The sisters didn't look up, didn't respond, and Zeb felt warmth seep through him at their lack of reaction, at their discipline. He went through his own routine, more elaborate than that of the twins, strikes and blocks, kicks and parries, feints and thrust, slow, fast, 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 till his limbs seemed to move like a blur. He was aware of someone clapping, people drifting, and then the beast roused. Joe didn't know why he was observing Carter and the women, he just was. He had returned from Northland and had been satisfied by the social media storm he had initiated. He knew Peng Huang was pleased too, as were the shadowy puppet masters in China. Joe had returned to his stakeout on Columbus Avenue as if drawn by a magnet, and when the three people had stepped out, he had instinctively followed them. He was conveniently dressed in his gym gear, hoodie, tracks, running shoes, and he followed them without thought. He hung back on the first lap and changed direction on the second. He wanted to see Carter up close, wanted to see his eyes. Carter didn't meet his eyes. The man seemed to run as if lost in himself, other people on the track falling away from him, giving way to him. A tingle ran through Joe as he recognized the way Carter ran, it was how he himself moved. He leaned against a bench and stretched his legs as Carter and the women went through their workouts. He recognized most of Carter's moves, Muay Thai, Silat, Wing Chun, many others. Carter, like himself, seemed to adopt various moves from different styles. Maybe it was his body motion as he removed his right leg from the bench and extended his left that caught Carter's attention. Suddenly Carter was looking straight at him. He's the one. Zeb knew instinctively, recognizing the way his body reacted, flooded with awareness at the other man's presence. The ghost hoodie had slipped off his face giving a glimpse of lean cheeks, clean-shaven, short black hair, dark eyes that seemed to be electric. He's Chinese too. The man was as tall as Zeb, his movements as languid, as he withdrew his leg and straightened and walked away without a backward glance. You know him? Megan joined him and followed his gaze. I spotted him a few times today. Never seen him before, Zeb replied, his eyes still on the receding figure. You reacted as if you'd met him before. I'm sure I will meet him. Chapter 29 The woman knew something was up, she had been bundled into a van and driven before, but this time something felt different. She had been woken late in the night, had been tied and blindfolded, and had been roughly shoved into a van. She was aware of two men, one who guided her to the open doors of the vehicle, the other who seemed to be the driver. The woman had been held captive for such a long time that she had lost track of days, weeks and years. There were days when her memory was like a clear stream and she could remember everything. There were other days when everything was hazy, like a blurred picture. Squint and peer as much as you might like, the details remained elusive. Her captors had beaten her and tortured her. They had pulled her nails and held her feet over fire. They had waterboarded her a few times. The torture wasn't limited to physical. They deprived her of sleep and food, and interrupted her whenever she nodded off. Her cell was a small windowless room with a single light bulb that was never turned off. They replaced the bulb when she smashed it, taking care to sweep away all fragments of glass. She remembered snorting, they needn't have worried about her taking her own life. She wasn't the suicidal type. That was then. Now she wasn't sure. She looked down at herself, at the scrawny arms and legs, at the scabs and open wounds on her feet and fingers. She didn't have a mirror, but knew her teeth were damaged and her lips were shapeless. 
She had been called beautiful once, she had turned heads. She was sure she would still turn heads, in the other direction. They had moved her from apartment to apartment, block to block, after her initial two weeks. She didn't see much of the apartments she was brought to. She was blindfolded each time and all she saw was her room, her prison. She thought she was still in New York, but wasn't sure of anything anymore. She had scratched days on the walls of the first apartment, using her nails. She had given up after a while. There wasn't any point, after time had become a seamless continuum. They hadn't raped her and that surprised her. Her chief tormentor, a Chinese guy who never gave his name, had seen her without clothes several times. Each time, there hadn't been even the faintest flicker of desire in his eyes. She had tried, awkwardly, to play the coquette the first time he'd asked her to strip. He'd backhanded her casually, breaking her lips and a tooth. She had revealed everything to them, after the regimen of psychological and physical torture. She had been trained to withstand aggressive interrogation, but the human body could take only so much. Her mind gave way and she spilled freely whenever they asked her. She had felt shame initially, now she felt nothing. The torture had stopped once she had told her secrets, but they continued to hold her prisoner. They didn't kill her, fed her the bare minimum nourishments her body and mind needed to function, and moved her from place to place. She had asked her tormentor why they kept her alive. He hadn't answered. He had spoken quite freely initially in the early days of her captivity, but the words in him seemed to have dried up. Now he only asked her questions. And tortured her. Her tormentor usually worked alone, but had two other men helping when they moved her. Those men didn't speak either. She had caught a glimpse of one of them the first time they hurried her into a van. He was Chinese, as was her tormentor. The door to her room opened silently, and her tormentor entered. He was bald, had small eyes, and was perennially expressionless. Stand up, he commanded. She struggled to her feet and rose slowly. Turn around. She faced the wall obediently and felt the mask fall over her face. Are you moving me again? She whispered through her smashed lips. It had been so long since she had spoken that shaping her lips around words took an effort. There was no reply. She felt the man's breath on her neck as he fastened her wrists behind her back, his touch surprisingly gentle. He turned her around and something stirred in her that she thought had died. She shouldered him roughly, hoping to make him stumble, and blindly raised a knee to where she thought his groin was. The next moment she was bent double, gasping, as a pile driver pounded into her belly and drew away all her breath. She coughed and spit, tried to since her throat was dry, and moaned when he hauled her up by her hair grabbing it through the hood and shoved her out of the door. She shivered in the cold and knew it was night when she stepped outside. She could smell it in the air in the closed space that she could sense. A garage. That was how they moved her from A to B, they brought her out through a door that led to a garage and pushed her inside a van. This night was no different. She could hear her tormentor speak softly to two men, words that she couldn't catch, and then one man gripped her by the elbows, another opened the door and they helped her inside. Neither of the men who had handled her was her interrogator. She knew his feel, these men were rough, they had longer nails and calloused hands. She fell inside what felt like a padded van and lay on her side, breathing shallowly as she tried to listen. She knew the van was escape-proof from her previous outings, but maybe she'd get a clue to their destination by listening. All she heard was an order. Drive. Two men in the front, she thought, not that it would do her any good. She was flung from side to side as the van turned corners and took lefts and rights. From the faint sounds of traffic, she assumed it was the deep of night. At one point she heard another car pull up beside them, at what she assumed was a stoplight, and heard laughing above the throb of engines. She thumped the padded sidewall with her elbows and knees, knowing fully well it was futile. Sound didn't escape the vehicle. She had tried several times before, each time in vain. They seemed to be entering a busier thoroughfare when the van resumed again, going by the sounds of traffic. Driving straight since the vehicle rocked gently and didn't twist and turn. The steady drive changed suddenly when a horn blared and the van braked hard throwing her against the front. 
More honking sounded, urgent, furious, and then a vehicle crashed into the front of the vehicle, dragging it to the right. Another crash in the side bent the sidewall and buckled the rear doors. A few vehicles raced on, many seemed to stop at the scene and she heard footsteps race past to the front of the van. She heard angry yelling as she braced herself against the front, dragged her head down against it, and managed to get the hood off her face. She hobbled to the rear doors and kicked against them. They held. No one seemed to hear her from the outside. She kicked again and thought she saw a sliver of light. She lay down on her back, bent her knees and summoning all her energy kicked hard. The doors still held she wasn't strong enough. She rose and threw herself against the rear, taking the impact on her back. Her heart beat faster when the doors parted an inch. She got to her feet and pushed with her shoulder. The doors resisted for a moment, their hinges broken by the impact, and then they gave way. She hopped out, lost her balance and fell. She got to her knees, then her feet, and straightened herself and looked around swiftly. The van was jammed tight against the curb, with cars, pickups, flashing lights lined up behind it and to its side. Headlights lit the rear of the van making her squint, but there didn't seem to be any occupants in the vehicles behind the van. They all seemed to be bunched at the front where furious arguments seemed to rage. A car door popped open, a few vehicles down the line and a woman called out, Hey? For a moment she thought of going to the woman and seeking help, but the image of her torturer came to her mind. She didn't know how well organized her captors were. Maybe they had vehicles following the van. Escape seemed to be the better option. The captive looked away from the lights and took off with a hobbling run. She got to the sidewalk and walked at a fast pace, her head bent down, ignoring the yells from the rear. Through the corners of her eyes, she saw the two men from the van backed up against it and surrounded by a throng. She hurried, but no one seemed to pay attention to her. Maybe the two men had said the van was empty. The woman who had yelled at her still seemed to be calling out though. The captive turned back once and was reassured when she saw no pursuers. She broke to a shuffling run, movement difficult because of her bound arms, and in the distance saw something that gave her hope. It was a sanitation truck parked, its lights blinking. She could make out garbage collectors hauling what looked like black sacks, heading to the vehicle. She wondered briefly at the odd timing of their collection, then put the thought behind her mind and ducked behind a car and watched them for some time. The rear of the truck was open like a giant mouth, and she could dimly see sacks piled up inside. That too was odd, but she wasn't going to question her luck. She timed her move when both the collectors had their backs to her and were moving to another house. She slipped the first time she tried to climb inside. She jumped as high as she could, and got her back on the metal bottom of the truck, tucked her legs tight and rolled inside. She crawled swiftly to the front and burrowed deep amid stinking sacks of waste, just in time as more black sacks crashed on top of her. The truck rumbled to life ten long minutes later during which the woman crouched, her heart pounding loudly. It set off on a meandering drive and stopped several times to fill its insides with more of the city's garbage. She escaped at its fourth stop when the truck was well away from the accident scene. She crossed the quiet street and hurried down, not recognizing the neighborhood. Her luck held again when she spotted a dog walker emerge from a dark home. Sir, she shouted. It sounded more like a croak to her. She hurried, and the man looked once at her and turned his back on her, his dog tugging at its leash. He didn't seem to give a second thought at her appearance. This was New York, unusual was normal. Sir, she called out again and this time he stopped and turned a frown on his face. I need your help, sir. She turned around to show him her bound wrists. Could you please call the police? The words tumbled out like a stream that had been once dammed. I am Calliope Minter. Chapter 30 Megan rushed out of her apartment and tapped on Beth's door as soon as she'd hung up on Chong. Her sister flung it open and marched out, dressed in her jacket, her glock visible beneath it. Zeb, she inquired. Waiting. In our chariot. Zeb opened the doors for them, touched an invisible hat, and bowed when they boarded his SUV. He got a snicker from Beth and an astonished look from Megan. 
Looks like someone's developing a sense of humor, the older sister commented, and pointed grandly ahead, forward. Any more details from Chong? Beth asked her sister when Zeb had raced out of their basement and was barreling down Henry Hudson Parkway. They came across a few cabs, shift workers, but the city was theirs that early in the morning and they made good time. Chong had taken to calling Megan for any update, something that had initially rankled the younger sister. I want to be informed too, she had hissed at the cop. He had rolled his eyes and said he couldn't give the same briefing twice. I call the first number on my phone for the two of you. That just happens to be Megan's. My name should come first, that's assuming you know your alphabet, she'd fumed sarcastically. Chong had turned his phone around to show their names in his directory. They were entered as Peterson 1 and Peterson 2. No, Megan replied, Callie isn't in a fit state to talk. Can't be questioned. Where's she now? The Bronx State Hospital. She was found in Baychester by one Dwight Koletsky, who took her to that hospital. Her folks will be soon moving her to a hospital closer to home. What did she say? Nothing, other than revealing her name. She persuaded Koletsky, who was walking his dog, to inform the police. Koletsky did, the call finally reached Chong, and when they reached Koleki's residence he'd taken her to the hospital. He seems to be an enterprising man. Meet him and see for yourself is what Chong said. Kaleki's dog had kept tugging, urging his master to resume their walk. He had smells to sniff at, lamp holes to explore, and here his master was wasting time talking to some lady. He tugged again and this time Koletsky turned around and gave him the look. Oh well. He planted his bottom on the sidewalk and waited with his tongue out. It looked like the walk had just been canned. Koletsky took his time in responding to the woman, his eyes watchful, wary. He looked behind her and didn't see anyone following her. He had been mugged a few times and knew what to look for. None of those signs were present, the woman seemed to be alone. Her hands were bound for sure and in the early morning light, she looked as if she had been roughed up. Still, appearances could be deceptive. He checked out the street again, before turning to her. I haven't heard that name, ma'am. It should mean something? The woman's teeth chattered, and Koletsky felt bad immediately. His dawn would have given him a roasting, if she had been alive. The woman's bound, Dwight. She's shivering and has been abused. Don't you have eyes? She would have yelled at him. Let's first get you inside, ma'am. Get you warm and have some food inside you. Looks like you haven't. He sucked in his breath sharply when a passing vehicle's beams lit the woman's face up. Good Lord, who did this to you? He cut her restraints with a flick of his tactical knife and ushered her inside the home, all the while keeping an eye on the street. Bound, assaulted, very likely meant there were people hunting the woman. Men looking for me, the woman confirmed his suspicions through her cracked lips. You'll be safe with me, ma'am. Till the cops come. Gunnery Sergeant Dwight Koletsky, U.S. Marine Corps, retired, had seen some bad stuff in his life. He had faced down crazies several times in his life and had come out on top each time. His home was his fortress, he wasn't worried about some thugs hunting a woman. He got her a blanket, brewed a strong coffee for her and then grabbed his phone. Anyone in the police I should ask for? He made his call when the woman shook his head. Callie was in a room surrounded by doctors and nurses, with medical machinery hooked to her. The Minters were at the foot of her bed, Jack Minter's face impassive, Grace and Percy's faces tear-streaked. Grace attempted a tremulous smile when the twins entered, and Percy finger-waved at them. It'll take time, Jack Minter said softly when Megan approached him. She knew what he meant, the psychological damage would take longer to heal than the physical. Chong had briefly read out the extent of her condition, and she knew recovery would be slow and long. Like how it was with Beth, she thought. She and Beth hung around unobtrusively for several moments before making their way outside. She spied Chong who raised his hands in mock defense when she made a beeline at him. Hold right there. I don't have anything for you. We haven't questioned her. She's in no condition as you can see. You're checking out the neighborhood? 
Yes, ma'am. Where she was found, the street? That too, ma'am. Anything else we cops should be looking at? You spoke to Koletsky? Chong gestured with his shoulder at a tall, broad-shouldered man who was talking to Zeb. Did? He too didn't have much to say. Callie approached him and asked him to call us. That's about it. Where's Berg? Should be landing now. Maybe an hour to get here. Megan studied Koletsky and noted his posture, the strong hands, steady eyes, and the neatly cut brown hair. She had looked him up on their drive, and even Zeb had been impressed when she had read out his service record. Silver Star, Purple Heart, and several other awards. Three tours in Afghanistan, one to Iraq. Callie was downright lucky she came across him. Any other person. Zeb liked what he saw in Dwight Koletsky, a quiet man who didn't see the need to speak unnecessarily, a man who had presence. You saw any of the men after her, Gunny? A look of surprise crossed Kalecki's face and then warmth flooded his eyes. No, sir. His eyes went up and down Zeb and a glimmer of recognition crossed his face. Afghanistan? And Iraq and many other places, Gunny. You did well taking that lady in. Most people would have spent time in endless questioning. Will she be okay, sir? Zeb. Yeah, looks like it, though it will be a long road. They talked about past campaigns, about friends in common and friends lost. Zeb's eyes were ceaselessly moving, watching people come and go in the corridor, assessing attack and defense spots as he spoke. You expecting company, Zeb? Not really. The hospital's flooded with cops, however, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. Joe was questioning the two men in the van in a side alley, 40 minutes after the accident. The accident wasn't their fault, both men told their story fast, not liking the expression on Joe's face. A drunk driver had slammed his car into the van, and when they tried to take evasive action, another vehicle had rammed them. The men had managed to extricate themselves from the angry mob after accepting fault, even though it wasn't, and after giving out their insurance details. They had driven the damaged van away to the alley, and one of them had searched for the woman but hadn't been successful. To add to that, traffic was still slow and drivers were still angry. The thug didn't want to draw attention to his search, and that hampered his efforts. Joe had enough of the whiny voices and snapped the neck of one of the men just like that when the man was in mid-flow. He broke it as if it was a twig and tossed the body away. The other man started hyperventilating, protesting, his voice dying when Joe faced him. Joe gestured at the hoods with him, who grabbed the protesting man and took him away. He would never be seen again. Joe stood in the dark alley figuring out his next actions when quiet had descended again. She couldn't have gone far, he thought. Her hands were tied and she wasn't in good shape. Maybe someone helped her get away. He went to the Ford and turned on the police scanner. Nothing there. He made a call to several snitches they had in the police. No record of an escaped woman. He turned on a flashlight, not wanting to draw attention by using the dome light, and pulled out a map. Forty-five minutes since her escape. He traced a finger in a circle around the accident spot and set off. He would search the perimeter and then come inside. He wasn't far from Baychester, his eyes looking left and right when his phone rang. It was one of the snitches with an update. A Dwight Koletsky had just called in. He had the woman. Joe accelerated as the informer recited Kalecki's address, cursed as a stoplight turned red and waited impatiently. Another car pulled up beside him and its driver, a stocky man, glanced curiously at him, reading the rage on his face. Joe schooled his face back to its normal impassive expression and surged ahead as soon as the light turned green. He flew through the nearly deserted neighborhood and slowed when he entered Kalecki Street. He lives alone, the snitch had said. Joe read out the numbers on the houses and fingered the knife on his thigh. One man and a damaged woman. It would be easy. He would take out the man first, kill him fast, and drive away with the woman. She wouldn't offer any resistance, and even if she did, Joe had ways of dealing with her. A pair of headlamps turned on ahead, and a white car nosed out of a driveway. 
Was that Kalecki's? Joe tapped the gas and got closer without being obvious. It was. There were two heads in the car. Kalecki and the woman. He followed them, searching for an opportunity to ram them and take them out, but no opening presented itself. He kept behind them at a discreet distance, and his heart sank when they turned inside a hospital, and he saw the flood of cops. The woman has escaped, he called Peng Huang at his mistress's house and briefed him. The gang leader didn't rage or shout. Joe knew his mind was working at lightning speed, figuring out the implications and the resultant impact on the gang. She's in the Bronx State Hospital, Joe answered Peng Huang's question. Surrounded by cops. Another vehicle pulled up at the hospital, a SUV, and a figure stepped out, a man who Joe could recognize even from the distance. Carter. No, he said in finality. She can't be recovered. Chapter 31 Peng Huang made the call to the Hong Kong man, who in turn briefed Beijing man. No one bothered about time zones and inconveniencing the other anymore. The plan was coming to a head, time and sleep were luxuries they couldn't indulge in. Beijing man was less understanding than Peng Huang. He raged and ranted at Hong Kong man, who listened with his heart in his mouth. There were stories of a secret basement in Beijing man's house that had body parts in glass jars. Legend was that they were all parts of people who had dared to go against Beijing man. Hong Kong man didn't know if the stories were true, and he had no wish to find out. He listened without interruption, hoping that the tirade would end soon and a cooler head would return. He did. Beijing man's words slowed and then stopped. Hong Kong man heard him take deep breaths and when he spoke again, his voice was calm and measured. When is the next shipment? It's on its way. Do you expect any problems? Beijing man asked sharply. The man in Hong Kong took the phone away from his ear and looked it for a few seconds. How could he be sure there wouldn't be any issues? He couldn't foretell the future, could he? No, he replied, and hoped that some part of him wouldn't end up in that basement museum of Beijing man. This semi was trundling along at a good pace on the I-80 east to New York, its driver blissfully unaware that he too was part of a larger plot. This driver too was an owner-operator, and he had driven this route from Ansonia, Ohio, to New York several times. He'd picked up the load just outside the small town of Ansonia, in virtually similar circumstances to Quincy Steinke's. He too had been asked to take his time, and had been offered a bonus for safe delivery. Hardly anyone offered bonuses in the transporting business these days, and the very thought made him go warm and think well of his fellow human beings. His accident was less dramatic than Quincy Steinke's. He didn't know it was meant to be less dramatic. His front tire burst, a rare but not uncommon occurrence, and when he'd finished bringing the vehicle to a halt, he hopped out and saw to his dismay most of his rear ones on the driver's side were shot to pieces too. He gazed stupidly at the flats and at the pieces of synthetic rubber on the highway, droppings from his vehicle. Other vehicles were swerving around the larger pieces of debris, and a couple of 18-wheelers sounded their horns in sympathy as they went past. The driver crouched and inspected the rear tires, but couldn't work out why they had burst. He sighed and got back in the cab and started making calls, to the customer, to the receiving warehouse, to a towing company, to his carrier. He took a swig of coffee and resigned himself to a long wait and a disrupted schedule. He was mistaken. The first vehicle arrived just half an hour later, but it wasn't the one he was expecting. It was a police cruiser. Two more drove up, their light bars flashing, sirens sounding, even though there wasn't much traffic on the I-80. The last vehicle to reach him was a police command vehicle. Armed officers surrounded the driver, and demanded he open the container. Carefully they shouted, they had guns trained on him. Why? What's going on? The driver asked, bewildered, his arms raised to the sky. Open it, he was told. He opened the container and sagged in shock when he saw the bales had burst open, and the container was flooded with hundreds of bills. A police officer caught a bill, inspected it and yelled in his mic, not drugs. Twenty dollar bills. 
must be millions in here. The first tweet burst into the social media universe an hour after the discovery of the currency. More millions on another highway. All fake. Are the bills in your wallet real? Hashtag counterfeit bills in your pocket. A social media storm followed, as the same or similar messages were pumped out by hundreds and thousands of users, many of whom were from dummy accounts, spewing canned posts. The mainstream media picked up and ran articles and talk shows, demanding answers from the government. People lined up at their banks and demanded for their bills to be inspected. The U.S. Treasury arranged another press conference, and this time, the official acknowledged that the Northland's notes were of a high quality. The paper was the real deal, the combination of cotton and linen in it just right. The weight was perfect, as was the texture. As to the raised ink, the watermarking, the microprinting, there seemed to be a note of admiration in the official's voice as he described the find in Northland. The I-80 East Hall seemed to be of similar quality. The Secret Service was investigating any connection. They were also checking out the Ohio plant. All law enforcement agencies were cooperating, and they would have an update soon. Don't panic, was his message to the people of the country. The message came too late. Megan and Beth caught a lot of the press conference on their screens, but weren't paying much attention to the hurricane forces of social media at work. They were closeted in Callie's hospital room, three days after Koletsky brought her in. They weren't alone, along with them were Zeb, Burke, Kowalski, Chong, Pazaka and a bunch of other FBI and NYPD officers. Callie could talk, and she had an eager audience. Burke had introduced the twins to Callie who'd gripped their hands hard, conveying all that she felt in that simple gesture. Callie started slowly, retraced her kidnapping, and confirmed what Clem and Peters had suspected. The ambulance that had roared past her that night had side doors which were open, and from its dark interior two pairs of hands had lifted her off the street. She was bound, gagged and hooded immediately, and her captors drugged her. She was in a windowless room when she came to, maybe five or six hours later. She didn't know where, didn't even know if she was still in the city. She didn't know if it was day or night, the single bulb in her room remained lit throughout her stay in the room. After another hour of her coming to consciousness, a peep window slid open on the door and a face peered at her. It slid back and minutes later the door opened and a tray of food was thrust at her. The man carrying it was Chinese, behind him was another man, and he too was Chinese. Who are you? Why am I here? Callie yelled at them. The second man came from behind and backhanded her a heavy slap that knocked her back against the wall and split her lips. Eat, he pointed at the food and left along with the other man. Callie drank deeply from a glass of water that Megan held to her lips and settled back in her bed. Have I really been away for three years? she asked. She hadn't believed her eyes when they fell on a calendar in the hospital. She had badgered the medical staff, who had confirmed the length of her absence, but didn't have anything more for her. Treating her was their priority, as was the commencement of counseling. Yeah, Sarah Burke replied and gripped Callie's hand tightly when she flinched. We thought Kane had gotten you. Callie fluffed the pillows behind her and gripped the railing beside her to sit upright. There were days I wished he had. She resumed her story in a strong voice and told of the beatings and torture that started that night. They fed me and then beat me. The beatings were nothing compared to the other stuff. At first it was the two men, later on it was just the one man. The second one. I'll never forget him. He was short-haired, dark-eyed. Was he tall? Head swung around and stared at Zeb at his interruption. No why. Zeb's keen look faded and he asked her to continue. Why didn't matter anymore? Callie spoke of the waterboarding, the nail extraction, the breaking of fingers and nails, the sleep denial and the lack of light. They wanted to know who I was. Who I really was. What I knew and what I was after. I resisted. She looked shamefacedly at Burke. I think I lasted three days and then I gave in. I couldn't hold back. A tear slid down her cheek and fell on her shoulder. I tried my best to keep holding back. 
Callie, it was Burke who stopped her this time. There's nothing to be ashamed of. No one can stand up to sustained torture. Not a single person. She's right. Three days is more than most trained operatives can last. Heads turned again in Zeb's direction and waited for more. I lasted just two days once, he added quietly. He never mentioned that. I'll have to ask him, not that he'll speak more about it. Megan looked at her friend for long moments and then focused her attention on Callie when her low voice carried on. The interrogator was interested in the undercover FBI agents, their locations, identities. They wanted to know Callie's reporting pattern, how she had infiltrated the research group, which Chinese agents she knew of. I asked them if they were from some Chinese agency. He laughed. He was a criminal. All his men were gangsters. He asked what I knew of Lian Cheng Ban. How we suspected her. Why I'd befriended her and visited her in California. She wasn't a spy, was she? Burke. Her face narrow, pinched, leaning towards the bed. She was, Callie bobbed her head. What happened, she asked when something flitted on Burke's face. We monitored her emails, recorded her calls, and had her under surveillance. You didn't know of all this. She was clean, Kowalski answered for Burke when the special agent remained silent. They knew you would be doing all that. They were one step ahead. Several steps ahead. None of our other agents were compromised. You knew most of them. You'd have revealed their identities. Kowalski protested. I did. She saw the dawning light in the FBI agents' faces and nodded. They played us. Chapter 32 Sarah Burke called for a break to attend to several missed calls and messages that had piled up while they were with Callie. She and Kowalski huddled near a water cooler, their phones pressed to their ears, their body language giving out a keep-away message. Megan observed them for some time and made her way to Beth who was with the Minters. Callie's folks were calmer, more settled, now that their daughter was recovering. They had briefly heard about the torture inflicted on Callie before Burke had ushered them out of the room. You don't have clearances, she'd said, though they all knew she meant you can't stomach hearing her story. Megan scrolled through the news feeds on her phone, read the Treasury Department statements and the rest of the events unfolding outside the hospital. The latest development was that the Northland plant was owned by a Chinese company. The ownership of the Ohio printing press was still being investigated. Message boards and forums were filled with angry posts about counterfeit currency in people's possession. She thumbed rapidly and skipped through most of the repetitive coverage and paused when a breaking news bar flashed on her screen. Government placed order with Northland? Screamed the headline. The report took pains to point out that while it was an unsubstantiated rumor, their ace reporters were digging into it and would soon have more. That's some accusation to make. She pocketed her phone in disgust and went back to Callie's room and took her position next to Burke. I don't know why they kept me alive, Callie anticipated Burke's question. I asked him once and got no reply. My suspicion is that they wanted a bargaining chip if the kidnapping exploded in their faces. She described the way she was moved from apartment to apartment, the care and the planning that seemed to go into each move. That accident was sheer dumb luck. They couldn't have anticipated it, lucky for me. I never saw anyone other than the interrogator and the second guy, but there was one other guy for sure. He gave orders in Mandarin. I could sense the two guys with me feared him. I had picked up some of the language after spending time with Lian Cheng, but all I heard was driving instructions. No mention of any neighborhood or where we were. No names were used. The first time they moved me, I tried to listen to the traffic and counted the turns we took. I couldn't place the neighborhood. I'm sure they took several detours before they approached the hideout. Once she had spilled her knowledge of the undercover agents, the interrogator had moved to her research. He wanted to know what its applications were, how the military would use it. I told him we were far removed from those decisions, but he didn't believe me. She shuddered at a memory and turned her head away. 
Was Lian Cheng found? she asked when her composure returned. Burke expelled a breath, glad that the elephant in the room had finally come up. Her body was found. Cut up by Cain. Cain himself is dead. Dead? Echoed Callie. How? Megan broke her silence and described the events that had amped up the search for the missing woman. Lian Cheng knew I suspected her, it showed in her. Callie filled in more blanks for them. Especially after our last visit to her home. During that visit, I overheard a call she had with someone in Hong Kong. She didn't know I was close by. I had gone out for a run, but had returned early. I had a spare key, and when I entered the home I heard her. She was talking about me, about her suspicions. She spoke fast, and I didn't get a lot of it. I heard the triads mentioned, and that was when I got scared. I thought they'd put a hit on me. My fears eased when nothing happened, we continued as before, each of us maintaining our facade. She left the program to join her dad who was ailing, and I felt better. She laughed without humor. That didn't last, did it? They took another break and when the FBI agents returned, Megan noted the strained look on Burke's face. Betcha she's also involved in that counterfeiting case. Kane was theirs. Callie said positively. It makes sense given the few scraps I heard. The interrogator laughed when I once asked about Lian Cheng. She'd served her purpose. They had a disposal unit. I didn't get to ask him more since he broke my pinky finger just then. All the women that Kane killed, they were given to him by this Chinese gang? Burke rubbed her left palm absently, it had red marks where her nails had bit into the soft flesh. When she had clenched her fist at the horrors her agent had undergone. Probably not, Megan spoke up when no one had any answers. The NYPD investigated the victims. Nothing came up. Kane needed victims. Somehow the gang knew about him and how to reach him. They gave him Lien. Maybe other victims too, we just haven't heard about them. They watched him, excitement flared through her when another piece of the puzzle fell into place. They killed him when they saw he was heading to meet me. That kill was so smooth, we still don't know who the assassin was. Feels like the same gang who abducted Callie. That would tally with that line in his journal. However, why would he break cover to meet you? Burke put her hand behind her back when she felt Zeb's eyes on her wrists. She knew about Megan's theory about Kane, it still didn't make sense to her. Who knows? Pazaka growled. He was a serial killer, not your average dude. I think he found out something about the gang. Something that was so enormous that he had to act. Megan stuck to her ground, looking at each person, daring them to shoot her down. No one did. No one knew any better. Do we know who this gang is? Callie changed the topic. Megan got a go-ahead, answer her look from Burke, and turned to Callie. They're the 41S. Zeb had shared his hunch that the 41S was more deeply involved than the twins suspected, after their return from Baghdad. They in turn had briefed Burke and Chong and Pazaka, a download that wasn't necessary. The FBI and the cops had been looking into the gang, independently. You didn't share, Beth had accused Chong. You folks aren't the only one with secrets, Chong had retorted. Zeb had then mentioned the Chinese ghost, and that made the FBI and the NYPD sit up and take notice. There was no such ghost in their database. All three agencies set out to work on identifying him and piecing together more about the 41S. There hadn't been much progress by the time Callie had recovered. 41S, Callie rolled the name around her tongue, her eyes shut as she went back in time. Nope, she shook her head finally. They were all Chinese, that's all I remember. No gang names were mentioned, no visible tats on anyone. Who are they? Megan and Chong told her and despite the somber mood in the room, Beth couldn't help giggling at Callie's dumbstruck expression when Baghdad was mentioned. You went to the other side of the world to search for me? Chill, Callie. We'd do that for anyone. Beth brushed away the underlying thanks in the undercover agent's comment. Maybe not for Pazaka, though. 
We'd go to the end of the block for him. No more. That drew a laugh and a palpable relaxation in the room. You questioned the gang members? Callie addressed her superior. Peng Huang the leader has gone into hiding, Burke replied. We've got a few of his men in custody, however they're pretty low level. He has a right-hand man, a ghost, according to Zeb here. This dude followed the twins and in all likelihood, orchestrated the attack on the twins outside your home. We saw him once, when we were on a run in the park. Zeb sure he tailed us a few times. Megan described the ghost's looks to Callie, who shook her head in frustration. Nope, I didn't see anyone like him. He could be the man issuing orders. She fell back against her cushions and continued her statement, with Burke making her repeat details, events, faces several times. Daylight turned to dusk, which became dark night when they finished. Callie was talked out and exhausted. Burke called an end to the statement-taking, knowing that her team as well as the NYPD would listen to it several times and act on the revelations. The NYPD would go through Kane's victims' files again to see if there were any links to the 41S. The FBI would have to withdraw all its undercover agents and clean up the failed operation. Both the law enforcement agencies would try to identify the ghost. And who's behind the gang? Burke figured there was someone else pulling the gang's strings. The gang could place spies in the various research programs, but they wouldn't do that of their own accord. Someone was paying them. Unless they stole the research and sold it to the Chinese government. That's far-fetched. It'd require more organization and a bigger gang than what they've currently got. Nope. Someone paid them and probably even provided them with researchers like Lian Cheng. They did the monitoring and the reporting back. She stifled a tired yawn and squelched a bitter thought that somewhere, someone had spun a web that she and her agents had walked into. She mussed her hair and held the door open for Megan who whispered, don't dwell on it, as they left Callie's room. Wait, the injured agent called out, stopping all of them. Something came back to me. Something the third man said. Containers. He said something about containers, to my interrogator. Containers. Megan frowned and let her mind roam to see if her subconscious could pick up any clues. It didn't, and she hurried to join Zeb and Beth as they left the hospital. A shriek made her falter and when she saw it was Beth, she swore softly. The next moment, she was grinning goofily and running towards a petite woman that her sister was hugging. Chloe. When did you get back? she exclaimed. Chloe's answer was drowned out when a man guffawed, a tall bearded man who was slapping Zeb's back. Yeah, that's Bear, Chloe answered, following Megan's eyes. He never could do quiet. Not even in a hospital. Raja's back along with Bawana. We came with them, she answered Beth's rapid-fire questions, broke her too. He's gone with Sarah. Nope, no mission. Zeb asked us to. Bear and Chloe will be Callie's protection detail, Zeb came up from behind them and completed her sentence. We'll find something to occupy Roger, Bawana, and Broker. Let's roll, he pointed at his SUV. Megan climbed into the vehicle and was shutting the door, when the lights on the hospital's roof caught her attention. Of course. Why didn't anyone think of that? Callie's return is public knowledge, isn't it? she asked without turning her head. Yeah. What are you looking at? Her sister craned her head and peered through the darkness. Don't you think the 41S would have staked out the hospital? Possibly, but not now. Not with so many cops and FBI agents around. They're checking every vehicle in the yard, in the parking lot, and on the street. She smacked her forehead with a palm when her eyes rested on the object Megan was pointing at. Security cameras. The hospital had several of them facing the front and the street. Chapter 33 Megan connected to Werner through her screen as Zeb drove and got it to search for the hospital's security system. Werner came back in less time than it took for Zeb to reach the exit and hit concrete. The cameras were part of a standard security install that were routinely seen in hundreds of public buildings. Over the years, the twins and broker 
had written programs to hack into most of the off-the-shelf security systems. You're sure it's that make? Megan typed. Yes, Werner sniffed and rolled its electronic eyes. It was a supercomputer, one of a kind in the Western world. Its word was not to be doubted. Megan activated the program and waited for Werner to inject it into the hospital's network. Done, Werner blinked when Zeb reached the first stoplight. Get the camera logs, she commanded. The logs were conveniently named by floor and position. She skipped over all the internal ones and went to a folder labeled Exterior. That folder had 25 cameras, left, right, rear, parking lot, entrance, and exit. She clicked on the entrance file and it opened to reveal two more files. Driveway and front facing. The files had a week's footage, one for each day. The system probably dumps a week's coverage in these folders, and older ones are dumped into some hard drive. Megan didn't want the older coverage. She opened the day's recordings and got Werner to search for all vehicles that passed the entrance and approached the front of the hospital. You want to search for the whole day? Werner lifted an eyebrow. Humans were so illogical. Of course not, Megan furiously keyed in. She would have added idiot, but that would have been lost on the supercomputer. Search from half an hour before Kalecki's arrival. Werner didn't were, those days belonged to the Stone Age days of computers. It came back by the time Zeb reached Bronx Zoo and had started across the city. Werner had 40 cars whose drivers' faces, caught on the cameras, didn't match their DMV pictures. Megan asked it to dig into their identities and was biting her lip as she stared at an oriental face on her screen when Werner popped up a message box. Maybe you'll be interested in this Ford. It was seen outside your office a few times. Its owner isn't the driver. Two images came on the screen. The cameras had caught two images of the Ford, one a frontal view with the plates clearly visible, the other a driver's side view. The frontal view had windshield glare that hid the occupants. The side view showed a lean face, pale, dark-haired man who seemed to be shielding himself from the camera. Yes, Beth, peering over Megan's shoulder, yelled and pumped her fist. The sisters high-fived each other, and Megan patted her screen affectionately. Good work, Werner. Werner was above compliments. It went back to playing chess with its Swiss date, a supercomputer that it had met online. Zeb risked a quick sideways glance when Megan turned the screen at him and recognized the Ford. It was the one that Werner had flagged up for his attention some time back. He made out the profile immediately. The man's stillness was apparent even in the CCTV image. The driver was their ghost. Zeb slowed when they approached the Alexander Hamilton Bridge as the traffic thickened and bunched close together. He glanced out idly when they started crossing the river and for a moment his hand slipped and the vehicle swerved. Megan glanced at him and then leaned over him to see what had distracted him. A barge was floating below and on it was a brown container. What? It's just a barge. Beth peered through her window on hearing her sister and shrugged her shoulders when nothing struck her. You okay, Zeb? You're seeing ghosts now? Zeb didn't answer, a slight smile playing on his lips. Megan looked out of the window again, and this time scanned the section of the river in sight. Nope. Nothing other than that barge. It seemed to be carrying waste bags, a few men scurrying on its deck, and that brown container. Container. Containers, Callie had said. Chinese gang. Northland. Chinese ownership. They're behind the counterfeiting, Megan whispered when it came to her. The 41S is behind all that's happening. They reconvened at the FBI office at Federal Plaza early next day, after Megan had briefed Chong, Pazaka, and Burke about the container connection. It was Burke's idea that the three investigations, the NYPD's, the FBI's, and that of the Secret Service, come together and a task force be formed. There was a fourth investigation, that by the twins, but she didn't want to bundle that into the task force. She knew the twins would never agree to being part of a larger group, and in any case, less than a handful knew of their investigation. Chong and Pazaka had readily agreed to the task force and didn't mind the FBI leading it. 
They had worked with Burke in the past and didn't see any need to indulge in turf wars. Burke would ensure that they and the NYPD got credit. The Secret Service was a different proposition, and after several midnight calls between New York and D.C., it was agreed they would conduct their own investigation but would share intel. Northland is owned by a Chinese business group, the majority of whose directors are in China, Burke began crisply, addressing the large group of law enforcement officers. She had introduced the twins as consultants. No one had raised an eyebrow. Special agent in charge Sarah Burke was a fast rising star in the FBI. She had clout. She could invite anyone she wanted. The group has real estate investments, runs casinos in Las Vegas, and owns the printing plant. The FBI and the NYPD have questioned several of their officers, but we haven't got anything actionable out of them. Most of them have pleaded ignorance and have lawyered up. The few who have spoken have said they were following orders and pointed at the directors overseas. Some key staff are missing, and that's a separate investigation. The plant in Ohio is owned by a private equity company that has its base in Luxembourg. We have similar stonewalling there. Megan raised her hand and spoke when Burke pointed at her. You'll find that the Luxembourg group also has Chinese connections. Probably the same ownership as Northland, but that isn't clear yet. Werner had been active throughout the night and had made more progress than the law enforcement agencies. They had to follow procedures. Werner sneered at procedures. Thank you, we'll look into that. Burke moved on swiftly before anyone raised questions on how Megan knew. We need to find out how many more plants this group or groups have. We need to find out how much currency is already in circulation. Is there a link between the university research spying and the counterfeiting? We need to crack the 41S. She broke the task group into teams of five, allocated them pieces of work, and signaled the twins and Chong and Pazaka to follow her. She led them to a walnut-paneled office and folded her arms. What's this about the Ohio plant? She asked Megan. And where's Zeb? Zeb was visiting dojos in the city, with a printout of the ghost in hand. He was reasonably certain the ghost was highly proficient in martial arts. Those arts required practice. Practice meant dojos. He didn't go to the popular ones, he went to those where references were required. None of those had seen the ghost or had him as a member. Zeb stopped to take stock and recalibrate his thinking after visiting ten establishments and drawing a blank at each one. I don't go to the reference required dojos. I go to one which almost no one knows of. Only masters come there to practice. The ghost didn't frequent his dojo, Zeb was sure of that. He knew all the members, and he played an active role in screening new ones. There should be other such dojos. He made a few calls to his contacts in the martial arts community, got a few leads and checked out the clubs, that's what they were essentially in Chinatown. No dice. None of those had the ghost. He went to a food truck and tucked into a burger, and while he was doing so, he wondered why he hadn't gotten Werner to help him. Werner pointed out several secret dojos that he didn't know existed. They were secret for a reason in all the boroughs of the city. None of them took walk-in members. Joiners had to be referred by members who knew them very well. It was evening by the time he walked into the one in Little Manila in Woodside, Queens, his hopes fading. He had made several calls and had leaned on several people before he got the number and the address of the dojo. He had decided against calling, it was too easy to hang up mid-sentence. Visiting in person was better. He spoke to the short man at the entrance who regarded him suspiciously. White men were seen very rarely in that neighborhood and someone who had Zeb's bearing were even rarer. Rare was not good. Zeb cajoled and persuaded the man to allow him to enter, but the guard wasn't budging. Zeb then switched to Tagalog and the man's eyes widened. A white man who knew his language? The man opened the gate and led him to the inside of the dojo. It was no more than a simple hall, wooden flooring with a few practice mats. The guard took him to an inside office where the manager sat, reading through a few papers. 
not manager, he's a master, a practitioner, a teacher. Zeb recognized the man's lean build, the calluses on his fingers, and came to a swift decision. He bowed and spoke in the native language and taking a leap of faith, he revealed who he was and why he was there. The man regarded him for a few seconds and then dismissed the guard. He gestured to a wooden chair and when Zeb had seated himself, he rose and brought two cups of green tea. Why? the man asked after taking a sip. There was a TV running on mute on a shelf to the side of the desk. Zeb pointed to the news bars on its screen. He's behind that. He brought out the printout and slid it across the table to the Filipino. The master placed his cup down and nodded as if it confirmed something inside him. He is bad. I threw him out. His name is Joe. Chapter 34 More progress was made on identifying Joe when Beth got Werner to look into Pong Huang's parents, and in one of the city's obscure Chinese newspapers, in a very old online edition, the supercomputer found a faded family photograph. The image was part of several others, taken at a prominent community member's wedding. Werner discarded the rest of the pictures and ran an aging program on family portrait. It pulled up a facial recognition program and said one of the kids was likely to be Pong Huang. The other boy could be Joe. Face recog programs are not accurate and these are not ideal images, Werner typed on the screen. I thought you were a supercomputer, Beth typed back. That I am, however, I'm not a magician, came the snarky reply. You're too smart for your own good, she stuck her tongue out at the screen and looked around quickly to see if anyone had seen her. No one had. I'm smart. That should be obvious, Werner smirked and went off to chat up his Swiss girl. Zeb took the family portrait and went back to Chinatown. He met his snitches in a market stall and gave them copies of the picture. They promised to get back to him as soon as they could. Later today will be better, he urged. He went to Brooklyn, to a cell phone store which was known to be a 41S front, one of many, and waited for paying customers to leave. The Asian man behind the counter looked at him in expectation, you want phone? No. Zeb let his eyes wander, assessing threat levels. He didn't see any weapons or feel any danger. Zeb spotted a camera on the ceiling and presented his face to its lens. You want SIM card? Minutes, the store clerk queried impatiently. No. Zeb handed him the photograph and watched the clerk's face go slack in puzzlement. What's that? Who not what, Zeb corrected him. That's Joe. Give it to him. Tell him he's no longer a ghost. Joe. I don't know any Joe. We sell phones, man. Tell him, Zeb repeated and walked out of the store. Beijing man was content as he watched the news from America unfold on his screen. The rumor that the U.S. government had ordered the printing of fake currency had been swiftly squashed. However, the damage had been done. Trust in the federal government was at an all-time low, and a cynical citizenry believed the rumor. The lines outside and inside banks grew as people withdrew money from their accounts and demanded that the banks check them. There were small incidents of violence, nothing noteworthy, but they were directly linked to the counterfeiting fire fueled by social media. The dummy accounts in the internet worked overtime spewing out the same canned messages, questioning the government's denial, wondering how many more fake bills were in circulation. The stock markets had fallen a couple of basis points, the US dollar had fallen another point. Various government officials had routinely taken to coming on TV to reassure the markets and the people. It didn't seem to have any effect. Beijing man knew the FBI and NYPD and many other agencies were investigating the origins of the social media postings. They wouldn't get anywhere. The dummy accounts could be shut down, but more would open up. There were live users in different parts of the country, in fact in different parts of the world, who spent six or seven hours a day just posting and reposting. No agency could tackle that kind of organization. The U.S. law enforcement agencies had probably discovered by now that there were more than the two containers. 
Beijing man reckoned the two plants had quietly printed close to 300 million worth of bills over several years, which had been quietly put into circulation. He marveled once again at himself, at the organization that had gone into getting the counterfeiting operation up and running. When he started, he had only a vague idea of how the fake bills would fit into his master plan, the end goal wasn't clear. Nevertheless, he had gone ahead and put in resources, and as time progressed, the plan took shape. He sipped his St. George Single Malt, a Californian whiskey he had acquired a taste for when he had been studying in Yale, and put away the self-appreciation. There was more to come in the plan. He looked at a calendar on his desk. One more container was on its way to New York, almost there. It would reach its destination in a few hours. Later that night a message would go out, and an event would happen the next day. On the second day, the plan would complete. He finished his glass in a gulp, refilled it, and called Hong Kong man with more instructions. We seem to be in limbo, waiting for things to happen, Megan growled and blew hair out of her face as she rose from her screen and wandered to the hoop. She bounced the ball a few times and practiced a few shots. Beth was in the office with her, as was Zeb. Roger was lying on a couch, his hat over his face, while Bawana rattled away in the kitchen and emerged with mugs of coffee. We know who Joe is. We know the 41S is behind all this. We got all those bills, now it's just a matter of finding this Peng Huang and Joe dudes, he said as he handed out their coffee. Have you turned on your TV? Gone out and seen what's happening for yourself, she challenged him. Something more is brewing. This isn't just about counterfeiting. Ma'am, Raj and I, Bear too, were just the trigger men. We don't do any thinking, he said, and ducked the cushion that came flying his way. The container rolled to a halt inside the unloading yard in the large warehouse in Queens, just off Maspeth Avenue. The driver hopped out of his cab, stretched and yawned, and approached a bunch of men. All Chinese, he noted and didn't give it much thought. He'd picked up the load from a printing press in California which too had several Chinese folks. He gave the man in the front, a tall, lean man, his papers, and after conversing for a while, the unloading began. The warehouse people were competent and quick, and an hour later he was away, the container on the bed of another truck. Joe inspected the contents again and satisfied, got his men to seal it. The warehouse was arranged like a giant rectangle, with streets on two sides, on one of which was the entrance. The other street lined one side of the concrete structure and in the nights, doubled up as parking for other trucks and transport vehicles. On the two other sides of the building were more industrial units and warehouses. Opposite the warehouse were a couple of buildings, office complexes that had a good view to its unloading yard and across the side street were more buildings that had lines of sight to the approach street. It was a good location for what Joe had planned. He watched as one of his hoods climbed into the truck and moved the container to the side street. He parked behind a well-known courier company's truck and turned off the engine. Another truck with a container rolled into the yard. A third truck with a third container got positioned in the approach street, behind other vehicles. He gave his instructions, checked once again, and then pulled out his phone and typed, send. The message reached the NYPD the next day, through a snitch that they had cultivated over the years, an informer who had proven to be reliable over time. There's a third container reaching the city. Packed with counterfeit bills. In a 41S warehouse in Queens. Tonight. The detective who had cultivated the informer, a low-level gang member, met him and questioned him closely. The man stuck to his story. He wasn't a 41S member, but this was something he'd overheard from two hoods from the gang. The three of them, good buddies, had gone womanizing and had hit bars later. One of the hoods had been indiscreet and had spilled the news. Neither of the two thugs realized their mistake and talked of getting sober before nightfall. The snitch had made his own discreet inquiries, and found out that the 41S owned that warehouse. They used it to stock or move product, such as powder. Any specific time for this container to arrive? The detective asked. Don't know. It was to come after dark, the informer replied. The task force got the message 10 hours after Joe sent his text. The twins and Zeb received it 10 minutes later. 
Zeb and Broker spent the next hour working their phones talking to their underground network of informants spread across the city. Most of them didn't know anything about any container. A Chinese pawnbroker, who Zeb had rescued from muggers, confirmed that something big would happen in the vicinity of the Queen's warehouse. The pawnbroker sold guns to gangsters and was a trusted supplier. He had heard snatches of conversation when some 41S members thought he wasn't around. Chong and Pazaka got confirmation from their own contacts, and that was enough for Burke to take action. The task force convened just before midday. Chong, Pazaka, the twins, Zeb, and the rest of the agency operatives got together in a room with FBI agents and cops. The air was electric, everyone was expectant. We'll mount a watch in two hours, Burke brought up a map of Queens and zoomed into it till the warehouse was visible. It's owned by an oriental import firm. They bring in silk and spices from Asia and sell them to retailers. She used a laser pointer to indicate the buildings surrounding the warehouse. We're in luck. The industrial unit right across the warehouse has one floor empty. A floor that looks into the yard. She discussed positioning and teams, surveillance tactics and tools. New invisible drones would be used that could see at night. One would cover the front, another would look down into the side street, and a third would cover the buildings to the side. A couple of undercover officers would drive trucks and park them close to the warehouse and stay in them before dark. They would provide the human eyes. They would have legitimate bills of lading and delivery instructions. They would bust the operation as the container was being unloaded. She would be with Chong and Pazaka in an unmarked vehicle, the command vehicle. The meeting broke up and when the officers and agents had left, she approached the twins. You'll have to sit out this one, she said apologetically. Observers, but no active role. Sure. We understand, Megan replied promptly. Too promptly, Burke thought as she watched the sisters disappear along with Zeb. I bet they're going to take a hand. It's not like them to play the audience. Chapter 35 The tall, African-American trucker hopped out of his vehicle at about 3 p.m. that afternoon and surveyed the street he was on. He had come up Maspeth Avenue carrying a load for a plastic container manufacturer, but clearly he was lost. His GPS had died on him, and his frantic calls to the shipper went unanswered. He spotted a warehouse in which he could detect a lot of activity and headed over to its entrance. Maybe they could direct him. He walked loosely, casually, the red shirt with black checks billowing around him, exposing the black tee he wore underneath, revealing the strong upper body build. His arms were tattooed, and his face had more ink just below his left eye. Say, he hailed a smoker who was lounging against the warehouse, puffing away contentedly. Are you guys Queen's Plastics? The smoker spat and shook his head. Wrong address, dude. This is Oriental Import and Export. Which street are you looking for? 59th place and 56th road. The smoker stubbed out his smoke and gestured at the driver who handed over a bunch of papers. The address is right, but you've got the wrong name. What are you carrying? Plastic sheets. A heck of a lot of them. The African-American sighed gloomily and took his papers back. I was thinking of making a quick getaway today. Ain't going to happen, is it? I get saddled with the wrong address. He thanked the smoker, started back, and turned as if he'd remembered something. Hey, have you heard of them? Are they close by? The smoker laughed. Dude, there must be hundreds of businesses in this neighborhood. I don't know all of them. The driver waved in understanding and headed back to his truck, cursing all the while. About ten people inside, maybe twelve. Hard to make out through the dimness, Megan spoke in Bawana's ear. Three cameras at the front, all facing the yard. Electric gates don't seem to see any other alarms. Bawana, the driver, continued swearing without breaking a stride. There could be eyes on him, his cover had to be maintained. He stopped on the approach street and made a show of stopping passers-by and showing them the address. All of them shook their heads. He wasn't surprised. Such a business didn't exist in that neighborhood. 
The twins had come up with the idea of a surveillance run shortly after they had left Federal Plaza. Zeb had readily agreed since he was thinking on the same lines. He had already decided they would play a role in the bust, that of very interested spectators. That didn't mean they would be sitting on the couches in their office, they would be on the scene, ready to intervene if necessary. Being interested spectators meant they had to get a lay of the land, and hence the surveillance run. Bawana volunteered to be the trucker and got his arms and face inked with washable paint. The red shirt came from a wardrobe in their office that had several custom outfits. The buttons in the shirt had nano cameras that were wirelessly connected to a storage unit in the back of the truck. The back of the truck had various gadgets that set up the Wi-Fi network and recorded the feeds. It also had the twins who were seated at two consoles, their eyes and fingers moving continually, watching the images from the cameras. Broker was in their office, monitoring everything, keeping the lines open with the FBI and the NYPD. The truck had been arranged by the sisters and broker, who once had told Zeb he could procure an aircraft carrier within a few miles off the shores of Manhattan. Zeb hadn't taken him up on it, he believed his friend. Zeb and Roger had driven box trucks past the warehouse a couple of times and had conducted their own eyes on. Their trucks had been fitted with cameras too, and Roger's had a drone in it that would go up once night set in. Bawana drove his truck to the approach street and eased into a vacant slot, parking between two Peterbilts. He sat in his cab awaiting a signal from the twins, who were monitoring the traffic around the truck through several cameras. Now, Megan whispered, and with that he exited swiftly, checked that there were no curious eyes on him, and changed the front plate. He went to the rear and screwed in a new plate over the existing one. He went back to the cab and pressed a button, and panels on the sides and top of the truck revolved instantly, and the previously green truck with brand markings of a non-existent shipper was replaced with the logo of a well-known national carrier. He removed his shirt, put on an armored vest, covered it with a black combat shirt, and washed away the tats from his arms and face. He waited for the night to set in, and when it was dark enough for his purpose, grabbed a long canvas bag and set out to one of the industrial units to the side of the warehouse. He vaulted over a chain-link fence and ran between parked cars, keeping well away from surveillance cameras. He reached an emergency exit, forced it open with a lever from his bag, and climbed the stairs swiftly, quietly. Seven stories later, he was on its roof. Fifteen minutes later, he was settled with his Macmillan TAC 338 on its bipod, its Leupold Mark IV scope snug against his eye, the unloading yard and the rear of the warehouse clearly visible. Ready, he spoke in his throat mic and got acknowledgments from the twins Zeb and Roger. Roger was on the roof of a unit opposite the yard, with his sniper rifle. Zeb was in his box truck within a stone's throw of the yard, a lurid magazine and the wrapper of a taco to support his cover if anyone was curious. The buildings had been reconned by the twins, who had identified the shooting points and the modes of entry. The equipment came from their store in the office. All of them, including the twins, were outfitted for combat. The waiting commenced. Zeb had reclined his seat as far as it could go and lay relaxed with his eyes half-closed. A screen rested on his belly and showed images from the NYPD's drones. He knew the cops and FBI agents had filtered in and were in position. He didn't try to identify them, his focus was on the yard. He had looked hard at the images and video feeds, Roger, Bawana, and he had gathered, trying to make out Joe. Joe wasn't to be seen doesn't surprise me. He wouldn't be so careless. Dark came, but traffic in the industrial units didn't ease. Shipments had to be made, goods had to be received, and shifts had to be operated. Trucks entered the warehouse, and each time they did, a flurry of activity ensued. Cranes came to life, and people rushed out of its dark maw and unloaded or loaded the vehicles. He could almost sense the watching law enforcement officers lean forward in dry excitement each time a vehicle rolled in the yard. Each time, the vehicles unloaded innocuous contents. Cables one time, wooden pallets another time, machinery a third time. They rent out the warehouse to other shippers too. 
It's not just silk and spices that they deal in, Beth clarified as if reading his mind. Sarah called Broker to check where we were. He said we were around. She wanted to know where. He didn't say, and told her we wouldn't get in her way. I bet she wasn't too happy with that answer, Roger drawled in their ears. Bawana, you awake? Yeah, came the answering rumble. I will fall asleep though if you keep talking. Zeb emerged from his box truck at 11 p.m. He kept to the shadows, and using the parked vehicles as cover, walked as if he belonged, on the sidewalk opposite the front of the yard. He crouched behind the wheel well of an empty truck, and peered cautiously. Beth and Megan had launched their drone the previous hour and it flew soundlessly, high above, its cameras watching. It hadn't picked up anything concerning. The yard was brightly lit, and had a few men rolling what looked like barrels. They were in vests and loose trousers, gloves on their hands that moved in a blur on the cylindrical shapes. One of them said something that made all of them laugh. A shoulder was clapped, and they retreated inside the building once their job was done. Feels normal. Too normal? Zeb settled on his haunches for a long wait, his Glock within easy reach. The hour changed and a new day started. Nothing much changed at the warehouse. Another hour went by with Roger cracking a joke. Just to check if you folks are around, he said. Megan gave him the verbal equivalent of the middle finger and asked him to pipe down. Zeb tensed when an engine sounded in the distance and lights outlined the shapes of still vehicles. Two beams emerged from the approach street and the growl became louder as the vehicle came into view. A truck. With a container. This could be it, Megan spoke his thoughts. The vehicle turned smoothly into the yard and the warehouse sprang to life. More floodlights turned on and seven men rushed out from its interior. They gathered around the now-stopped vehicle and talked to the driver. He climbed down from its cab and answered their questions. An argument seemed to ensue, with the workers gesticulating furiously and the driver shaking his head in denial. He threw up his hands finally and stomped to the rear. He climbed onto the truck's bed and fiddled with the ceiling on the container and flung it open. Wide open, so that even onlookers from a distance could see right inside. See the shiny blocks of plastic on pallets. Bales. Something tingled in Zeb's spine but before he could analyze it, searchlights suddenly came on and threw the men in the yard in sharp relief. FBI. Don't move. A loudspeaker sounded, and armed officers burst from buildings and trucks. They raced to the yard, their weapons trained and ready. A chopper came out of nowhere and hovered over the brightly lit yard. The loudspeaker yelled out more instructions that were complied with by the men in the yard. They raised their hands in the air and squinted in the bright light as the first of the officers reached them. There's Burke. Zeb made out her shape her ponytail bobbing as she ran with two men, racing to the container. The tingling in his spine became more urgent, the beast rousing and growling. He looked up and down the street, and then his gaze narrowed as he took in another vehicle. The courier truck. It was moving, its headlamps turned off, side panels opening. Zeb was moving even before he shouted his warning. It's a trap. He crossed the street in three strides, saw men jump off the truck through the corners of his eyes, and then they were behind him. The last image he had of them was of metallic objects in their hands. Assault rifles. Burke, he yelled again, his legs pumping, his glock becoming an extension of his right arm. She turned. Down. It's a trap, he roared. He was close enough to see her eyes widen and her mouth open. He crashed into her, kicked out with his legs, and felled the two men with her. He rolled, carrying her with him, desperately away from the bright lights. Just in time. A burst of fire laced through the air where she had been standing. Chapter 36 Zeb and Bert crawled swiftly to the side of the yard where there was cover, provided by stacks of pallets and the body of a crane. The firefight raged on behind them, with very few rounds coming their way. I'm okay, Bert panted when she felt Zeb's searching glance. Her knuckles were white, as she gripped a railing on the crane and peered cautiously around at the firefight that was raging heavily. 
Sarah? Zeb, have you seen Sarah? Broker's urgent voice came through his earpiece. She's unharmed. Scratched, Zeb replied when he spotted the trickle of blood on her forehead. Not by a round. What about you? Zeb didn't get time to reply. A head peeped around a truck about 30 feet away, and a rifle barrel started rising in their direction. Zeb slammed Burke to the ground and fired instinctively. His round pinged off the side of the truck, and the head and the weapon disappeared. Bawana, Roger, we need cover. Dang it, I am providing cover, the Texan replied in an injured tone. That critter got away from me somehow. There's a safe channel behind that truck and pass more crates. No hostels there. They're all pinned down in the yard. That route will lead you to the entrance where agents are waiting. Zeb peered behind them. There was what looked like a route that snaked through equipment and disappeared in the dark where the floodlights didn't reach. They would have to climb over dense coils of plastic sheets, and for a second or so, they would be exposed to the yard. Their legs and lower parts of their bodies would be vulnerable as they ran behind the crane. It's not like we have any other option. The hoods will come to the truck seeking cover and will spot us. We'll be outnumbered. On the count of three, he breathed. One, he grabbed Burke's arm and brought her to his left. Two, he silently requested Burke's Glock and holstered it under his left shoulder. Three, they ran, the volume of firing increasing dramatically as he blindly aimed his Glock at the yard, squeezing, and just before they reached the coils, he switched handguns in a move untrained eyes would be astonished at. Burke's left foot on one coil. His hand under her butt shoving her up his body covering her, his gun tracking his eyes, his mind assessing danger, looking at the yard from a different angle, subconsciously counting rounds. Bodies in the yard. Some law enforcement officers. Many hoods. More than the seven that had turned up initially. Most of the fighting was by gangsters behind whatever cover they had. A tall shadow flickered past the mouth of the warehouse, clearly visible under the lights, easily evading the seeking bullets. Is that Joe? Zeb didn't get time to answer his own question when a few bullets sang over their heads and hastened their run. Burke landed on the other side, he followed, shoved her forward, the two of them bending low, covering distance swiftly. Over here, a voice called out urgently. Zeb's Glock snapped up and lowered fractionally when he saw FBI, stenciled on the man's jacket. Burke went into a bunch of officers and the last he heard from her was her question, Kowalski? And a sigh of relief when someone answered, he's fine. Zeb left the group of law enforcement officers before anyone could question his presence, wove behind parked vehicles and ran down the approach street in the direction the courier truck was pointing. The truck was empty, a few bodies still lying near it. The FBI and the cops had been taken by surprise but superior training and numbers had won, and all that was left was the cleanup. Cleanup in progress, Megan confirmed. Citrep. I'll be packing up and disappearing as soon as I get the all clear, Bawana replied, and Roger echoed him. They would leave as quietly as they came, and Zeb would plead ignorance if anyone questioned him about the mysterious shooters on rooftops. Zeb? I'm going to the back. He turned a corner the layout of the warehouse imprinted on his mind. One more side to go, before the rear came up. The rear had an exit. ZB, don't engage. Don't enter, Megan shouted in his ear, making him wince. Bawana, watch the rear, he spoke over her yell. Watch for what, well I'll be. Our ghost just stepped out. He looked in my direction as if he knows I'm here. Want me to take him out? I can plink him. No. Is he alone? Yeah. Walking as if it's a midnight stroll. Hold on. He's moving faster now, Bawana paused. He's entered another unit, fifteen doors from the warehouse. Other end of the street. Brown structure. White windows. I've lost him. Zeb turned the corner and could see the empty street and for a moment wondered why the FBI or the cops hadn't covered it. The ambush sucked most of them away. Probably a couple of vehicles at the end of the street, but too far to take any action. 
He crossed the street and walked swiftly, ready, not wishing to draw friendly fire. He reached the rear of the warehouse and halted when an idea struck him. The rear had giant sliding doors that were now shut. He cast his eyes around on the ground, seeking anything that could be of help. A dark smudge on the sidewalk caught his attention. It turned out to be a long strip of rubber, part of a tire. The remainder of the tire was propped up against a rusted hydrant. What the heck are you doing? Bawana queried in surprise. What's he doing? Beth and Megan called out angrily. Zeb didn't reply. He went to the sliding doors, cut the tire into smaller pieces and jammed them against the rollers. He tried the doors they held. Telberk rear escape is disabled. Temporarily. Ask her to send bodies to cover this street. I planked a couple who were trying to escape, Bawana added helpfully. They were sitting targets. I could have shot with my eyes shut. No one tried after that. Except this dude Joe. There was no trace of modesty in Bawana's voice. It wasn't his strong suit. Zeb counted the doors and reached the one Bawana had indicated. It seemed to be another industrial unit, silent and dark in the night, unconcerned about the firefight in the warehouse opposite. Zeb walked the length of the street and ducked behind a vehicle when he saw movement in a cruiser. Cops have that end covered. There could be a rear exit in that building from which Joe could escape. Only one way to find out. He reloaded his Glock and went back to the door. A second to ready himself, another to jerk it open and dart inside and roll away. Dark. That was his first impression. Empty was his second. Smells of machinery and oil. He strained his ears to hear any movement, his eyes as wide as they could go, his body as low as it could get. Nothing registered. He's like me. He can control his body and turn off his presence. A faint sound came from somewhere ahead of him. It felt like the brush of fabric against something. That has to be deliberate. Guns aren't necessary. The voice was soft but sounded loud in the quiet night. It spoke in Mandarin. He knows about me. Knows I speak the language. Wants me to know that he knows. A light came on and illuminated the center of the room Zeb was in. It had several machines that he didn't recognize, organized in neat lines, chairs behind each of them. Beneath the light was an open space, about 15 feet by 20. The floor was concrete, its surface scuffed by markings, human and machine-made. Zeb looked around the cone of light and still didn't spot Joe, till he was suddenly there as if by magic. He was dressed in loose gray tracksuit trousers and a thin white t-shirt. His hands were empty, his eyes were dark hollows. No guns, he repeated, and Zeb understood what he meant. Only one of them would step out alive. Chapter 37 I have a gun. You don't. I take you into custody. End of matter. Joe's expression didn't change. He came closer to the edge of the light, letting it bathe his face and body, and for the first time Zeb saw him up close. Joe's face was scarred from hundreds of fights. His eyebrows were uneven, his forehead had a faded mark as if it had been stitched once. Zeb lowered his eyes to the man's hands. Joe raised his palms and displayed long lean fingers, callous palms and hard edges. This is you, the beast whispered. You can kill me, but you will know no honor, Joe replied, his eyes glittering. I know you. You are like me. We're different. Totally. You are a killer for Peng Huang. You are a gangster. And you? You're not a killer? You don't kill for others? I kill for my country. And I kill for my gang. Zeb broke the stair first and raised his glock. You'll get a fair trial. Which is much more than what you gave to those you killed. We fight, Joe insisted. One of us lives. I have a gun. You don't. You have a gun. But a gun is not everything. There was twenty feet between the two men. Zeb's glock was pointed at Joe's chest. 
his round would exit his barrel at 2,500 feet a second. Human reaction wasn't fast enough to escape it. However, Joe would read his eyes, the infinitesimal muscle movement that no human could control. He would act even before trigger pull. He could escape. It could be done. Zeb had done it. Once I'm gone, you'll never find me. I'll come out of nowhere and kill the sisters. I'll take out your men. Zeb believed Joe. That day in Central Park, he allowed me to spot him. He threw his gun away, shed his jacket and the armored vest. He reached down to his thigh and unstrapped his knife and laid it on the pile. He folded his belt and removed his shoes and stowed them away. Can we do this? the beast asked. We'll see. Joe touched his ear and jerked his head at Zeb. Tell them. No interruptions. Zeb told Megan and cut her off mid-protest. He added his earpiece and throat mic to the pile and came to the edge of the lighted area. I knew you would come, Joe said softly, his face alight in anticipation. He stood motionless, with none of the circling or the fainting that Hollywood portrayed. The highest exponents of the martial arts knew about conserving energy and providing minimal openings. I followed you for a long time, you didn't even know. Zeb tried to place his accent. It wasn't a Beijing or a Hong Kong one. It was from somewhere in the interior. Inner Mongolia, he guessed. Is that where you are from? Joe couldn't control the astonishment in his eyes. You know China, he acknowledged respectfully. I don't know where I'm from. My parents were drifters. They said they spent a lot of time in Inner Mongolia, but who knows? He attacked in a blinding move, a high kick that caught Zeb unaware and forced him to retreat hastily. The kick would have broken the neck of a standing man. It felt like a block of concrete when it landed on Zeb's left shoulder. His arm turned numb and then ice as he staggered back, taking deep breaths, readying for the next wave of attacks. They didn't come. Joe was where he was before the kick, watching Zeb curiously. There's enough time. Breathe deeply. Let oxygen flood you. Oxygen is life. It heals. It clears the mind. Remove the cobwebs, then face me. Zeb did as he was told, mechanically, still in shock at the speed of the attack and the lack of warning. Not lack of warning. My inability to read him. He searched desperately for something to even the balance, anything to reduce Joe to his state. Why work with Peng Huan? You came to his country as a boy. You could be anything. Why work in a gang? Peng Huang is family. Joe struck, a series of crippling blows that Zeb recognized as a mix of Sambo and Wing Chun moves. He parried them, again astonished by the sheer power behind them. He was forced to go on the defense as Joe's hands aimed for his throat, his belly, and his groin. He made me, Joe spoke conversationally as if he was at a dining table. I kill for him. I would die for him. You're like that. You're like me. Yes. I would die for my friends. Death has no meaning for me. That knowledge made Zeb pause, and in the time it took for a swallow to beat its wings, Joe punched his throat. A tortured groan slipped from him and he fell on his back, desperately sucking air, shaking his head to clear the blind spots in his eyes. Joe didn't follow up. He had returned to his position and had that same curious look in his eyes. Where are you? Zeb called out to the beast after he had gained some semblance of strength. The beast didn't answer. Zeb rose slowly and stood with his head bowed. His left arm was almost useless. Almost but not quite. His breathing was unsteady. That icy feeling in him, it was fear. An emotion he hadn't felt in years, in decades. It isn't death I fear. It is dying like this, and with that a deep rage possessed him, spurred him to attack and brought down a red mist. Thrusts Perry's finger locks and wrist holds. The moves came instinctively from the various disciplines he had learned. Joe broke each hold, countered each blow. Zeb landed a few, but even those felt like raining blows on concrete. Zeb stepped back, breathing harshly through split lips, 
as he wiped away a trickle of blood from his face. Joe was still again, not even breathing hard, the thin film of perspiration on his body making him glow. Get back your control, Zeb breathed deeply. You're afraid of me, he said, borrowing his opponent's tactics. You could have walked away, but you had to fight. You say I'm like you. You're scared I'm so like you that I'm better. Joe came low, twisting his body like an eel, and mounted a ferocious attack of kicks and punches, drawing back after each thrust, not providing an opening to Zeb. Zeb caught an iron-hard arm once and attempted to lock it, but sweat made him slip. It made him lose balance, and that was all that Joe needed. With a dizzying series of feints and eagle strikes and knuckle punches, he pushed Zeb to the edge of the cone of light till Zeb was backed up against a machine, warding off blows. Zeb dropped to the hard concrete and felt Joe's arms whistle past above him. He elbowed his opponent in a thigh as hard as the trunk of a tree, and got a grunt in response. He moved out, ducked an upcoming knee and caught his arms around it. At last, a lock. He pivoted about a bent knee, and heaved and flung Joe in a move taught to him by an Indonesian man who was so old, his skin was translucent. Joe landed like a cat, and came at him without any recovery. Zeb was half rising, when a wicked spinning kick made him duck. He went after the swinging leg, and that was his mistake. His body was exposed momentarily, and his hands were too far to defend himself from the fleshy part of Joe's palm. It slammed into his ribs and cracked one. The palm didn't retreat, it curled with the knuckles out thrust and grabbed his throat and squeezed. Zeb went into the move, willing his body to take the punishment, and snapped quick blows to Joe's head. Joe rocked with them, but his hold didn't let up. His left hand kept hammering Zeb's side, while the rest of his body absorbed Zeb's counterattack. Zeb felt it coming. A rising. A burst of energy that seemed to flow through Joe, and gave him the ability to move against Zeb's attacks. Zeb felt himself gripped around the waist, the lock on his throat unchanging, he got lifted by Joe who spun around and threw him to the floor. Zeb slammed on the ground, his breath rushing out of him in a gasp. His head bounced once. Break lock, his mind screamed. He couldn't. He was on his left side, his left hand crushed underneath him, his left leg feeling paralyzed. Joe had twisted around him like a snake, like a lover, and had one elbow on his neck squeezing, while his right hand was digging into Zeb's abdomen as if ripping into the flesh. Zeb knew the move. Not many exponents knew it. He also knew how to break it. The same Indonesian had taught him. He couldn't move, however. The attacker's weight was like bags of sand on him. Joe's legs had twisted around him, keeping him immobile. All he could feel was the elbow crushing his life away. All he could hear was Joe crooning, you are like me but not as good as me. He thought he blacked out for a moment, but he wasn't sure. Time didn't seem to have any meaning. His body drew tortured breaths. Diminishing breaths. His eyes swam in a gray and black fog. On his cheeks he felt his attacker's steady breathing, and chant. You are like me. Only one of us should live. You are not living. You are existing. Zeb he tried to grasp any semblance of reality. That wasn't the voice of the attacker. That was a voice in his mind, a voice he knew well. You have walked mountains. You have crossed deserts. You have sailed oceans. That is not living. It is escape. You are fleeing your guilt. You are torturing yourself, wanting forgiveness. You know they forgave you a long time back. You don't want to accept it. Through the fog, Zeb thought he could make out a head full of white wispy hair, a face so full of wrinkles that they nearly covered the eyes. Those eyes were still full of life even at that age. Zeb had never bested that body, despite its years of living. Turn back. Face yourself. Know yourself. Except that you can't control everything. You are like me, came another voice and Zeb turned confused eyes at the Indonesian master. The master's eyes twinkled with rare mirth. Really? And with that Zeb's blood yipped. It was the beast. Zeb didn't know what the beast was. It felt like a living creature and was with him when it mattered. He didn't want to know any more. 
Only one of us can live. The beast roared, racing through arteries and veins, drawing on all available air, turning it into energy, directing it to limbs and particularly to the left shoulder. Zeb twisted minutely beneath Joe and with a sudden downward thrust, dislocated his own shoulder. A cry escaped him involuntarily, but his eyes were alert through the blinding agony that sped through him. Joe's elbow on his neck slipped. A deep breath to draw sweet oxygen. The beast grew powerful. It drew Zeb's right arm from underneath Joe's leaden weight. Just pulled it free as if the weight was nothing. It cocked the arm and Zeb's elbow slammed back in Joe's face, right between his eyes. The Chinese man fell back and Zeb swung on top of him instantly. Zeb twisted his legs through the attackers, willing his left leg to obey commands. His right hand curled into a seldom-used strike and dislocated Joe's shoulder. Joe hissed and sweat broke out on his forehead. He tried to rise. Zeb broke a rib. Joe kicked out with his legs. Zeb's able hand balled into a fist and piled into his abdomen. Zeb applied the same hold, the same locks, the same weight that Joe had applied on him, and held the attacker immobile. He applied his right elbow to Joe's neck and squeezed like a vice. I'm not like you, he whispered, and watched a drop of sweat fall off his face and mingle with Joe's perspiration. Zeb dragged himself off Joe's body and crawled the length of the room and leaned against a wall in the darkness. His throat was raw, his shoulder burned, his left leg twitched uncontrollably, and his ribs felt like there was a spear inside him. He breathed loudly with his mouth open and shifted to get more comfortable. The fight had felt like it had gone on for hours, but the rational part of him that had come back to life said it was no more than half an hour. His crushing Joe had felt like several minutes. Two minutes at the most, rational Zeb countered. The beast had disappeared and his blood flowed swiftly and strongly, his heart pumped and his lungs cleansed. Zeb sat for a few more minutes waiting for the outside world to intrude. When it did, he heard nothing. There was a deep silence outside, as if the knight had been watching the combat. He lowered a hand to the floor and rose unsteadily. He leaned against the wall for support and waited for the dizziness to subside. He staggered to his belongings and donned them slowly. The earpiece went in last and it came to life when he whispered, Anyone there? We're all here, Megan responded swiftly, concern in her voice. Bawana and Roger are here. He knew what she wasn't saying. His friends were waiting, they would tear down the concrete structure, raise it to rubble and dust, if anything had happened to Zeb. I'm okay. He moved slowly in the dark, past the cone of light, and approached the door. Just before he reached it, blue eyes came to his mind. Golden hair and a glorious smile. You almost believed him, didn't you? That you were like him. The smile turned into a warm, rich laugh that felt like sunflowers and light. You have friends ready to tear down walls. Who does he have with him? Doesn't that say something? His friends were waiting when he opened the door. Strong hands, Bawana and Rogers, grabbed him when he swayed. Two pairs of green eyes went wide when they took him in. No one spoke as they hurried him to a waiting vehicle. Megan flicked a glance at the unit through which the cone of light and the body could be seen. She cleared her throat and found her voice. It had the faintest tremor in it. What about Joe? He's in there, Zeb replied. Alive? Alive, but Joe's killing days were over. Chapter 38 The night sky was streaked with flecks of gold, announcing the fast-approaching day by the time the gang had been subdued and the warehouse was in the control of law enforcement. The FBI had one critically injured agent, and the NYPD had four casualties. There was grimness on every person's face as the cleanup reached its final stages. The 41S bodies had been carried away, and those alive had been arrested. Media vans and choppers had arrived at the scene and had commenced live relays. Reporters crowded at the barrier erected by the police and shouted questions. Burke was a visible presence as she went about directing the operations. Pazaka and Chong worked with their team swiftly and efficiently. Each container in the warehouse was opened and its contents recorded. One container had counterfeit bills. Thousands of them. 
The vicinity of the warehouse was searched and a box truck was found, filled with shoeboxes with more bills. Millions, a reporter's mic caught a police officer murmuring under his breath. Millions of counterfeit bills found in Queen's warehouse, banners screamed on thousands of TVs around the country. The social media accounts burst into action and whipped up frenzy. Billions of fake bills in circulation. Government lying. Hashtag your money is worthless. Burke gave a bland statement confirming the haul and said she had nothing more to add. The investigation was ongoing. She praised the injured officers and agents and called them heroes. Her statement was picked up and ran worldwide. The Department of Treasury spokesman called a press conference and condemned the social media storm. There was no proof that there were billions of counterfeit bills out there, he said. No one believed him. No one believed the federal government. Online retailers reported a surge in the sales of counterfeit detection kits. Bank officials in several small towns were surrounded by angry townspeople who felt they had been cheated by the system. The business newspapers reported loss in confidence in the currency system and predicted that the stock markets would open several points down. The U.S. dollar took more beating and was at one of its historic lows. Megan and Beth walked slowly, matching their pace to Zeb's, as they accompanied him to their favorite watering hole next to their office several hours later. Zeb had been attended to by a doctor the agency employed in the very early hours of the morning. The doctor had taken one look at her patient and had sighed through pursued lips. The patient was a frequent visitor and left each time after making empty promises of looking after himself. A broken rib that didn't pierce your lung. Thank the Lord for that. A shoulder that was dislocated but is now back in position. She jabbed it with a forefinger and her lips curled at Zeb's wince. You should have thought of that before doing whatever you did. She recited the litany of injuries, most of which were superficial. The muscle and ligament tears would take more time to heal. She strapped his chest so tight that it hurt and jabbed a needle in him. Have you heard of taking it easy? R&R? Beaches and a drink? It isn't what you think, ma'am, Zeb said solemnly, his wits back. The twins, they took turns kicking me. A snort of disbelief escaped her as she wrote out a list of prescriptions. There's nothing that needs surgery. You need sleep, rest, and all those medications, she thrust the slip at him, knowing it would find its way in a trash can the moment he hit the street. This is the sixth time you've visited me this year, she said as he was leaving. If you want a date, why don't you ask outright? Zeb had slept like a log when the twins drove him to their office, and had awakened only when Beth had accidentally dropped her mug of coffee. He raised himself from the couch and limped to the shower where alternating bursts of hot and cold brought back a semblance of life. Coffee, strong and hot, sparked his vitals and he started feeling better. The limp would remain for days, the rib would take as much as that to heal. Ligaments would heal since he had the constitution of an ox the doctor had commented sardonically. Beth brought him up to speed when he'd finished his brew, her eyes bright, her face triumphant. The 41S is finished. All but Peng Huang are in custody. Some of them have unloaded everything that they know. The fake bills were to pay for buying drugs. The whole plan was drugs-related. They had come across a forger in China who was a master in producing fake yuan. Peng Huang saw the potential, buy drugs with fake bills. They got him to make plates for their bills, acquired the plants in three states, took them over and here we are. That required a lot of planning. A lot of time. Years of it, Beth nodded. The initial batch of plates were bad, they had to restart. Your guy Joe killed a few employees to get others to cooperate. It took time, but Peng Huang wasn't in any hurry. Zeb turned it over his mind, looking for holes. It sounded plausible. The spying? That has the smell of their government. An outsourced job to them. Only Peng Huang knows the details, and he isn't around. The State Department has gotten involved, and they have raised the matter with China. They're strongly denying involvement in any spying. They would, wouldn't they? Joe. Isn't talking. 
Sarah wanted to know what you'd done to him. I told her you and he had a discussion, a mature one, Megan interjected, her voice drier than a desert. All that stuff, he pointed to the TV which had the screaming, rolling banners. Nothing to do with the gang, apparently. Stock markets and the dollar have taken a beating, but Sarah says they'll recover. There's a separate investigation going on into those social media accounts, but she'll handle that on her own. Doesn't need us. The TV screen cut to a video of Burke talking to reporters. It changed to show Pazaka all dressed up at 4 a.m. in the morning, speaking seriously to the press. You'll get another book deal out of this, Beth laughed cynically. Bawana and Roger? They're in their apartments. Bawana said looking after your ass wasn't any fun. Boring. Bear and Chloe Sarah asked them to stand down. She's got her agents in place. Brokers with her? Yeah, where else? Beth approached him and gave him her arm as she led him to the elevator. Let's get some food in you and then back to bed. Zeb seated himself at a corner table, his back to the wall, while the sisters went to the counter to place their orders. He stretched out his legs gingerly, feeling like he'd been run over by a truck. An elderly lady glanced at him and clicked her tongue in sympathy. Old age, honey. Happens to all of us. Yes, ma'am. A newspaper rustled. A suit reading the day's business sheets on the neighboring table. He didn't want to be disturbed. Morning coffee and stock market performance and corporate news were his escape. The sisters returned with mugs and a plate full of cookies. Our part is done, Beth spoke with her mouth full, swallowed and continued. Sarah said we should drop into Federal Plaza sometime today and tie up the loose ends, but our role is finished. She glanced at Megan who was tracing circles on the table with her spoon and quirked her eyebrow at Zeb. He shrugged. He'd no clue. She needs a boyfriend, Beth mouthed. I heard that. I can take care of my love life, thanks. The sister spoke. The newspaper rustled again, and the suit glared at them above its edges. Couldn't a stockbroker get any quiet? His eyes disappeared when Zeb looked at him, and he got the quiet he wanted. Beth rolled her eyes and grabbed the last cookie before Zeb could. She broke it in two and offered a piece, the smaller portion, to Zeb. Megan was still silent, and when she turned to her sister, she saw the familiar expression on her twin's face. A floating thought, a connection had just struck Megan. Megan couldn't turn away from the suit's newspaper, which was angled just right for her to read the front page. The headlines were all about the counterfeit scandal, however, below the main article was another report. Chinese fund poised to close largest semiconductor deal today. Chinese government-backed fund is likely to take significant stakes in three semiconductor companies today. Historic day with three M&A deals to go in favor of fund within hours of one another. Total deal value in excess of $150 billion. One of the largest M&A combined transactions. The country's name was what had drawn her attention in the first place. Government was the second word. What if, she began thinking and trailed off when Suit turned down Zeb angrily when her friend asked him for the front page. Megan's sister tried, requesting him politely, smiling widely and sweetly at the Suit, who immediately melted and handed over the cover page to her. He crackled the remaining pages and glared at Zeb. You need to learn some manners, he seemed to suggest. Beth cleared their table and spread the page for them to read. The Chinese state-backed fund had been wooing the three semiconductor companies for years, it stated. All three were in California, Moda was listed on the Nasdaq, the two others were privately held. The fund had appeared to fend off an American suitor and a Japanese one. Moda, the largest of the courted companies, was due to have its board meeting at 3 p.m. that day. It was expected the board would green light the Chinese offer. The other two companies had similar board meetings an hour later, and similar outcomes were expected. The fund was expected to get CFIUS approval. It had done its homework and had presented several proposals to the agency to mitigate any national security concerns it might have. It was rumored that the proposals had been received well. CFIUS, 
the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, was an all-powerful interagency committee chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury. It had members from Defense, State, Commerce, Homeland Security, and many others. CFIUS could approve transactions or could recommend that the President block an acquisition if the agency believed the acquisition was against national security interests. Megan skipped over details of how the agency worked and read the rest of the report rapidly. The transactions would be all cash, with the majority of funds coming from the acquirer's country, if the acquirer was a foreign company. The technology of the three companies was widely used in general computing applications, however, MODIS chips were used in avionics and robotics as well. Megan paused from reading and searched her memory for a distant recollection. I've heard of MODA before. In which context? She leaned back and let Beth take the newspaper from her as she racked her brains, trying to remember. No memory came, and she looked around the coffee store in frustration, as if hoping inspiration would strike. A barista looked at her and nodded in acknowledgement when she indicated a second serving of their drinks. A couple was seated in a corner, whispering sweet nothings. A few students were poring over books and writing in notepads. She thanked their server absent-mindedly, not paying much attention to Beth and Zeb, who were conversing softly. She froze in mid-swallow when the memory came back. Letwoski. He mentioned Moda. They were interested in the research, even though it was commissioned by the DOD. The research would fit in with their chip development. With that came another sickening thought, one that made her draw closer to Beth and Zeb and flag their attention. What if those bills were meant to be found? Chapter 39 That would mean all these posts the tweets they were organized. A deliberate attempt to bring the stock markets and the dollar down, Beth emptied her mug and toyed with it as she followed her sister's train of thought. Why? Megan turned the newspaper around to her, in answer. Beth's face paled when she read the headlines again, and the implications sank in. Foreign exchange market manipulation. To get the lowest rate when they transferred their funds. A few percentage points in their favor would mean millions of savings to them. Enough to offset the cost of the operation, Megan elaborated. This is big. The 41S they were just pawns if you're right. Zeb rose abruptly silencing any more discussion. Let's go. This is way above Burke. The right people need to hear your idea. Someone high up in their government would own this plan, Beth mumbled as she ran search queries on her screen, back in their office. That could be anyone, Megan brought up photographs of various Chinese ministers, many of who had been educated in the U.S. Some had doctorates, some had specialized in economics. They need not be from the government. It could be a rogue minister, or one of their secretive intelligence agencies. Trying to find out who's responsible will be near impossible. We don't need to know who, Zeb corrected her from behind. We only need to stop the deals from happening. When are those board meetings? Mood is the first one at 3 p.m. Their eyes involuntarily swung towards the wall clock. It was just past 1 p.m. Zeb, the woman in Washington, D.C. acknowledged his call. No, hello. No, how are you doing? Claire didn't believe in meaningless exchanges. Neither did Zeb, which was one reason he was her lead agent. There are three semiconductor companies in California that will. I know about them. You need to stop those transactions. Why? Zeb signaled to Megan who came forward and explained swiftly and succinctly. They heard keys click at Claire's end as Megan outlined her thinking, mentioned names and events, and how her theory fit. You've no proof. This is just supposition. Yes, ma'am. They fell silent, waiting for one of the most powerful people in the country to kick the tires on Megan's theory. The clicking stopped and a chair creaked over the line. You could be wrong. That's possible, ma'am. However, I haven't been wrong often she countered cheekily. There was a smile in Claire's voice when she replied. Stand by. Shang Dingshang, Minister of Commerce, Beijing Man, 
had guests with him in his sumptuous home in a highly secluded neighborhood in the city. It was nearing 3 a.m., however this was a party thrown by the Minister of Commerce and one didn't leave, however late the hour was. TVs played silently all over the marbled lounge through which uniformed servers drifted, carrying trays of champagne and canapes. It wasn't exactly the kind of party the government approved, but no one dared to question Shang Dingshang. He was the star of the Communist Party and was destined for positions higher than his current one. He was genius smart, wily and ruthless, and had a meteoric rise in government. He had joined the Department of Commerce immediately after his return from the U.S., and his knowledge of that country, his grasp of economics and his political maneuvering, had resulted in his heading the ministry in ten years. Today was the glorious culmination of his grand plan, he exulted silently and toasted the defense minister, a general, who knew of the plan. Chinese companies and funds had bought several American companies in the past. However, no one ever had bought a company at what was effectively a hugely significant discount. No one had temporarily destabilized the U.S. markets at the same time. The plan had been known only to two other people. One was the general who was across the room talking to an Asian beauty, the other was the foreign minister. He too was at the party, and he too was looking forward to the grand finale. Shang Dingshang had gone rogue in coming up with and executing his plan. He had to, since the government and the party would never approve or sanction it. He believed the rewards, what a successful outcome would do to his career, were worth the risks, and hence he had pulled out all stops. He had siphoned off funds from his ministry, a surprisingly easy task to do, and his contacts and the network of Hong Kong man had been sufficient to get the various parts moving. He had taken great pains to distance himself from the actual operation, and his only contact was with Hong Kong man. The two ministers knew because he had to take them in confidence and get some favors done. They wouldn't snitch on him since he knew some of their secrets too. Of course the two ministers were his rivals too and wanted him to fail. All three of them had their eyes on the greatest prize, that of being the next president. All three knew that if Shang Dingshang pulled off his plan, he would be the front-runner. There was no if about it. In less than an hour, Moda's board would announce their decision. Once the other decisions were known, Shang Dingshang would carefully leak some details of the plan. Not the killings, of course, nor the counterfeiting, or any of the unlawful activity. A story would go out, about the elaborate planning, about getting CFI U.S. approvals, about wooing American politicians. His already high profile would become stratospheric. The road to the presidency would be wide open. Those in the inner secretive circles of the Communist Party would know more details once the deals had gone through, and they would throw their weight behind him. He excused himself and went to an inner room and called Hong Kong Man. Everything was rolling smoothly, however, it never hurt to check. Everything was on track, Hong Kong man confirmed. Once the decisions were announced, funds would be transferred from China to designated accounts in the U.S., and the acquisition process would roll forward. Peng Huang, the minister barked. Taken care of. The 41's boss would never be seen again. There's someone they have in custody, don't they? Joe. The minister asked, in a more conciliatory tone. He won't talk. He too will be taken care of in prison. Shang Dingshang breathed a tiny sigh of relief and immediately held the phone away from his mouth. Sighing was a sign of weakness. He could not show weakness to anyone. He returned to the party with a bounce in his step and got closer to his fellow ministers who had their eyes glued to the TV sets. No one else seemed to be watching the screens but for them. There was still some time away for the announcements, and Shang Dingshang couldn't wait to see the expressions on their faces when victory for him was announced by the news reporter. Their expressions made him falter. The two ministers had a smug look of satisfaction. He turned in confusion to the TV, and what he read ended his world. The reporter was announcing gravely that the three semiconductor companies were going ahead with the American offer. The Chinese one was rejected, 
even though it was higher and met all the requirements of the three companies. A government spokesman announced there was a national security risk in having foreign ownership of the three companies. The defense minister turned to Shang Dingshang, barely concealing his glee. You failed. You're finished. It took another three months to investigate the conspiracy and for the FBI to make more direct links between Shang Dingshang and the acquisition. They didn't get any direct proof, but in one of the obscure parts of the internet, on a long-forgotten server, a photograph emerged of the Minister of Commerce meeting with Peng Huang in a bar in Manhattan. It wasn't a high-profile bar, it was one of those cheap ones that catered to the less demanding drinker. The picture had been taken by a tourist who had been after a downtown view. The bar's window was in the bottom corner of the image, and the two men's faces were clear enough to be recognized. The photograph was enough for the government's machinery to act on. It lodged a formal protest with the Chinese government and suggested the minister had a hand in all that had gone on. The Chinese government reacted strongly in denial and said the minister was a highly respected member of their cabinet. They would investigate that photograph, but they were sure it was random coincidence. One never knew who one was sitting next to in a bar. They valued their relationship with the U.S. and would never do anything to imperil it. Bringing about financial market instability made no sense, they claimed, since China had numerous investments in the U.S. The damage was done, however, and in a reshuffle, Shang Dingshang was stripped of his position. Charges of corruption and graft were brought against him subsequently. Days turned into weeks and then months. The markets recovered, the dollar gained ground, and the conspiracy was soon forgotten as politics and celebrity scandals hit the news. The twins got occupied on another agency mission which involved all of them, and when it had successfully completed, they organized a dinner in New York. The Minters attended, along with Callie, who was fully recovered and was working in a particle physics research organization. She was no longer an FBI agent, preferring the relative slow pace of life in science. Chong and Pazaka were there, the latter, immaculate as usual and brandishing his latest book. Sarah Burke was seated next to Broker, who was regaling his audience with tales of political intrigue in D.C. Beth was perched on the arm of Mark's seat, her hands entwined with his, and spoke of taking a vacation with him. During a pause in the conversation, Callie brought out a newspaper and pointed to a photograph in it. You know what happened to him? she asked the cops in the room. The dead man in the picture had no identity and had died in mysterious circumstances. Callie had recognized him as soon as she'd seen the reports. He was her interrogator, but the cops hadn't worked out how he had died. No one had come forward with any information. Chong shook his head in disgust. A city of eight million, and no one knows anything or has seen anything. This'll go in the books as a cold case. Megan refrained from looking in Zeb's direction, who was sitting in a corner, quiet as usual, enjoying the company of his friends. Betcha he knows. Not that he'd tell us. Zeb knew. It had taken him time to hunt the torturer, hours and days of talking to contacts and meeting gangsters in prison, but he'd finally found the man. The interrogator had been hiding in a concealed room above a 41S owned strip mall in Brooklyn. The room had been built behind the bedroom wardrobe of an apartment above the strip mall. Zeb had thought of presenting him to the cops, but when he'd seen the leather case the man carried with him, he'd changed his mind. The case contained shiny implements, tools he enjoyed using. The final piece in the puzzle fell randomly into place. It hadn't been anticipated, and Megan wasn't even aware a final piece existed. Chapter 40 Zeb and she had flown to D.C. a month later, she to attend a dinner along with General Klaus, he to discuss a new mission with Claire. General Klaus had been invited to the dinner thrown by a few of his friends in the DOD, and the invite suggested he could bring along a companion. That line presented him with a dilemma. He knew most of the other attendees would be paired up, and he didn't wish to stick out like a sore thumb. He had no romantic entanglements, and it was while talking to Zeb, the latter had suggested he take along one of the twins. 
Beth had gone to Key West on her vacation with Mark, Megan immediately accepted when the general diffidently called her. You might not want to spend the evening with an old guy and listen to boring tales, he had laughed. Megan liked spending time with him and D.C. was a city she loved. She had no second thoughts in taking him up on his invite. Zeb and she took a very early morning train to the capital and checked into a hotel not far from the most famous residence on the planet. They caught up on their sleep for a few hours and then split up, Zeb to meet Claire and Megan to meet the general. It was while she was in her cab that Megan realized she was carrying Zeb's duffel, which had spare magazines and various pieces of gear that he used on missions. Your stuff's with me, she texted him. Keep it, he replied. I won't be needing it. What if you get mugged? She put her phone away when no response came. Humor was usually an alien emotion for her friend. General Klaus hugged her affectionately when he opened the door for her in person. He had a security detail around him and his calendar was managed tightly, but he always received the twins in person. They were the daughters he never had. They dined on a light lunch of salads and juices while he briefed her on the evening's event. Several speeches over dinner, a lot of backslapping and endless drinks, was how he put it. Megan wasn't put off. Beth and she had attended similar dose when her folks were still alive in Jackson. She knew what to expect. They set off to the Presidential View Hotel on 16th Street in the evening, a hotel that Megan knew very well. It was where they had been held hostage by terrorists on a previous mission. It was the mission that had brought Broker and Sarah together. The evening set off well enough, wine and light bites, a welcome speech by someone whose name Megan soon forgot, thanking the maker that at least it was a funny one. Another speech followed, a dull one, and she smiled bravely when the general gave her a sympathetic look. The general was to her right, and to her left was a Chinese-American woman, Lian Su, who was a senior official in the Department of Defense. She worked in the office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research, as if that title meant something to Megan. Megan nodded politely, at which Lian Su had laughed. It's your first time, isn't it? Yeah. I came along with General Klaus. Lian Tsiu's eyes widened, and she shot a glance to the general who was conversing with another person to his right. Wow, she gasped just as a bell rang to announce the first serving. Lian Su made small talk with Megan, and when the twin said she was from New York, the Chinese-American's fork stopped its ascent to her mouth. Peterson. I've heard that name before. Her brow cleared when it came back to her. Calliope Minter. You were involved in all that. Not just me, Megan replied. Jack Minter had let slip the twins' involvement during a TV interview, which had played on several stations. The FBI and the NYPD were part of the hunt, too. You've got a good memory. Lian Su made an aw shucks motion with her hand. I followed the case. We had to investigate whether the research was compromised. Her hand waved again in a you-know-how-it-goes gesture. Megan didn't know and wasn't keen on knowing. She concentrated on her food and hoped Lian Su would get the hint. She didn't. The Chinese-American clicked her fingers suddenly. Kane, You alone were convinced he didn't kill the FBI agent. Megan didn't allow any expression to cross her face. Her mouth didn't stop chewing, but her mind was whirling. Interesting. Jack Minter had mentioned that too in the interview, but she still remembers it. She paid more attention to her companion on the left, who was asking her questions on the investigation, and on the counterfeiting conspiracy. She noticed the woman's handbag lying next to her feet on the floor, and through its half-open mouth she got a glimpse of her phone. Megan answered her questions in auto mode, and when another speaker came on she excused herself. She went to the cloakroom where she deposited Zeb's duffel and recovered a phone battery from it. The battery would work on Leanne Tsiu's phone, it wasn't just a battery however. It was a listening device that broadcast all conversations to Werner. It was also a GPS device that the supercomputer could track. It sucked all data from the phone and sent it to Werner. 
Megan pulled out her phone and sent a few commands to Werner. One of those was to find everything on Leanne Sue. She wondered for a moment if she was overreacting and then remembered one of Zeb's commandments. Never overrule your instincts. The speaker was well into his practice spiel by the time she joined her companions. She inclined her head in answer to General Klaus's is everything okay expression and assumed a look of concentration. More speakers extolled the DOD and talked about their work, none of which was classified information. More wine was served and during a lull, Leanne Su turned to her. How do you know the general? He's our godfather. Take that and smoke it. Wow, Leanne Su struggled for words and came up with a lame, that's something. Yeah. Leanne Su steered the conversation back after another interminable speech. Kane was employed by that gang, wasn't he? They gave him victims. Megan swallowed and took a sip of her wine to buy time. It wasn't proven. I think the NYPD's still investigating, but they don't have much to go on. A clumsy move on her part made her glass tip over and spill her wine. She shoved her chair back and in her haste kicked Leon TSIU's handbag, making it unload its contents. Apologizing profusely, Megan bent and retrieved the items while a uniformed server rushed to them and tidied the table. Calm resumed, and so did the dinner. Conversation around the table died when the key speaker rose and talked for an hour. He specifically thanked General Klaus for his attendance, and when he'd finished, some guests started departing. Megan was tidying her hair in the bathroom when Leanne Sue emerged from a stall, the two of them using another lull to make their escape. The bathroom had a long mirror over which was a row of dim lights. Megan watched the Chinese-American approach the sink and wash her hands. She handed a fluffy towel and got a smile in return. No one knows about that, you know. That Kane got his victims from the gang. Neither the NYPD or the FBI ever went public with that information. Leanne TSIU's smile quivered. She threw the towel in a basket and freshened her makeup. I probably got it from some FBI agent who briefed us. There really aren't any secrets, are there? No, Megan agreed, remembering the message Werner had sent just before the bathroom break. Lian Su and Shang Dingshang had been in three cities at the same time in the last four years. Berlin, where Lian Su had attended a NATO conference, while Shang Dingshang had presented at a business conference. London was the second city, and Manila was the third. The two of them had separate itineraries each time, and hadn't met. However, Werner had struck gold in Berlin. It had unearthed a photograph of Leanne Su, sitting at a hotel bar in Berlin. Alone in the hotel where Shang Dingshang was staying. No, Megan repeated, there are no secrets. Leanne Su dug her hands in her coat pockets to conceal their trembling as she left the hotel swiftly. She had spoken too much, the wine loosening her tight control. It wouldn't have been a problem 99 out of 100 times. This time, Megan Peterson had been her dinner companion. She knows. Or at least she suspects, she thought frantically as she brought out her phone to hail a cab. Lian Su regarded herself as the Chinese equivalent of Cyan. The Cyanum was a network established by the Mossad to help its operations. There were hundreds of Cyan, non-Israeli Jewish volunteers in various countries who offered help to Mossad operatives. A real estate scion would offer a house for operatives, a pharmacist scion would deliver drugs, no questions asked. Shang Dingshang had called Lian Su his scion the fourth time they met, a term the DoD employee liked. She believed in the country of her ancestry, an emotion that the Chinese minister had skillfully tapped into. They had first met in Las Vegas while waiting at McCarran International Airport for their bags to arrive. Introductions had happened, reasons for visiting the city had been exchanged. The minister was attending a business briefing, Lian Su to a DOD meeting. They met for drinks later, the minister turning on his charm and Lian Su was smitten. She crushed on him big time and respected him all the more when the minister didn't act on it, even though she gave out enough indicators. That first meeting led to several when they synchronized their travel wherever possible. 
At the fourth meeting, the minister proposed that she be his scion. Lian Su agreed, excitement churning deep inside her. He didn't ask her to break any laws. So what if he asked her about research programs? And who worked on them and what they were about? So what if she mentioned that some of those programs might have undercover FBI agents? Shang Dingshang was an honorable man. He wouldn't make her betray her country. The minister had sworn that he had no hand in Calliope Minter's disappearance when the topic came up. His government didn't do all that. Lian Su believed him. Nevertheless, they had agreed on a code if anything alarming happened. That code was still active, Shang Dingshang had assured her via a secure email after his departure from government. His removal from office had scared her, and for several weeks she had been a wreck. She had finally reached out to the ex-minister, who had replied promptly, calming her. He was out, he said, but he wasn't done. He still had a role to play in the government. Lian Su needn't worry. If she raised the alarm, help would come to her. I'm watching a rerun of The Great Escape. How's your evening? She texted to a number that would bounce off servers and countries. Help came to her, though not in the shape she was expecting. She was woken up at four in the morning by pounding on her North Virginia home. She hadn't slept well since there had been no reply from Shang Dingshang or anyone connected to him. She shuffled to the door and peered through the eye hole. Three men in suits stood stamping their feet on her doorstep. FBI? Her blood chilled. Who are you? What do you want? She called out in her strongest voice. We're here to help, ma'am. A warm, friendly voice replied. You sent a message in the night? They're Shang Dingshang's men. Relief flooded through her and she opened the door wide. The relief didn't last. A hand grabbed her and covered her mouth. Another man slipped behind her and restrained her. The two men half carried her to a waiting black van and flung her inside, while the third went to the driver's side. Doors closed on her before she could yell or scream, before she could even comprehend that she was being kidnapped. The van set off and turned sharply and came to a sudden stop when another vehicle crashed into it. Zeb threw open his SUV's door and taking cover behind it, drew his weapon. The three men were visible through the shattered windshield, the driver slumped on the wheel. The front of the van had caved in, following its impact with his SUV. His vehicle had a steel and titanium reinforced body. It could stop a semi. The van was a commercial vehicle and put up no contest. Onsu thrust his arm out and fired wildly. He ducked swiftly when Zeb's round punched a hole in the windshield and starburst spread across it. Zeb fired another burst and pinned the men down in the van. Go, he told Megan. I'll cover you. Megan slid out of the SUV and raced to the rear of the van, keeping well away from Zeb's sightline. One suit raised his head and lifted a gun to fire as she ran past, but a flurry of shots from Zeb dissuaded him. Megan opened the rear doors gingerly, one hand holding her Glock. The rear had one occupant, a cowering frightened Lian Su. Zeb had arranged for the SUV as soon as Megan had called him after Lian Su fled the hotel. The two had decided to mount a watch outside her home after reading her text message. The battery that Megan had expertly replaced on Lian Tsiu's phone had started delivering the phone's activity and its secrets. Their watch had been rewarded when the van had turned up. Only three men, Zeb pointed out to her. Look at their build and their walk. I'm betting this isn't a rescue team. It's a disposal team. The takedown of the van was surprisingly easy, since the three-man team wasn't expecting any resistance. The men intended to make a quick getaway on the quiet streets of the suburban neighborhood. Megan made another call once they had recovered the DOD employee and had secured the three men. Get your butt over here now, she told a groggy Sarah Burke. We finally closed that case. Megan brought up the case one day when the city was well in its autumn. Trees had turned gloriously gold, orange and red, and the sidewalks were dotted with leaves. She and Zeb were on their morning run, just the two of them, since Beth was spending more time with Mark. 
The Calliope Minter case was history, as was the counterfeiting. Leanne Su was on trial for several charges, including espionage, and would end up in prison. The twins, along with Zeb and the other operatives, had recently returned from Puerto Rico, where they had taken down a drug lord who was also funding terrorists. Normal life for them had resumed. Do you wonder why Kane set out to meet me? She breathed the morning air and matched Zeb's pace. Nope, came the lengthy reply. That was some risk he took. Breaking cover, she persisted. Yeah. So you don't think why? Nope. She grinned suddenly, feeling light and free and good about herself and her friend beside her. Zeb was right. It really didn't matter why Kane had set out to meet her. No one really understood what went on in the mind of a psychopathic killer. What mattered was the man beside her. Zeb Carter. Her friend. What mattered were her friends and what she could achieve along with them. Come on, Slowpoke, she challenged Zeb and raced him in the city that was their home. The End Bonus chapter from I Am Missing the Next in the series As days went, there was nothing special about this particular one. Beth and Megan Peterson were at their screens in their Columbus Avenue office, working on the logistics of a mission. There wasn't anything burning, mission-wise. Zeb Carter, the lead agent of the clandestine outfit they worked for, was on a solo mission in the Middle East. Broker, the intel guy in the unit, was on vacation with his girlfriend, Sarah Burke, who was high up in the FBI. Bear and Chloe, two of the operatives, were away too. On one couch, a tall black man was sprawled out. He was large, and when he stood, he invariably dwarfed all those present. Bawana was six feet four, muscled, and yet moved like a cat. On another couch, a blond-haired man slept. He was movie star handsome and made a show of being a gift to womankind. His friends knew Roger, the blonde Texan, was all show. He had a girlfriend, who he was deeply committed to. The eight of them worked for the agency. Just that, no other name. It was a unique small footprint outfit that dealt with terrorists, international criminal gangs, and threats to national security. It was headed by a female director, Claire, no last name. She was based out of D.C. and reported to only one person. The president. Of course, the agency didn't advertise itself. It didn't exist, not on paper or in any other record. All of them worked for a security consulting firm that advised corporations on people and perimeter protection. The firm was a front. They had real clients and genuinely advised them, but it still was a facade. For such a small unit, they were very well resourced. That was courtesy of generous rewards from grateful Middle Eastern royalty they had helped. Like that building on Columbus Avenue. They owned it outright. Then there was that Gulf Stream. They owned that one too. Werner, a highly sophisticated artificial intelligence program, they owned outright. The software resided in a supercomputer in their office and was the envy of the NSA and a few other intelligence agencies. They used the name Werner loosely to refer either to the program or to the machine. They possessed a fleet of vehicles, SUVs armored equipped with run flats and stealth paint, more gadgets and tech in them than the Batmobile had. The twins were the only ones who didn't have an army background. Zeb, Bawana, Roger, and Bear were former Special Forces operatives. Broker was an ex-ranger, a higher life form, he declared. Chloe had been with the 82nd Airborne. Zeb was an odd one. He rarely smiled and hardly spoke. He was single, didn't date, and had no interest in romantic entanglements. Despite his peculiarities, there was something about him. He was the reason the agency worked. He was their leader, but he didn't do all that command stuff. He was a friend first and foremost, and that just suited the rest of them. The day dragged on as some days did. Beth yawned and glanced at her watch. Mark's coming, her sister asked. They weren't just sisters, they were twins, Megan the elder one. Brown-haired, green-eyed, vivacious, sassy, beautiful, a newspaper had once devoted a page-length of adjectives to describe them. 
This was after a mission had made them into celebrities. Yeah, what about you? You still dating that Wall Street guy? Nah. Megan stretched. I'm out of the dating scene. Mark was Beth's significant other. A cop in the NYPD. The two were close, very close. Everyone approved. Beth rose to make them coffee when the phone rang. She quirked an eyebrow as she listened silently. Send them up, she replied and hung up. Who was it? You'll see. Four men entered their office through the elevator. In the front were two large men, as large as Bawana, but these two had none of his grace. They had muscles, but developed in gyms and aided by the generous use of steroids. They had short dark hair and wore well-cut suits, bulges under their jackets. Behind them were two men, one wearing a pinstripe suit carrying a briefcase, while the other was more casually dressed. He was blonde tieless blue jacket over white shirt blue jeans and brown shoes. Beth and Megan Peterson? Pinstripe halted and looked in their direction. That's us, Megan answered and gestured at a few seats. The heavies, for that was who they were, stood silently as Pinstripe and Blue Jacket seated themselves. I'm Ken Farrell, Pinstripe introduced himself. And this is. We know who he is, Megan said dryly. Cole Patton, Blue Jacket, was a billionaire. He was in his late thirties and had inherited a steel empire when he was young, very young. He had built on his inheritance and multiplied it several times. He was frequently in the news and not always for the right reasons. There were frequent rumors that his business dealings were shady and that he had links to criminal gangs. He dated Hollywood actresses and models, and his social life was avidly covered by the gossip magazines. Farrell looked around him before settling his eyes on the twins. I expected a bigger office. More people. Neither of the sisters responded. They knew each other well and often could read the other's mind. Farrell cleared his throat in the silence and smiled a warm smile. One that said, I am your best friend. The sisters immediately distrusted him. We want to hire you. And you are, Beth asked him bluntly. I'm sorry, I should have explained. I'm Cole's lawyer. We are not for hire, Mr. Farrell, she cut him off. Mark would arrive soon. Beth wanted the visitors out as quickly as possible. Why don't you hear us out, ma'am? Sorry, not interested. I let you in just to see what a billionaire looked like and who he moved around with. A lawyer and two heavies. We've seen our fill. Besides, there's all those rumors about the legality of Patton's businesses. Not to our liking. There's the elevator. Thank you. Farrell made to speak but kept quiet when Patton laid a hand on his shoulder. I came to you because I have a particular problem. His voice was pleasant, his eyes warm. One that I think you can help with, given that you are twins. What's that? I am missing. I want you to find me. The end.